Thank your seats. We waited for the deputy mayor of Jerusalem to come. Listen, Fleur, you're the only one who can make it through the barricades this morning. <laughs> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Jerusalem. To our Muslim brothers and sisters, Ramadan Karim. You've come from across the Middle East and the African continent, representatives of policy centers and think tanks, to share, to discuss, to find new ideas that can advance regional cooperation. You've come at a time of intense political debate, some would say unprecedented debate, and social tensions here in Israel. We Israelis are experts at tearing each other apart. But we are also great at coming together in national unity when the hour calls for it. So don't lose faith. The symbol of that unity is our president. President Herzog wanted to be with us here this morning in person, so he told me. But he's very involved in trying to bridge the gaps between the coalition and the opposition over our judicial reform proposals. He was kind enough, thoughtful enough, and concerned enough about the success of this august gathering to take the time and send a videotaped message of greeting to all of you. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Isaac Herzog, President of the State of Israel. Friends, colleagues, partners of a brighter tomorrow, I'm pleased to share a short message with you. As you gather here in our beautiful city to look at some of the pressing questions of the day and to explore to many possibilities for collaboration that are right here in front of us, I thank Dan Dyker, President of the JCPA, and Dr. Yechia Leiter, its Director General, for organizing this initiative and for inviting me to address the audience. So, dear friends, there's no question that the past few years have been a whirlwind of change in our region. The common interests shared by the people of the Middle East have been transformed into a shared vision of the future, culminating in the historic Abraham Accords. These point squarely to the power of our goodwill to resketch the boundaries of our political maps and our imaginations and to the potential of collaboration to leverage the best of our abilities towards solutions that safeguard the future of all our people. Naturally, the topics of discussion at this forum go to the heart of what is most urgent. Questions of sustainability and ethics, food security, the looming threats of radicalism and violence. All of these directly impact the future of life in our region and on our planet. I firmly believe that working with partners old and new, we can transform our greater region into a net zero region. Not just a new Middle East, but a renewable Middle East that thrives as a hub of sustainable solutions in food, water, health, and supply of energy, which in my mind can envision a future whereby this region supplies solar energy to Europe, Asia, and Africa. All you have to do is believe in it. And I invite each of you to step forward with our unique tools to join our collaborative endeavors and to be part of the solution to the problems we all face. To each of you who has traveled the distance, both real and imagined, between your countries and Israel to make it a brighter future for all of our children, I salute you all and I welcome you here. Shalom. Salam. Welcome. Thank you, President Herzog. In a bit, you will hear too from our president, the president of our center, the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs, my esteemed colleague, Dan Dyker. The idea for this conference was actually born about four months ago in Addis Ababa. The Institute for Peace and Security Studies hosted, where's my friend Dr. Belete? The Institute for Peace and Security Studies hosted a conference in the Horn of Africa and invited me to present a paper. 
Instead of talking about conventional weaponry and conventional warfare, I chose to speak about food and water security. I pushed the fact that 50 years ago we had few solutions to the problems of desertification, of clean water scarcity, of parasites, of energy production, wastewater management, and more. But today, there's no excuse for almost a billion people going to sleep every night hungry, suffering from malnutrition and disease, and being driven into tribal and ethnic conflict out of poverty and despair. Today, we have the solutions to those problems. Several of the participants suggested a follow-up conference in Israel. We decided to move forward when I consulted with Dan. When taking into account the time factor, the beginning of the Ramadan holiday season, and the absence of domestic tranquility here at home, it was not a simple decision. The questions are great, the challenges are many. What are the effects of the U.S. stepping back from the Middle East? The expansionism of China and the aggressiveness of Russia? Will the apparent entente between Saudi Arabia and Iran spoil the normalization taking place daily between Israel and the Emirates, between Israel and Bahrain? What about the slow but steady understandings that between the kingdom itself and Israel? What will happen if Iran goes nuclear? How will that affect terrorism exported from Tehran to different parts of the globe? Will Lebanon collapse completely? What about, what about Yemen, sub-Saharan Africa, which the UN has categorized as the epicenter of sovereignty-threatening terrorism? What about Nigeria and its troubles with Boko Haram and Morocco with the Hezbollah-supported Polisario? Will the West pressure Sudan into immediate civilian transition and will that lead to greater stability or less? And what about Turkey? If Erdogan loses, will the military return to power? How will that affect Kurdistan? How will that affect Syria? Will simmering tensions between Egypt and Ethiopia over the Renaissance Dam boil over? And back to food security. How will the new European-driven ESG demands and regulations affect developing countries that have not yet fully industrialized? Will this save the planet at the expense of lives today? Is ESG an imposition or a solution? In countries like Ghana, Kenya, and Malawi, how can Israel help? How can Israel's technological innovations assist developing countries feed their people? contend with international regulatory statutes, and grow their economies. Questions abound, and we need to think together. Governments, most of us were all there at some point, governments think about, no, governments act on the immediate. There's very little thinking. Think tanks must deal with the important. And our thinking has to provide the policies that can be translated into practical action. Real actionable plans that governments can embrace that bridge the private sector with its private interests but are the real engine for economic growth, with governments which act on behalf of the public interest but are hamstrung in their top-heavy bureaucracy. That is what we're doing here. Ask the questions and together look for answers. It's a working session. Our hunch was that we should embark on this journey as a think tank, as a do tank, with a very broad view of the region. Not Israel and the Gulf alone, not Israel and Africa alone. Our idea, rather, was to widen the circle and bring our northeast neighbors together with our southwest neighbors. In Addis, I mentioned our common grandfather Abraham, who came to the promised land and had to leave it immediately because of food insecurity. The Bible tells us that it was Joseph who solved the problem of food insecurity in Egypt, on the African continent. What I didn't mention at the time, and what I will add now, is that Abraham's journey began in Ur of the Chaldees, or what is known today as Tel El Magyar, in southern Iraq, right near the Persian Gulf. Abraham was the first then to unite our region, and we would not be wrong to follow 
in his footsteps. I share with you this morning my sense of happy vindication when a high-level official in Abu Dhabi, an intellectual, an independent thinker of the first order, leaned forward in his chair when I presented this idea to him just a few weeks ago. And he said to me, this is very important. Bridging our Gulf countries with Africa, it must be the highest on our agendas. You have my full support and encouragement. At the JCPA, we believe that this is the time to build trusted partnerships at a time of shifting alliances. So let's move straight to the program. And before doing so, I want to thank our staff at JCPA that made this event possible. <laughs> to, our, to our associate director, you've all learned the names by now. You've been in touch with them by email uh, intensely over the past couple of weeks trying to put the trips together. And please, gentlemen, next time, don't miss your flights. <laughs> Okay. Come on time to your flights. Leave time. And also, I hope next time you won't have to leave time for block streets in Jerusalem because of our internal tensions. But I want to thank our associate director, Ahuva. Ahuva, thank you so much. Atara, Atara who organized, coordinated the conference selflessly. Uh, Odelia, uh, the office manager, and personal assistant. Uh, to uh, Lenny, Lenny Ben David, who's in charge of our Israel-U.S. relations. Uh, to, uh, to Tirza, to Daniel, to Leora, and to Mark, this would not have been possible without your input. I can think of no one better to moderate our first session than the Honorable Jason Greenblatt. <laughs> Jason, if you please come forward. Jason Greenblatt is a diplomat, lawyer, and commentator who served as an assistant to the president of the White House Special Envoy to the Middle East in the Trump administration. His role, he served as one of the chief architects of the peace to prosperity plan between Israel and the Palestinians and was one of the key players in laying the foundation of the Abraham Accords. Eli Baron, Eli, where are you? Please come forward. <laughs> Eli served for 25 years in various senior legal positions in the Israeli government, including Deputy Military Advocate General. He was also a professor at the Interna Israel National Defense College, and he co-founded MENA 2050 Middle East and North Africa Regional Initiative aimed at fostering regional cooperation. Abdul Aziz Al Hamis, a Saudi journalist and researcher, has served as editor-in-chief of many newspapers and magazines and has undertaken research on the Middle East, the Arabian Gulf, and Islamic movements. He is a research member at the Royal Institute of International Relations at Chatham House. Michal Kotler-Wunsch, stuck in traffic? <laughs> sure, she'll arrive shortly. Please let me know as soon as Michal comes in. Michal's a former uh, MK, the Yesha Tid Party, and uh, has served on the Knesset Defense and Security Committee. Abdallah Al-Janayed. Abdallah, where are you? <laughs> Abdallah is a founding member of the National Unity Assembly Party in Bahrain where he served as head of policy and analysis and deputy head of political department. He is a geopolitical economist, current affairs commentator on national and international media, and personal advisor to the president of National Unity Media Association. My dear friend and colleague, Khaled Abu Tauma, <laughs> JCPA scholar, is an award-winning Israeli Arab journalist, lecturer and documentary filmmaker who covers Palestinian affairs for the Jerusalem Post. A senior distinguished fellow at the Gatestone Institute, he has also worked as a senior producer for NBC in the Middle East. Dr. Yaroub Ajluni from Jordan is a humanitarian entrepreneur and a physician. He has more than two decades of experience with regional international humanitarian response efforts to aid people in war zones and areas affected by national disasters. He is an expert in managing refugee crises in the Middle East. A dear friend, colleague at the JCPA, Aviram Balisha, head of the Gulf Africa Initiative, Aviram Belisha served in senior government positions for over 25 years as a business intelligence and Middle East specialist, negotiation expert, and international cooperation manager. He was an Israeli director in a regional initiative for business and economic cooperation dialogue in the Middle East and North Africa. Jason, the microphone is yours. Thank you, Gil. Good morning, everybody. It's such a delight to be here. Before we start the panel, I just want to say that I was privileged to work at the White House on what I think was one of the most breathtaking 
events in the Middle East in recent times, the Abraham Accords. And nothing gives me greater pleasure than to sit in rooms like this and see so many people gathered together to try to solve the world's problems. You know, there were very, very courageous leaders who helped us create the Abraham Accords from the United States, Israel, and especially the Middle East leaders. And when I go to these countries, but even when I come to rooms like this and I see people trying to take the bull by the horns, not just talk, not just listen to the media, not just hear criticism, but actually solve the world's problems. And, you know, Yechiel talked about some uh, or lack of domestic tranquility. Let's be honest, there's no tranquility in the world today pretty much anywhere. So it's incumbent on all of us to sit and have these open and honest conversations. We're not going to agree on some of the topics, but there's so much we could agree on and work on together. So thank you for being here today. I'll start with you, Ellie. JCPA has brought together policy centers and think tanks from countries from Africa and the Middle East. You've been involved professionally for many years with the Arab world and now through MENA 2050. You're involving North African countries as well. What are the takeaways from your experiences, and where is the region heading? Okay. Uh, Join us. Thank you. Nice catch. <laughs> well, uh, good morning, everybody. I want to thank uh, the JCPA, Dan, Yechiel, for inviting us. Thank you, Jason, for moderating this uh, panel. Um, when Yechiel and I met, uh, I think it was just two months ago or something like that, uh, the conference was uh, still an idea in the, in the making, and we were discussing uh, the, the transforming uh, region, the, the way that... Uh, the, the new region is, is just uh, shaping itself, reshaping itself uh, right in front of our eyes. Um, we were discussing MENA 2050, we were discussing the new directions to which uh, JCPA is now looking, and I th think that uh, what we have here in front of us is just a, a testament to what's uh, going on. I think um, three years ago, if we would have told each other that we would have such a conference here in Jerusalem, uh, we would have laughed. Uh, and this is uh, a direct result of uh, the efforts you were leading and, and the White House uh, was leading in uh, bringing the Abraham Accords to, to life. Uh, I look at my colleagues here, Abdelaziz and Abdallah, they could nef definitely not come here uh, before we had that. So this is uh, definitely uh, something that's uh, evolving and, and changing uh, the, the whole region. I would say this. The Abraham Accords, um, we would say a few, a few uh, things to maybe cool down the, the excitement in, in a minute, but the Abraham Accords are most definitely the single most um, outstanding diplomatic achievement of the, of the last generation in this region. Okay. Why are they so outstanding? I think in many ways we got used all those years that we have this paradigm um, where the, the contacts, the connections, the relations within Israel and the Arab world have to go through the Palestinian issue. Now the Palestinian issue is just one issue out of many, many challenges that this region has to deal with. And the Abraham Accords changed this paradigm. The Abraham Accords got us to a point where they said the Palestinian issue is, is not sidelined. It's always, on, it's always going to be a top priority, but we shouldn't start with the most pressing, most, the hardest problem to, to solve uh, if we want to look at this uh, region at a, at a broader perspective. And I think that's the, the biggest achievement. Now, the Abraham Accords did not change the region. They changed the world. Uh, I'm saying that uh, because... I look at my everyday life since we started MENA 2050. I'm meeting people not only from this region, and, and this whole stage almost is, is people who work with, with us on, on changing the, the region with, with MENA 2050, but uh, I meet people from China, from Japan, from the US, from Europe. All of them are talking to us and saying, listen, something happened there, and, and we want to know what it is. 
Okay, we, we realize this changes our reality and not only the reality in, in your region. And we want to know, like one month ago, I was invited by Mr. Armin Laschet, the um, gentleman who replaced Angela Merkel as the head of the Christian Democrats in, in Germany, to the Munich Security Conference, to a panel where we had the uh, Sheikh Abdullah Khalifa from Bahrain, uh, Ms. Mariam Al-Mheri from the Emirates, the Israeli Minister of Defense, I'm sorry, ex-Minister of Defense, Yoav Gallant, um, talking with Mr. Laschet about the new region, okay? And, and the, the, the talks were about Germany's role in that, okay? Not, not the region itself. So I think um, the opportunities are endless. Uh, we can discuss it more in, in more detail, but we look at new uh, mechanisms that we now have here. The uh, Negev Forum, uh, I2U2, which creates some sort of a, an, an Indo-West um, uh, Asian uh, alliance with the Americans on, on board, of course. If we uh, thought three years ago that we would have uh, more than 600,000 Israelis uh, going to the Emirates in just uh, two and a half years, that we'll have a joint R&D fund to... to uh, finance Israeli and Emirati technologies, that we will have almost $3 billion of, uh, of trade between the, those two countries, uh, Emirati investments here in, in Israel, a free trade agreement that was negotiated in less than six months. Just yesterday, they signed another um, customs cooperation uh, agreement. I mean, this is just uh, mind-boggling. Having said all that, let's uh, just put in mind two uh, issues we need to look at. All those things are great, but there are some challenges that we should not disregard. First, there is not enough people-to-people -people engagements. So something like that is amazing, but there's not enough of it. Uh, we need much more than that. We need to allow much more um, less government, like, let's say less, less government and more personal interactions, but with the encouragement of the government, because if the people think that the government is not um, supporting these efforts, they will not do that. Um, we thought that, uh, or some people thought, that the Abraham Accords will decouple the uh, Israeli-Arab relations from the uh, Palestinian issue, and we now see that um, this was not true. And this should not have been true because this is something we should engage. And Palestinians should be included in, in all these um, uh, new uh, realities that we now see in the region, even if not on a political national level to begin with, but at least to be included in all these uh, regional developments to enjoy the, the economic benefits, to enjoy the cultural benefits and everything else that, that uh, comes with it. Um, the same goes for, we thought that the Abraham Accords is going to be some sort of a broad coalition uh, against Iran. Why? Why do we need that? Why do we, so it's just the same as the Palestinians, why should these accords be a, a, a coalition of, against the, the, the people we don't like? Why, why don't do it just about we like each other and, and push for things that uh, bring us together? Uh, we thought that uh, um, Egypt and Jordan uh, will, will become uh, more significant players in the regional level, uh, and that's, uh, we're still waiting for that to happen. Many, many challenges, uh, and we can talk more maybe later about bringing new partners, new countries uh, on board, and, and even if not on a, an official level. Thank you very much. Before I get to the next question, I just want to respond to two things. I agree with Ellie wholeheartedly that the people-to-people -people component is absolutely critical to success. Governments don't do people-to-people -people well. They could fund people-to-people, -people, but what I like to tell people is, in government, we have our job. I'm not in government anymore, but I had my job. But you were all, let's call you, informal ambassadors. Without informal ambassadors like you, the people-to-people -people work that's done the success of the Abraham Accords, or anything like the Abraham Accords, or progress towards other agreements like the Abraham Accords, is much harder to achieve. Um, the, second, the, the second point that I wanted to make, uh, sorry, I forgot, it's, uh, it was such a 
you know, your people to people one was so important. I'll come back to it because I, I can't remember it. Let me jump around here a little bit. Khaled Abutame, I want to uh, speak to you for a moment. I only met Khaled in person recently, but I feel like I've known him for many years because I've always, always read your work. I've always been impressed by it. The background for social revolution usually is well in place before the revolution actually occurs. Was the spirit of the Abraham Accords in place before the Abraham Accords were actually formalized? And what's the difference between the Abraham Accords and previous agreements signed by Israel and some of its neighbors? Well, first of all, thank you very much, Jason, for this compliment. Uh, I can tell you that, in my view, the Abraham Accords are the best thing that could have happened to Israel in the past 74 years. And I see them as one of the greatest achievements. Why? Because I compare them to other agreements that Israel has with other countries. Unlike the cold peace that Israel has with Egypt and Jordan, for the first time I see real peace between Israel and Arab countries. If you had told me three years ago that an Arab from the Gulf would go on Twitter or Facebook and say things in support of Israel, I would have asked you, what kind of medication are you on? Uh, if you had told me that, you know, Arabs from the Gulf would come to Israel and sit here and, you know, without fear and meet with people and engage in normalization, again, I would have asked you, you know, what planet are you living on? Can a Jew walk on the streets of Amman or Cairo with any Jewish symbols or identify himself or herself as a Jew? Unfortunately, no. And that's the cold peace I'm talking about. Are Egyptians and Jordanians coming to visit Israel publicly? Or can they engage in public meetings with Israelis? Sadly, no. With the Abraham Accords, I see amazing things happening. I see Jews celebrating Jewish holidays in Dubai and in other countries. I hear about Jewish restaurants opening over there. I see people you know, who are not afraid from Israel, uh, Jews and Arabs, to visit the Gulf states. You, you get the feeling that this is real peace, peace, you know, people to people. Maybe it's not enough, as uh, our friend uh, Eli, right, said. But I do see tens of thousands of Arab Israelis visiting uh, the Gulf and benefiting from the, uh, from the fruits of this peace agreement. So I would like to see the peace with Egypt and Jordan uh, you know, be conducted in a similar way to the Abraham Accords. Unfortunately, that's not happening right now. And if we move to the Oslo Accords with the Palestinians, we all know that over there it's totally different. Uh, unfortunately, we're not going to see any progress uh, on that track. The Oslo Accords are completely different. Uh, while the Abraham Accords mark the beginning of a process to legitimize Israel and integrate Israel into the region, I don't see that happening on the Palestinian side. Despite the signing of the Oslo Accords, I see that the Palestinian Authority and other Palestinians are continuing to wage a massive campaign to delegitimize Israel and even demonize Jews. And that is very serious. It's being done through a campaign of incitement in the mosque, in the media, in the rhetoric, on the campuses, on the streets. It's ongoing. It's continuing even as we are sitting over here. And of course, we must not forget that the Palestinians were the first people to denounce the normalization agreements that were signed between the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain and, uh, uh, and Israel. And not only did they, you know, denounce them, they came out with very serious accusations 
against the Arabs who for many years supported the Palestinians financially, politically. I received a uh, statement from President Mahmoud Abbas's office within half an hour of the uh, announcement of the normalization agreement between Israel and the United Arab Emirates. And what, what did that announcement say? They're accusing the United Arab Emirates of stabbing the Palestinians in the back, of betraying Al-Aqsa Mosque, of betraying Jerusalem, uh, of betraying the Palestinians. And it's like, you know, how did you reach that conclusion? These are people who have been supporting you. They hosted you. They opened their countries to you. They provided you with work, with, with accommodation. They gave you billions of dollars all these years. And when one of these countries finally decides to, you know, move on with its, uh, uh, you know, with, with it, or to do something good for that country and, you know, then you start attacking them and denouncing them and de uh, delegitimizing them. So the Palestinians, unfortunately, you know, they are not going to move forward on any uh, track with Israel as long as they continue to have the same leadership. Leadership that is dragging them from one disaster to another. Leadership that never offers them any hope. Leadership that deprives them of the international aid. Leadership that, you know, is not doing anything to improve the living conditions of these people. So that's, you know, that's very sad. So I see the Abraham Accords as hugely important because they mark the beginning of, the, of a process to legitimize Israel, integrate Israel uh, at a time when Israel is being massively, massively delegitimized. It's a small step, but don't underestimate it. A drop in the sea is better than nothing, I say. Thank you. Thank you, Khaled. Now I remember why I uh, like reading your material. Um, but you also reminded me what I wanted to say about Ellie's remarks. The Palestinians could benefit so much from the Abraham Accords. They deserve to benefit so much from the Abraham Accords, but unfortunately, as Khaled has pointed out, it's going to be very, very difficult, if not at the moment impossible, for them to benefit. Let me now turn my attention to you, Michal. You were a member of the Knesset when the Abraham Accords were signed. Was the opposition completely behind the effort? And how do you see the, the divisions within Israel with regard to normalization within the Arab world? Jerusalem Center, thank you um, for everybody that's here. Um, and um, I'd say that the most important word that I want to continue where, where Khaled sort of ended off, um, that the Abraham Accords offer is hope. Um, and, and here I have to, I'd be remiss if I didn't quote the late Rabbi Sachs, who differentiated between optimism and hope in the following way, which I think is very significant to the individuals in this room because of the people-to-people -people piece that both Jason and, and Ellie underscored. And he said the following, that optimism is the belief that everything is going to be okay. In Israel, that's known as yebesid, it's a big one. But hope is the belief that together we can make it okay. In that sense, optimism is a very passive virtue, whereas hope is a very active one. And it takes not very much courage to have optimism and a great deal of courage to have hope. So when I look out to this room and when I think of this effort, if they really resonate what the Abraham Accords felt like in the room, in the Knesset plenum, as we voted on them in 2020. Um, and, and I think that it's very important, and you spoke about a paradig paradigm shift or a paradigmal shift, Ellie. I think it's very important to underscore in my view, what that paradigm shift is and to put it on the table. And in many ways, it intersects with a lot of what Khalid said, and that is that the paradigm shift from the three no's of Khartoum, no to recognition of Israel, no to negotiation of Israel, to, with Israel, and no to peace with Israel, were actually flipped on their head with the three yeses. Yes to recognition, yes to negotiation, 
and yes to peace. And I will dare say that the reason, Khaled, that the first step is so critical and is really inherent to the Abraham Accords is that the order became relevant. Recognition being the first and vital step enabling negotiation, paving path to peace. And that's what this room is about. And that's what the people to people is about. And that's what the name the Abraham Accords actually attests to. And that's where the potential, um, and, and all of you in this room are agents of that, or change agents of realizing that potential, and I think is more important than ever. And I would add, in terms of the opposition to the Abraham Accords, that it didn't just come from the Palestinian leadership, and I have to differentiate between leadership and between the people, because there is no doubt that the people who most can benefit from that paradigmal shift of recognition, mutual recognition, as being the first and vital step enabling negotiation, paving path to peace, are the Palestinian people, as differentiated with their leader leadership, um, who opposed immediately. And I will share with you that there was also opposition within Israel's Knesset from the Arab parties in Israel's Knesset, which to me is another great missed opportunity which everybody in this room can help facilitate as we look to the future because Israel's Arabs internally can benefit and of course the peace um, um, agreements we already have with Jordan, with Egypt, with the kind of people-to-people -people peace that requires that paradigmal shift. I'll share anecdotally that I received the first delegation of influencers in Israel's Knesset, and it was Hanukkah. It was Hanukkah that's known to the celebration of miracles um, in, in Jewish history. And the understanding of the connection between that Hanukkah miracle and me lighting a Hanukkah candle with this delegation of influencers from the UAE and Bahrain and Sudan in Israel's Knesset, 73 years after the return of Jews to their indigenous homeland as an indigenous people committed to equality, and the Abraham Accords enabling to realize that vision of the Declaration of Independence was so overwhelming that I shared it with my guests. And when I spoke about the paradigm shift from the three no's to the three yeses and said yes to recognition, yes to negotiation, yes to peace, one of them yelled out, we don't just recognize you, we love you. And there is something so authentic about that people-to-people -people connection, if I go back to that, the understanding that in order to be able to propel this forward, it's going to depend on everybody in this room and those who are not yet in this room or in this room virtually. The people-to-people -people potential of recognizing the other as who they are, enabling to negotiate on whatever it is, and ultimately paving the path to peace for all peoples in the region and beyond, internally within Israel, of course with the Palestinians, as this is the path to peace with the Palestinians as well, and, 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 and in general. So um, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to have been there and to have witnessed and experienced that really historic moment, and I still, um, believe very deeply that we cannot rest on our laurels because the opposition to the Abraham Accords is what we have to contend with, is what we have to not only recognize that exists, but understand that the responsibility on all of us that see that potential grows in a direct correlation to the opposition that we experienced internally and from without. Thank you, Michal, and thank you for two things. One is and I'm an English major, so I should be embarrassed, but I used to think of myself as an optimist, but now I realize I'm actually hopeful, not so much an optimist. Uh, the second thing, and I just want to underscore something that Michal said, is when you do go back to your homes, to your families, to your workplaces, use the no, 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 and say, no, no, no. We can change things. You talk about being change agents. We can change things. Let's turn it on its head. Let's not get stuck on things that are at the moment are intractable. There are so many great things that we could do. Abdullah. Abdullah and I had the pleasure, at least it was my pleasure, I hope yours too, of being on an I-24 interview last week after the Saudi-Iran announcement. And I'm not sure if the, um, the station had expected us to disagree, but I, I kept saying, because he went first in each question, I kept saying, I agree, I agree. Hopefully we'll, we'll agree on, on today's panel. Abdullah Bahrain has made uh, major steps, perhaps more than any other country, to change school textbooks to erase anti-Semitic references and reflect a more accepting attitude toward normalization with Israel. 
Do you think Bahrain can be used as a template for other countries to follow? And how do you see this bottom-up peace process counterbalancing the extremism and annihilationist rhetoric toward Israel coming from the Iranian regime and trying to influence Bahrain's Shia population? Uh, to start with, uh, I think today, uh, Jason, we're going to disagree a little bit. So if you're looking forward to that, uh, Dan, uh, Ichel, thank you for this uh, invitation. Um, I'll start with um, maybe a different angle. Uh, I will address a point that my friend Khaled here have, has raised. The Ibrahimic Accords didn't come to legitimize or delegitimize the state of Israel because those agreements came about because the people of this region owe it to each other to reapproach and write a new history, socially, politically, economics, and all. If we go to the message of President Herzog, we owe it to us collectively and not as one people. Okay. Uh, okay. So, Collectively, we are uh, on a different path uh, with regard to uh, how vital are those accords to being part or integral part of the evolution of thinking, us thinking collectively, addressing issues collectively, security, social economics, economics, uh, uh, new energies, and so on. We all have so much to learn from each other. What we need is to engage again at a level that was never, uh, that was, wasn't there or absent. At the present time, the, those accords have facilitated or, let's say, fabric a new uh, ground that we all could walk on. Uh, MENA 2050 is just one of those vehicles, but is it going to be the end of it? No. We need more. Uh, during the uh, uh, latest uh, uh, humanitarian crisis in Turkey and uh, Syria, uh, we have that young lady, Sarah, uh, who organized a magnificent uh, exercise in collectively with Dr. Yarub and I don't know whom, but uh, I mean, we couldn't let our phone down because she wouldn't let us uh, have peace for one minute. She was chasing us, do this and do that. Again, that's when we revitalize uh, geography, social geography. And that is how we're going to impact the, uh, the future of this region. When it's come to re uh, or addressing how uh, issues with regard to the textbooks and, and, and other things, first of all, Bahrain is not, uh, has not been introduced to uh, jury or uh, the history because Bahraini Jews was part of Bahrain, okay? And you'll find them in all aspects of life. I was uh, telling... Uh, I don't know whom uh, uh, here, that a friend of mine, uh, for, for them, it's not a Ramadan if they don't have uh, the uh, Ramadan late meal in uh, the Reuben family house because they are the best in cooking uh, Bahraini tra traditional dishes. Again, how far it is that Bahrain could serve as a model, I think collectively we could do a lot more. When uh, talking about MENA 2050 again, our first workshop was in Bahrain. And we brought around uh, Israelis, uh, uh, Omanis, uh, UAE, uh, I, I don't know how many nationalities, okay? But we are all there talking about the new or 
how far that we could, uh, you know, um, um, engineer tools through the Abrahamic Accords. The minute we lose focus and the minute we see the approaches through the prism of pure politics, I think we're going to go again to, uh, you know, uh, blind tunnel vision. We need to stay focused beside the point or subject the whole region to one prism approach. It's not the Israeli-Palestinian uh, uh, issue. It is more. I believe we need to uh, motivate all parties. And I've said it before. The minute the Israelis and the Palestinians are willing to invite us as partners in addressing this, those issues, uh, the GCC will be more than happy to come at the aid of, unless you are ready, we are not going to be venturing in, but we will definitely, be, us being here, is mainly vitalizing the importance of people-to-people -people thing. Now, uh, with regard to the uh, Iran issue, um, put it this way, uh, us collectively being here, uh, different nationalities and all, I think that, that those are the sort of messages that are going to uh, re-engineer the new uh, security perspective or engineering for the whole region. And instead of us, um, you know, uh, looking at the uh, Saudi, uh, 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 Iran, uh, China-sponsored sort of uh, uh, new approach, I think it is a vital re-stabilizing uh, measure taken by Saudi Arabia. Uh, we were all in the region being accused of disengaging Iran and the US, Europe, and even Israel. Uh, so it, some time back as a negative sort of impact. I believe the Abrahamic Accords, the Saudi uh, new uh, approach is another model that we need for us to take charge of restabilizing this region. Are you sure you're done? Because I didn't disagree. <laughs> uh, actually, it reminded me of a story when Jared Kushner created an economic conference in Bahrain for the benefit of the Palestinians. The Palestinian leadership, by the way, boycotted it. At breakfast one morning, an Israeli journalist came to me and asked me if I wanted to go to the synagogue to pray that morning. And I couldn't believe it. I said, there's a synagogue here in Bahrain? And sure enough, there was. And that's when I learned that the Jewish, uh, Jewish life in Bahrain has been interwoven into the fabric of Bahrain for a very, very long time. Abdulaziz, I'm going to jump to you. And, uh, you know, it reminds me, Ellie, when you spoke about laughing if somebody would have said something to you a couple of years ago, I think, Khaled, you mentioned something like that as well. I would say that in 2017, if somebody told me that in 2023, I would take my family to vacation in Saudi Arabia and Qatar, I would tell them that they were absolutely crazy. But we did. We went this January to Saudi Arabia and Qatar. We had an amazing, amazing time. Uh, Khaled, you spoke about Jewish symbols. And yes, it's, it was easy for me to walk around Dubai these days with a kippah. There's so much Jewish life there. But I actually walked around, as did my son, with a kippah when I went to the World Cup in Doha in November, and again in January when I went to Qatar and to Saudi Arabia. And you know what? There was absolutely no negativity. In fact, I would say quite the opposite. People were coming over to us. They wanted to learn more about us. They wanted to welcome us. A few of them thought that we were from Israel. They were disappointed that we were just Americans. Um, you know, it really was beautiful. We had a beautiful Shabbat meal at the hotel. The hotels were very accommodating, giving us kosher food. So um, for those of you that haven't been there, I encourage you to go there. It's, uh, it's remarkable what's happening in the region now. So Abdulaziz, Saudi Arabia is a leader, perhaps the greatest leader of the Muslim world. What would normalized relations between Saudi Arabia and Israel look like? Do you think it would be an extension of the Abraham Accords? Or do you think it'll look like something else? Uh, thank you for your uh, invitation. Yeah. 
Thank you for your invitation, and uh, I'm happy to be in Jerusalem. Um, and I think it's, uh, Jerusalem is the, the capital of all the re uh, religions in the region, and it's very important to start from here, working to uh, peace in the region, and it's very important for the Saudis to look to Jerusalem as a start, a point of start of uh, cooperation. And uh, always Saudi Arabia have Jerusalem in the mind. It's the first point when they talk about peace with Israel or to normalize the relation with Israel, is Jerusalem in the mind. And this is a very good opportunity to be in the, this center and talking in, uh, about it through this center. It's uh, very important to put Jerusalem when you talk to the Saudis. And not only Israel and Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is uh, the core of the region. It's the most important country in the region. Now it's the leader of the region. And uh, when Saudi Arabia go forward for any peaceful agreement with uh, Israel, should care about the others in the region. When Saudi Arabia make a deal with Israel, all of the region will come. All the, the countries, they will, especially in Arab and Muslim world, they will look to Israel as a friendship, as a friendly country, and there is a possibility to cooperate with Israel. Without Saudi Arabia, there is no will be full solution in the region, our broad solution. The other thing and important is uh, the way how they negotiate with with uh, uh, the Israeli and with Saudi Arabia. It's not we look to it as very uh, especially after Abraham Accord. They look to Saudi Arabia as a, should be a part of the, the Abraham Accord. Should be the next, but Saudi Arabia is not like United the UAE or Bahrain. They have a rule, a big rule. They always the core and for the Muslim world. You should, Israeli, looking to the Saudi Arabia as a very important and very uh, uh, solid point, very great point. If you start with Saudi Arabia, talking about Jerusalem, you will find a solution. Without it, don't look at it. It's just not uh, very simple. It's not only a business or economical relation. Uh, it's more than that, it's a history. It's, you're talking with the, the land of Arabia. You're talking with uh, Mecca and Medina. You're talking with a country, can, uh, our influence, the influence of the country, and can uh, uh, bring Israel to many, many lands and many countries in the, in, uh, in the Arab and Muslim world. And that's why the Israelis, when they sign Abraham Accord, they thought it's okay, it will come, Saudi Arabia and the, and the queue. But no. Saudi Arabia is not in the queue. Saudi Arabia is alone. When it's not a part of any uh, agreement. It's, if you go to Saudi Arabia, you should go with a new approach, not Abraham Accord approach. You go to Saudi Arabia with a Red Sea security. It's very important for Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is not a Gulf country only. Saudi Arabia is a Red Sea country. It's uh, have a border with... Uh, with Jordan, with Iraq, with many countries, is very important for Israel. Uh, other thing, it's we, when we talk about Africa, why Israel and Saudi Arabia not cooperate for the security in Red Sea? We share with Africa a lot of uh, interests. We know now in Red Sea there is a Iranian, a Chinese, Russian coming to build a lot of uh, uh, bases, uh, military bases. But we ignore that, Israel and Saudi Arabia. They not cooperate in this thing with Egypt uh, and Jordan. I think it's very important to look to the Saudi Arabia uh, in a, when you talk about peace in a very general and very approach. It's not uh, uh, a small step in peace. Okay, we're happy to have Abraham Accord. We're happy to see Abraham Accord as a model of cooperation in the region. But it's uh, economical model. It's not political, real political. We need a full solution for the re region. And Saudi Arabia is the core of this so solution. When you go to Saudi Arabia, you go with a new agenda. You go with Jerusalem, 
solution. You go with a, 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 a new approach for a, a Red Sea, for Africa, for uh, all the region. Other thing, we look to how the Saudis accept Israel as a nation and as a country. You will find that in the social media there is a lot of acceptance. There is a, a lot of uh, uh, dialogue between the Saudis and the Israelis, and it's good dialogue. And it's very, the social media is open a lot of gates. The new technology, it's uh, make it very easy to negotiate and to talk and to know each other. MENA 2050 is a part of this one. A lot of activities in, in the region, it's good. But there is no a lot of activity to bring the history, the real history, about the Jews and the Arabs, Christ, uh, Christians, the Muslims. We have a lot of fake news. We have a lot of fake history written in, the, in our uh, book, in the school book, in curriculum books. And we need to cooperate together to have a very clear and very uh, uh, honest uh, history. Uh, the other thing is um, always look to Saudi Arabia not about economical opportunities. Look to it as a, the gate of the full solution in the region and in the Arab and Muslim world. Uh, and, oh, and we are not happy with the, the propaganda and uh, the media in Israel and the media, the, uh, Israeli and political leaders, when they come and talk about, about Saudi Arabia, oh, oh, it's easy, they're coming, they are in the queue. Just wait for them. No. Saudi Arabia is a very big country and very different and have a lot of uh, responsibilities in Arab and Muslim world. Talk to Saudi Arabia in a very respect, not as a small country will, will be follow you, will follow America. And you see now the agreement with Iran, how... Saudi Arabia act. Saudi Arabia is not uh, following what Washington DC said. Saudi Arabia have agenda, have uh, interests, and even in Africa, they act different, not like the, uh, what the American want. Uh, the Iranian and Saudi deal, it's a good for Israel. And we saw a lot of leaders here they saw this uh, deal is a very bad and uh, against the normalization of the relation with, the, with Israel. It's not. It will cool Iran. It will cool the support of Iran to the radical groups in the region. This is part of the agreement. And this is good for Israel. It will solve the problem in, in Lebanon. Should be. And we have two months to see the, the points, the real points. We see the uh, the minister of uh, foreign uh, minister of uh, foreign affairs minister of Iran will come to Riyadh and deal with these points. We will see uh, the Iranian president will come to Saudi Arabia and deal. What Saudi Arabia want from Iran? Same what Israel want from Iran. Exactly same. But why the Israeli are very angry? Why they should? Why not, uh, not look to this deal as a good, as a step to have? Uh, more peaceful in the region, to make Iran accept uh, what we want in the region, we want the peace, and Israel wants the peace. But the Iranian, they failed. When they, they did a lot of uh, activities in the region. They went to Iraq, they went to Syria, they went. But what the benefit for the Iranian people? We see the protests in Iran. We see the problem, the economic problems in Iran. And now Iran come to Saudi Arabia to talk, to have a new agenda in the region. Let us help Iran to normalize the relation with us, Israel and Saudi Arabia. We have a lot of files. We should work in it in the region. But it's not only this is my enemy, this is my friend. And I make a parties to have these friends and this uh, agreement. No, we need to know, our, uh, know about our interests and work hard in it. And very good. And that's why the Chinese win and succeed. The Chinese come and put agenda in the papers. They, not, they, come and, they didn't come to us like the American or the British, think about their interests. The Chinese come and think about our interests and the Iranian interests. And that's why they win. And they did it and they uh, shocked the Americans. And we, same like uh, Iran, and same like Israel, we think about interests. 
our interests. And in Saudi Arabia, we have a new uh, generation, a new leadership. Israel should care about this, should help in this uh, way of peaceful region. It's a part of uh, even Abraham Accord, but Abraham Accord is just a small step and a long road process to reach the peace in the region. And let him help Iran, let, let us help Iran, let us use this deal. Not like what happened in, uh, in Israel, they, uh, they are against this, they think it's uh, like an uh, operation between Saudi Arabia and Iran against Israel. No. In the end, we will, we will know exactly what's the points of the agreement, and we will find if Iran and Israel do the same agreement, they will do the same points. They will reach the same points we reach it with Iran, and we should reach it with Iran, I hope. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to echo two things that you said. The first is... Let's not go to Saudi Arabia and speak about the Abraham Accords. You know why? Because you're going to get this. They, for those who don't speak Yiddish, it means, oh my God, here we go again with the Abraham Accords. You need a new methodology with the Saudis. His Royal Highness, the Crown Prince, was clear. He does want to see Israel as part of the neighborhood, as an important part of the neighborhood. But it's going to take a different type of approach. And the second point, which you touched on at the end, has to do with Iran. What did we expect? The leadership of Saudi Arabia's job is to protect its country. And in order to protect its country, they thought that this was necessary for their country. It has nothing to do with Israel. There may be a byproduct to Israel. There may be a byproduct to the United States. I mean, I'll say reluctantly, congratulations to China for getting it done. It doesn't make me happy that it was China instead of the United States. But the reality is China got it done. So thank you for that. <clears throat> Dr. al your, uh, your work um, with refugees is, is remarkable, and, and the Kingdom of Jordan has done a great job with so many types of refugees. Let's talk about the peace with Jordan, which has been a positive development for Jordan and Israel, and the region generally, but I think it's fair to say that the Jordanian street is not quite as enthusiastic about norma uh, normalization with Israel. How can we deepen the commitment to bilateral cooperation between Jordan and Israel from the bottom up. Yes, uh, thank you so much. Um, I, uh, I have uh, experienced all the peace process between Jordan and Israel since 1994. And uh, I have seen, uh, I have here today the, the word called peace, describing peace with Jordan and uh, uh, Egypt with Israel. And I have to put this on the table as a worry because Egypt started early and now it's cold. Jordan or the Palestinians started early with no harvest. The Jordanian, they have started in 1994. It's now cold, described. So I have a worry about Abraham Accord, you know. And uh, some of my friends, even in Israel, we think sometimes because we have experienced the peace with Jordan and the early quick collaboration, especially in tourism, for example, and business uh, import export using Haifa Airport exactly. And we think sometimes that Abraham Accord is possibly to be a bubble. So people are building big hope on Abraham Accord and these agreements, which is one scenario. And I like my Saudi colleague also, who said Saudi is not in the queue line. So these are different scenarios come from time to time to the region. Jordan a priority uh, is uh, economy in general. And um, Jordan is not an end destination for the Israeli products. Uh, many of the Israeli technologies are not needed. Some of, uh, let's say, thoughts about uh, also the countries involved in Abraham Accord for some of my friends in Israel about economy and the need for the Israeli technology, I think is not right. Because in an open globe, an open market, 
free trade, what was signed between Israel and Emirates, is decades, signs with other countries. So we are new also on the table. Many of the technology are not needed from Israel. And uh, uh, the model in Saudi is example. China is more important and more suitable. It means because the cost of the Chinese product are cheaper, let's say. Pa part away, part from the political point and the security and the worry of the Americans in the region. But the people in the region will not wait the other side forever. People will step forward. Israel is doing the same with the Palestinian. You are stepping forward. Jordan is, is a stepping forward to economy. Jordan is, is, is not interfering with the economy cooperation in the region at all. And uh, we have the door open. We have found obstacles not related to Jordan. In Jordan, the, the top uh, agenda is, is the Palestinian uh, issue or the Palestinian case or the Palestinian file. It's very important for Jordan. Jordan believes that the Palestinian file is a priority bilaterally, multilaterally to find a new or to come back to the previous, let's say, corridors to this bilateral discussion between the, the Israelis and the Palestinians. What is about the business between Jordan and Israel exactly is that it is not a social business. I mean, the people, they don't feel the added value of this bilateral businesses between Jordan and Israel. Uh, in the street, you don't find uh, Israeli pro products. You don't find Israeli agencies. People in Jordan are used to the UK products. If they want to pay much to buy the Israeli technology, they will buy the US technology. Now they buy the Turkish. They buy the, the Chinese. The Indian is coming to the region. And uh, it, this business with Israel, it's cooperation mainly on food security now, agrotech, uh, water. Uh, uh, these things are very limited with certain channels. It's not public. And the government cannot go publicly, you know. And the last... Um, story that happened between Jordan and Israel, the, the Minister of Finance, the map in, in, in Paris, it was like shocking. This takes the government back decades because a lot of people are waiting in the corner to the peace believers and saying, ah, we have told you, you have this risk, you have this mentality, you have these people Certain people, not, I'm not talking about all the community of Israel. So Jordan is not able to go publicly. We were very happy, I think, with the Abraham Accord in general because it creates also, as you said, a chance for also the Palestinians and the Palestinians or the Arab Israelis to move to see uh, the other uh, people in the neighborhood, the Arabs, the Palestinians uh, should benefit from Abraham Accord. We are supportive. Jordan, from our economical assessment on different businesses in the region, Jordan was very open to this economical uh, cooperation, very supportive. We have no obstacles. We don't put uh, any uh, walls in doing business in the region. But of course, we found that the competition is there. And when we want to bring some items from certain countries in the region to Jordan, we find it's cheaper from the Mediterranean, from Turkey. So there is people, they don't think politically when they want to buy items. So when you, when you go to Dubai malls and you see the, the food from Israel is double the price or three times more the price of the products, people will not buy it politically. 
maybe some people they like kosher food or etc we buy kosher in london we buy kosher in in, in budapest because as muslim we trust the uh, more the jewish uh, pattern and this is i think the thinkers behind abraham accord they were thinking about what is more let's say what we share together more than what we compete together at the end of the day if the israelis they don't step forward to the people and let the people step forward to them if we kept the mentality of superiority in the region the saudis are super israelis are super jordanians are super palestinians we will not create peace and stability my understanding is peace building is sitting on the table doing negotiation leaders should bring something to give not to take what we are seeing now is a trial of going to the middle east to take not to give and this is my worry also about the abraham accord i hope it will not be a new bubble of the peace building process in the region thank you thank you Aviram, last question goes to you. You spent many years in government service and you're an expert at strategic negotiations. What are the changes that you've experienced over the years? And as head of JCPA's Gulf Africa initiative, what's the role you believe think tanks or do tanks in the case of JCPA should play in advancing goals of common interest? So first of all, thank you very much. Uh, I will start with what uh, Abdul Aziz was saying, and he was talking about Saudi and uh, Jerusalem, and to uh, talk about history and not talk about Abraham Accords. So to me, this is a do, to-do list of a think tank, because to me, as a, a do tank, you really want to work on the people-to-people approach. You really want to talk with people, not only reading articles, not really uh, reading essay or uh, publication, academic publications, you really want to talk to people. So when we are going abroad and we are sitting in Abdel Aziz's porch and talking with Iraqis, with Lebanese, with others, so for us, this is a do thank because when you are talking about policy, it's one thing to write policy, but if you want to apply it, policy, you need to do it through people. And I think that this is what we are trying to do. The second thing is collaboration, really collaboration, not talking about reading or writing another essay together, is doing things. For example, we are doing in one of uh, the research center in the region, we are doing a uh, agrotech experiment. So we are working on that because we said when one center brought a problem, we will bring technology solution, and together on their soil, we will try to solve that. Now, the idea was, it's not to talk about the, uh, the uh, problem, okay, of Susat uh, Nakhil or other things that there is, to really do that. Now, while doing that, then to bring other countries that, are, that they don't have any agreement with Israel, like Saudis, Kuwaitis, Iraqis, to see the solution not to see the Israeli uh, uh, research center, to see the solution. So this is what you are applying uh, 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 policy and then this is what you are doing in the region. So I really believe on people to people and I want to say that um, two months ago I've been in Bahrain. So I've been in Hadiya's house with Ismail wearing pajamas and for me this is Abraham Accords. Because it's not an hotel, you're not sitting, you know, in, 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 a, in a hotel restaurant and talking about politics. You're having shisha together and talking like families. And this is for me the ebar, of course, why? Because afterwards you're going to a bar and people are approaching you and asking us together, where are you from? So we said we are from Israel and they said we are from Bahrain. And the guy said, wow, we are from Saudi, we are your brothers, and they sat with us. So if you would ask me three years ago, if I will sit in Bahrain with Bahrainians, Saudis, and myself together, and having drinks and talking about, you know what, it's not even politics, talking about life, I would never believe. So I think that uh, 
as a center uh, that it's not the government. You are not obtained by nothing and you are not the business uh, uh, level that are like, looking for how much money I will get for that. So here you have an opportunity, a unique opportunity to work through the tools of people to people and to engage more people. Now, we are thinking about a lot of ideas like, okay, we are writing an article, but we'll, we will promote short movies, okay, a short podcast. And how you will do it? Well, this is people to people because you know many influencers, you know many people that are working in the media, so they will help you to do that. So to sum it up, I think that the uh, um, Jerusalem Center is uh, more of a people-to-people -people approach. And this approach, I think, will really, I hope, try to apply policy more than talking about policy and really do th uh, think on the ground. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So we're going to turn it over to the guests here to ask some questions just before they do. I want to just sum up uh, what Aviram said and what I really heard from the panel, which is, let's talk about life together. Let's fix life together. Some of us will do it in our clothing. Some will do it in their pajamas. But uh, let me uh, ask you, who has a question for our panelists? Sir? I don't know if you have a microphone there. I, I wish I could come to you, but there's a cord on this one. Do you want to? <laughs> do you want to come up here? ignoring a uh, two-state solution. It's uh, uh, a part of uh, the, the main, I think, main point of Abraham Accord to accept two-state uh, solution. I'm not talking about Abraham Accord because my country is not part of it. I'm the last Yet. one to talk about it. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I think Abraham Accord um, step is just try to normalize the relation. It's a step to uh, bring Israel to uh, a good relation with that. It's uh, correct the uh, errors in Camp David and Jordan uh, Wadi Araba uh, agreements. Also. Those two agreements between Egypt and Jordan, it's uh, missing a lot of appointments, uh, a lot of uh, points, and a lot of uh, appointments to, to, to see the, the real relation between the nations. The, and the other problems is. Uh, Egypt and uh, Jordan they have a uh, war memories with Israel. We in the region and Gulf countries and other parts in Morocco, we have not that uh, 
We don't have it. We don't have a revenge. We don't have a uh, casualty. We don't have a, a, a history of blood. That's why it's easy to make a good relation between peoples. The, the mistake in Camp David and uh, Wadi Araba, our, uh, with the, uh, the, the agreement with Jordan, it's not focus on the peoples. It focus only between the governments. And it's the interest of the government. Uh, it's ignore the people. And now how many years we talk about? How many decades of ignorance? And ignore the real points, they not touch it. And I hope that Saudis always insist that two states is the start of it, and Jerusalem, especially, is the beginning of uh, peace in the region. If we reach some solution for Jerusalem, it's Golden Gate. It will open a lot of uh, uh, things to go forward to two states solution. We can't do it. The Camp David, the do. The, uh, the peace agreement without Jerusalem, without talking about the Palestinian cause as a, a core point. And this is the problem we have it now between the Egypt and Jordan and Israel. Uh, I hope it will go forward. The Israeli and Arabs, they will face the truth and they face, they should go to the main points and solve it. And the time is coming and I think it will be easy in the future because we have new generation of acceptance. People, they accept each other. People, they see each other. People, they have access to the uh, information with the new technologies to know each other, to contact each other without the mukhabarat and mabahith influence, our guidance, the, the uh, uh, security agencies, how they guide the people in Egypt. I guide the drama against Israel, the, 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 the haters. Um, the, there is a lot of things to talk about. It. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Abdul Aziz. Uh, by the way, I'd love to give you my answer, but I don't want to run out of time, so you're welcome to find me later today to hear my answer. We have time for one more question, but before we do, you wanted to say something. Yeah. Um, I, I wanted to add that... Uh, People tend to forget, but one of the main um, motivations, I would say, or the immediate motivations of the UAE uh, two and a half years ago was uh, to thwart a plan of annexation in the West Bank. Okay, so people, people forget about that, but it, it shows that uh, the Emiratis had the Palestinians in mind. They wanted to make sure that the, the way to solve a political a uh, conflict between Israelis and Palestinians is, is still there. And, and this is why the um, Abraham Accords were not trying to sideline or bypass uh, this issue, but um, were um, a change of paradigm, as I said, a, a way to look at it as a, as a new way. And I think it, in many ways it was an awakening because we have now an experience of uh, seven and a half decades of... Uh, anti-normalization as, as the main paradigm of dealing with Israel. Now, how has this paradigm helped the Palestinian cause? How can you help the Palestinians if you're not talking to Israel? How can you influence Israel if you're not talking to Israel? What the Abraham Accords did was to show the Israelis what they can benefit from this uh, partnership, relationship, and, and uh, in a way, show them what they might lose if they are not attentive, if they're not listening to their Arab partners. And we should be very careful to make sure that it works. We should uh, be very um, uh, attentive to what we hear from our partners in, in, in Jordan, in, in, in Abu Dhabi, and uh, everywhere across the Arab world, uh, not offend anyone, and make sure that um, their concerns are, are, are heard. Um, and I love the, I think the Abraham Accords and whatever comes after that uh, with Saudi and every other partner will eventually bring also a solution with, to the uh, uh, conflict with the uh, Palestinians. Palestinians have to be included in every success that these accords bring to this region. They have to enjoy the, the, the fruit of this uh, relationship. We have to make sure it happens, uh, otherwise it will not uh, work. 
And um, we need just a little bit, I loved what Michal said about optimism and, and hope. We need just a little bit more of that and, and never forget that we can, uh, it's in our hands to, to change everything. Uh, and, and, and optimism and hope is, is key. I, I mean, Abdallah surprised me being so optimistic before. Usually he's such a pessimist. And I told him one year ago, I told him, Abdallah, you'll, you're such a pessimist, you'll, you'll end up losing all your hair, and now look what happened. <laughs> I guess another thing Abdallah and I have in common, um, and, and just in response, as my Abrahamic cousins say, inshallah, right? Uh, last question. by the way, or a statement by Dan, but I've been saying this for quite a while, and if I'm mistaken, please correct me. If you want to make peace with Israel, you need to prepare your people for peace with Israel. It's as simple as that, Dan. And I'm sorry to tell you this morning that I still haven't seen any real attempt on the part of Palestinian leadership to prepare Palestinians for compromise and concessions with Israel. In fact, I continue to see the exact opposite every day. I see a massive campaign of incitement against Israel. And it's not new, by the way. It's been there, ironically, since the beginning of the Oslo Accords. It was there before, but it intensified after the signing of the Oslo Accords. Why? Because the Oslo Accords gave the Palestinian leadership the tools to incite against Israel, the media, the radio, TV, newspapers. And unfortunately, this was all ignored by the international community for many years. Many people in the U.S., in the EU, who were funding the Palestinian Authority back then, immediately after the Oslo Accords, did not want to listen to what Palestinian leaders were saying in Arabic. And in Arabic, Palestinian leaders back then, including Yasser Arafat, were acting against the spirit of the Oslo Accords. They were acting against the spirit of peace with Israel. How? They were telling their people that, you know, it's wrong to make peace with Israel. They were sending the exact opposite messages to the Palestinians. Yasser Arafat, I met him several times, by the way. He was repeatedly apologizing for signing these, peace, these bad peace agreements with Israel. He said we had no other choice. Our Arab brothers had dumped us back then because we supported Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait. We needed the money. We also needed a foothold in Palestine. We were offered the chance and we came here. And 
If Israel does not give us everything we are asking for, there will be an intifada, there will be a jihad. These were the words of Yasser Arafat back then. And on top of that, he was inciting his people on a daily basis against Israel. I never heard of any positive message coming out of the Palestinian Authority regarding the need for compromise and concessions. The words compromise and concessions have very negative connotations for the Palestinian Authority. Now, on the other hand, if you are battling normalization with Israel, what, what message are you sending to your people? That peace with Israel is bad. You try to organize a meeting between Jewish journalists and Palestinian journalists in Ramallah, and you receive threats, and you're even kicked out. And some of my colleagues have been beaten up for organizing such meetings. Now, the Palestinian Authority, by the way, is shooting itself in the foot. Because on the one hand, you are radicalizing your people against Israel. On the other hand, your people see you working with Israel. So if you're telling your people that normalization with Israel is an act of uh, treason, then the Palestinians will ask you, the Palestinian leader, why are you conducting security coordination with Israel? Why are you making peace with Israel? Why are you negotiating with Israel? So that's why the, the many things have to change on the Palestinian side if you ever want to have the Palestinians you know, join the Abraham Accords or join any uh, peace agreement with Israel or open up. The way I see it right now, and I spend a lot of time in the West Bank, I just don't see a brave Palestinian leader who can stand up right now and say, enough is enough, we need a new direction, we need to think of something positive. I can't find one. Palestinian who is willing to say that at least openly. So we need to, we need, the, the Palestinians need new leadership. And unfortunately, as long as this massive campaign of delegitimizing Israel and inciting against Israel continues, we will not see the emergence of a new leadership over there. Thank you, everybody. Jason, members of the panel, we have to keep moving at a fast clip because we have a lot of work to do today. I want to make mention of the presence of uh, the chairman of the board, uh, Dr. Professor Arthur Edelman, the JCPA board. I'd like to also mention two scholars of ours who mistakenly didn't make their way into the brochure. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Leoa, if I could have your attention. I'd like to make mention of Pinchas N. Bari, a scholar at JCPA, and um, Ambassador Freddie Eitan, who was Israel's ambassador to Mauritania many years ago. Dr. Alan Baker, who's with us. Thank you very much for being with us, and please excuse me uh, for uh, the oversight, not including you in the brochure. You're as special to us as those with their pictures and bios. Uh, gentlemen, I've got to call up the second panel, and I'd appreciate if you'd have the meetings just beyond the door. Thank you. Uh, the second panel will be as uh, interesting, as exciting as the first. Uh, we're going to expand the circumference of the discussion beyond uh, Israel and her immediate neighbors to a much larger sphere, which will go from Kurdistan 
in Iraq, all the way down uh, throughout the African continent. Our moderator uh, is the deputy mayor of Jerusalem, the very colorful and powerful, influential Flor Hassan. She's a deputy mayor for economic development and tourism, and she's a great blessing to Jerusalem. Come on up, please, Flor. She grew up in Gibraltar and studied law at King's College London University before immigrating to Israel in 2001. She is co-founder of the UAE Israel Business Council and the Gulf Israel Women's Forum. Dr. Belete Yon from Ethiopia, please join us, specializes in foreign policy and international relations aspects of the Greater Horn of Africa and Middle East, the African continent at large. And Dr. Belete was kind enough to host me in Addis Ababa some four months ago. Ambassador John Gayo from South Sudan, who I had the pleasure of meeting in Ethiopia as well. He served as the first South Sudanese ambassador to Turkey and was head of the government of Southern Sudan, Southern African Liaison Office in Pretoria. He is a former Minister of Education, Science and Technology. He is a member of the Transitional National Legislative Council. Mr. Rashid Oufkir from Morocco. Are you here with us? Rashid? Did Rashid step out? Okay, can somebody please inform Rashid, who's probably having a cup of coffee, that uh, we, we need him. No Rashid Ofkir. No, there's coffee right outside the door. Okay. Rashid, we're waiting for you. Uh, Muhammad Ahmad Abul Ghassim of Sudan. Muhammad is the chairman. Chairman of the Governmental Economic Committee and advisor to the President of Sudan, please come and join us. My good friend, another colleague at JCPA, Dr. Jacques Neria, who's a special analyst for the Middle East. Uh, he's a, a retired colonel, formerly the foreign policy advisor to Prime Minister Yitzhak, the late Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin and Deputy Head for Assessment of Israeli Military Intelligence. But Jack, we're conducting this session in English. Jack speaks about eight, eight different languages, so we have to warn him. Uh, Ms. Suzanne Quitaz has undertaken freelance research and writing assessments for several media outlets in the Arab world, including Majala, Current Air Affairs Magazine, Al Jazeera, Al Arabi Television, and Qatar TV. She was also a reporter for Radio Sweden and served as a police officer in London. <laughs> really? <laughs> Suzanne Hells from Kurdistan, Iraq. We'll talk about uh, Iraq and that region. Ambassador Idbedel Muhammad served as ambassador of Somalia to the UN. Ambassador Muhammad, here you are. He concurrently represented Somali government to the US before opening of the Somali embassy in Washington. He also served as advisor to the Prime Minister of Somalia, senior advisor to the Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, and senior advisor to the Minister of Internal Security. He is chair of the Somali Institute of the Security Studies. My dear good friend, Dr. Amare Aweki from Ethiopia. <laughs> Dr. Aweki has served in various academic administrative positions at Deir Dawa University in Ethiopia. He completed his PhD in Peace and Security Studies at Addis Ababa University. He has published several articles focusing on political violence and issues concerned with contemporary security. Later today, JCPA, uh, Dr. Amare, Dr. Belede will be signing an MOU of cooperation between the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Ethiopia. Floor, the microphone is yours. Take it away. Shoot him. Oh, here we go. I would say that my husband says I don't need a microphone, but here we go. So welcome all of you to Jerusalem. It's such a pleasure to have you all here. And thank you so much to the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs, which has in recent times become my intellectual home. They educate me and they make me better as a policymaker. So I'm very, very grateful. And I have to say that of everything that's been said in the last panel, I connect the most 
with Abdul Aziz when he says that everything has to start from Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is normally seen as the scene of the challenge. But today, and this is what I've been saying in my role in Jerusalem is, that we're in fact the laboratory for the solution. Because if we can make it here, like New York, we can make it anywhere. And we have a, a diverse population here. We have a 40% Arab community, 5% Christian community. We have every single religion imaginable on top of the religions that we all know. And we have immigrants, Jewish immigrants, from 60 different countries around the world. And so really we are the mosaic here by which that laboratory can find a solution to make the region and the world a better place. So I'm thrilled to be able to lead this panel and be able to discuss with all of you how you see things. So I'm very excited that we have some countries here even. Yeah, let's, let me not fall off. We have countries that we've had, um, that we've made already peace with. And we have some countries that we're looking forward to making peace with. But let's start with the countries that we already have diplomatic relationships. Let's start with my friends in, in Morocco. Um, hang on, is he in the room yet? No, okay. Oh, is there even room for him? No. Okay, so, <laughs> so we'll leave Rashid for when he comes and we'll try and make... Uh, so let's start with Ethiopia. Um, Dr. Amari, um, you are head of the think tank, a think tank. And, you know, Israel not only has strong relations with Ethiopia, we have a very significant uh, and loved Ethiopian community here in this country. So how do you see the Abraham Accords extending to your country and in general extending uh, to, to the African continent? How do you see that paradigm playing itself out? Uh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, 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 I want to thank uh, Mr. Dunn and uh, Shell uh, for organizing the conference. Um, and then I'm really happy to be part of this uh, original conference. Um, and then to back to your question, uh, we'll see uh, this accord as uh, an important template in uh, bringing as um, a security cooperation in, in the region and specifically in the Horn of Africa we've been facing uh, so many uh, identity conflicts. Um, so, and then at the same time, resource conflict, for example, earlier in the morning, and uh, someone had raised the issue of GERD, and then I think it's probably Shell. So, uh, we've been in, in some sort of a conflict with our neighbors that we share some uh, uh, resources, specifically the Nile waters. Uh, and then this is going to be a very significant template in uh, 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 trying to solve whatever type of what regional conflict with regional solutions. So, uh, and then if it, it, there might be so many challenges in, 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 in addressing... What type of solutions are we looking at? Yeah, we spoke uh, a lot about food security, water security. Do, do you see that triangulation including Ethiopia? Yeah, exactly. I mean, we have so many challenges like, for example, uh, the resource... Uh, conflict is for example right so this is going to be just uh, a template in bringing uh, some adversaries that have been just looking as uh, enemy states uh, and bringing to the table and then to discuss about uh, such a kind of what issues rather than just looking to be some kind of what an enemy state or an adversarial state for forever right so uh, with the help of this and abraham accord so we will be, be able enough to bring uh, uh, some solutions from egypt ethiopia and then sudan for example to, to 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 solve the issues of that of what the guard amicably right so rather than just looking at each other as as as, as a conflict state um, so it is going to be a very significant template in, in, in changing such a kind of a situation. And then the other most important issue that I want to raise in here is, is also uh, we've been witnessing identity conflicts. And then uh, identity conflicts are uh, as the simplest to start, but the hardest to solve, right? So if we are be able enough to bring uh, the entire Arab world and then Israel together with the Abraham Accord, so this is going to be a very significant solution, whatever type of what identity conflict that we are facing in Africa, right? So this template is a very significant template and then we've been looking for it to, to solve these problems. That's interesting. Yeah. I never thought about the identity conflict angle. Let's stay with Ethiopia for a second. Yeah. Dr. Beletta, how do you see the triangulation with Africa, uh, the Abraham, the, the Middle East, 
um, in the Abraham Accords. Do you see that Ethiopia could play a significant role here because of its relations with Israel? Yeah. Uh, Madam Mayor, thank you for... I'm chance. not the mayor yet, but thank you. <laughs> Looking the way you are articulating these things, I think you will be mayor soon. <laughs> yeah, and also uh, Dr. Yechel, the Jerusalem Center, and I used to write uh, to Atara as Mr. Atara, confusing whether she is a male or a female. But thank it you. It happens for, here a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you never know. Uh, it's a privilege uh, being here. Uh, Abraham Accords or not. Ethiopia and Israel have enjoyed a very strong relationship for some time now. Um, whether it is a formal diplomatic relationship or not, it existed for some time. But the Abraham's Accord would add a new flavor because it brings actors from the Middle East and the Horn of Africa Are they together. not there already? Sudan is, in a way, part of the Abraham Accords. Yes, yes. Uh, others will join soon, hopefully. But my point here is that it is not the formal relationship that matters. What brings Israel, Ethiopia, Middle East, and the Horn of Africa together is the silent partnership between the two countries, between Ethiopia and Israel. It has been going on. There were times when the formal diplomatic relationships were severed, for example, between the two countries yeah. immediately after uh, the, the, the Yom Kippur War, 1972. Yes. So between 73 and 89, there was no relationship, formal relationship between Ethiopia and Israel. But still, the security architecture continued. And it is not only a bilateral relationship. Rather, it affected the entire region. So the joint Ethiopia-Israel uh, affair has been instrumental in bringing peace in the Sudan, in South Sudan, and also in containing other belligerent powers in, 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 in the northeastern part of uh, the continent. So, I mean, some formal relationship is always important, but also we have to think beyond the formal. We have to think beyond the governmental relationship. We have to focus more on the silent partnership. Between in, what, in what verticals do you see that happening? Food, water, uh, the usual that we keep talking about? Or is there something beyond? No, I mean, I mean, first we have to take care of the security, the political arrangement. Then also we can diversify it into agriculture, food security, etc. But... These two countries have to navigate a very delicate region. I mean, uh, yes, it is good to talk about food, food security, environment, etc. But this peace and security dilemma the two are facing, uh, I mean, I mean is more crucial. Uh, so uh, for Ethiopia and Israel, there is a role to play. They assume responsibility. And also, they have this capability. Because as far as I am concerned, Ethiopia and Israel are silent partners in both regions, the Middle I'm East. I'm not sure we're so silent, but I hear what you're no, saying. No, I mean, I, mean uh, I am trying to be more diplomatically correct. Fair enough. But there is this role to play. <laughs> Dr. Jack Neria, you've Colonel, retire, um, Reserve Colonel, you were an advisor to uh, Prime Minister Rabin. You've got so much experience also in the region, um, Africa especially. How do you perceive the Abraham Accords? Are you optimistic or hopeful, as Michal said? Um, are you concerned about things that could take us back? How do you see this? Do you, what would Rabin have said if he were to open his eyes and see what's going on here? He would, be, he would be very much surprised about what's going on. Uh, basically, I mean, I, I will talk as a former intelligence officer and I'll, uh, I'll say very bluntly and plainly that the Abraham Accords are facing headwinds. And the headwind comes from the east, from Iran. And Iran is, uh, is very active in sub subversive activities all over the places 
where Israel has an interest, whether in the, in the Gulf area, whether in Saudi Arabia, whether in Africa. We've seen Iran intervening, for instance, in Algeria because of the rapprochement between Morocco and Israel. So Iran entered the, the, the scene and is providing weapons and training and equipment to the Polisario just to, just to create a problem between Morocco and Algeria. We've seen Iran going downwards to Nigeria where they are trying to convert the uh, local Muslims into Shia. They are the pouring millions of dollars there, and we have, uh, uh, we have uh, the, the famous Sheikh Zakzaki, who's there in the 100 kilometers from Abuja, and parading hundreds and thousands of, uh, 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 of combatants that, uh, that he has trained, and raising the flags where, and, and banners with Khomeini, with, the, with Hassan Nasrallah, this is what we are facing. Are you concerned by the Iranian-Saudi uh, rapprochement that saw a deal a couple of weeks ago, brokered by the Chinese? This is definitely a breaks. It breaks in the, in the process, and we have to overcome that. We, we have How do to, we do that? Be, we, first, I mean, we have to go and, let's say, uh, negotiate or talk with the Americans. And uh, the, without the U.S., nothing will, uh, will go on in, in, this, in this area. And the fact is that the Biden administration is just uh, almost passive. Uh, with, uh, it's only in the, the last, uh, last week when the, the American troops were attacked in Syria that the Biden administration is responding. So with the, uh, with the passive attitude of the United States, nothing will happen. Uh, the, the United States has have to be uh, uh, an important element in, uh, in promoting the, the accords. After all, they were the partners, they were the big, the, the big brother yeah. that brought the, the, the partners uh, around the, the, the table. And I think that we have to be very careful and, uh, by saying that uh, Saudi Arabia has also its own interests. It's not by chance that they have uh, mended the fences right now with, uh, with Iran because of the lack of American support. I mean, the, the, the Saudis are very much, uh, I would say, angry. They're, yes, they're angry at the Biden administration, and this is a, a reaction. And now the, the, they, have, they, have, uh, they have introduced a new partner in the area who serves as a guarantor, the Chinese. Now, the, and uh, when, when the Americans retreat, then there's no vacuum in the area. Russia comes inside, and Iran comes inside, and also now China. So this is basically, uh, I think that uh, we have to understand that, as, as I said, the, the Abraham Accords are facing headwinds, but not only from Iran, but also from, uh, uh, from disruptive uh, jihadist factions in the area, which most of the countries that are here suffer from, yeah. uh, uh, from, uh, from, the, from that phenomenon, from the Sahel, from the beginning, from Mauritania to Mozambique, this is what's happening. And uh, the fact that uh, Libya has fallen and become a, a failed state, the whole south of Libya is in the hands of, uh, of the jihadists. Very concerning. Maybe uh, Ambassador Yo from South Sudan, we have the Abraham Accords, part of the Abraham Accords are with Sudan, which opens up Africa, which cut the very toxic root of these jihadists. What's going on with South Sudan? What is your view? And can Christian Africa, because we've been talking about Muslims and Jews, but Christians are also uh, children of Abraham, so contribute to this expanding, hopefully, peace. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's working. Thank you very much. And I thank particularly uh, Hail for uh, inviting us and for Dan and the, and the team at GCPA. Uh, let me let me put it this way. I think uh, uh, right from uh, Camp David agreements and then to uh, the, the the agreement with Jordanian and the Oslo Accords up to the Abrahamic uh, Accords, it seems that Africa, one billion people almost, uh, has been at the backdrop of all these things, more of an observer and sometimes active because quite a number of our countries, they are members of Islamic uh, Council Conference, but also they are members of, uh, of, the, uh, of the Arab League. And because 
majority of the population of Africa are Muslim, Christian, and, uh, and also that here to Judaism, some of them, you know. Yeah. It means that much of what is happening in the Middle East, and particularly Arab Israeli conflict, is being felt. And when you are an observer, a lot of things happen. Quite a number of African countries all along did have diplomatic relations with Israel and also did have diplomatic relations with Palestinians. So you have to couple with, grapple with issues of security, how to take care of Israelis' missions and Palestinian missions. Number two, even at the level of uh, the Middle East, as we understand it, we have concerns of security at the Red Sea. Uh, you know it very well. A good number of African liberation movements were supported by Israel. Uh, so these dilemmas, which we call them, of Arab-Israeli uh, conflict, created within Africa a feeling that what has been taking place from, 19, from 1980s up to today between a Palestinian and the Israelis was in fact a process that is determined at one point in time in history that they will have to come to agreement. But of course, uh, a joke in Africa would say, but these are brothers and cousins, why they have been fighting for that long and they are not coming to an end? The reason being that you cannot deal with complicated issue that is embedded with security in a very simple way. Why I'm saying this? We have witnessed this clearly. My colleague from Sudan, we, we were one country up to about 11 years ago. And there were three things which concern everybody. Uh, as a Sudanese, I was not allowed to travel to Israel. It's time in the passport. And uh, immediately after we became independent, my country immediately uh, recognized Israel. We, we didn't have issues with that. But this is because we're at distance. So the first problem is distance. The second concern was we are a landlocked country, as I saw that. Red Sea is the main entry point for us. And then we have Kenya, uh, the, the Indian Ocean. That's a concern. Now, how many countries in this? Maybe 24 countries? So they have the same concern like us. The third one, which is important, is the global and regional alignments after uh, the last, you can say, 30, 40 years were very interesting globally because the world has realized that you can have serious issues between countries, between people, part of the identity issue mentioned. But if the parties to the conflict do not concern with the surrounding, then they themselves become disadvantages. So the Abrahamic Accords, in my view, the architects of these people, has, they have realized that you, if you deal with the arab israeli conflict, and then there's something else called Palestinian-Israeli conflict, then you have to dichotomize it. This is a very good concept. And I think this is something we can develop here. So on the one hand, you are dealing with issues of Arab-Israeli conflict, and you say you open up, it's good, Jordan first, Egypt then, and then we go with the others. And those people, they have a moral obligation towards the Palestinian issue, but for the rest of us in Africa, it will be very easy for us to genuinely advise both sides, because now we are no longer feeling that if I talk like this, a Jordanian will feel like I am siding with this or that or and so, so you're saying that essentially this opens up the ability to become an honest broker uh, as a country that has supported or has kept relations with both sides. You can become two. Actually, you're right. You cannot become a broker uh, if, if, the, if, the, if the immediate countries with the interest, let's say United States of America, it's very important. Uh, a country like uh, Saudi Arabia is very important. And, and so you can go with the list, about seven or eight countries. 
if those countries that are beginning to develop the interest that this diversification of the peace process, let me put it this way, Africa as a bloc will have no problem because some are Muslims, majority of them, they feel affiliated. Some are Christians, they feel affiliated. So now, for us, the door is open for everybody. I, I, this is how I look at it. Well, that's a it's very, a long process. It's an interesting maybe. and positive take. Moving on to your colleague of Sudan, that we were part of the Abraham Accords, um, Mohammed Ahmed Abu Ghesem. What do you see today as a signatory country of the Abraham Accords are the main blocks to the development of the normalization, peace, mutual prosperity? Where do you see the the challenges in that new relationship that we have with you. Okay, first, uh, thanks, thanks uh, GCP and thanks Yashel, Dan, Ephraim uh, to invite me again. This is the second visit to Tel Aviv or to Jerusalem within uh, uh, one month ago. Uh, okay, first, uh, for Abraham Accord, I think it is different, different for Sudan. Sudan is a different country totally. Yeah. So, as uh, one of my colleagues, you cannot make Emirates or, or American address and want Sudan to address it or another country to address it. It will you not be. You can't cut and paste. You cannot. And you're the first Su African Sudan country that is we different signed totally the because Abraham there is a history. Yeah. Sudan fight, fight against Israel in 1984. Yeah. No other country fight for yeah. Africa or Arab like this, even Arab, just Egypt or. Uh, Jordan and Syria. Other Arabs didn't make. So the situation of Sudan is totally different. We have two uh, problems in Sudan. Arab, Arabic uh, culture and Islamic, political Islamic. So both of them, as uh, my brother say, before in our passport you can find except Israel. So for them, after they have the country, immediately they uh, finish it. But for Sudan, to change the culture, you need different mechanism. Different totally. What it mechanism? Is not, it is not only economic or water or food. No, no. It is another different totally. We need it, especially for Sudan. Uh, I think for another African country, most of them, they didn't need Abraham Accord. Because already they have no uh, main problem with Israel. The problem with Israel, actually, in this area, in this region, for some Islamic or some Arab countries. For other countries, they have no problem with Israel since, as I know. So for the Abraham Accord, for Sudan, especially, I'm talking about Sudan, uh, we need to activate it. We signed uh, in January, I think, of February 2021. Yeah. But until now, nothing happened. Nothing. Okay. Because, as I said from the beginning, you use it, you use a different way. You use a scale of Emirates or Bahrain or... Um, Morocco and you want to do it in Sudan, which what, will not what happen. What should we be doing? This is what why why we came here. That's why we try how we how we can <laughs> Give solve us it. some ideas. Yes, this is why we came I mean, here. Look, let's be honest. There's instability in your country, and there's been some political instability in this country. So how do we get past that and move forward? What are the three recommendations? that you would give Israel to how to move forward with the normalization and peace with, uh, with your country? Uh, okay, first, we need to push for economic relations. Okay. And humanitarian. And uh, number three, I will talk about it, the political issue between Sudan and, and, and Israel. These, I think, the third, three, three uh, ways we can start it. But even this is not a solution. Solution is a different. Because, as you say, you are an Arab and Muslim country. Yeah. Don't forget this. It is not just, as I say in the beginning, it is not just uh, uh, economic relation. No, no. It is different. It is normalization. It means uh, social to social, people to people. Or you want, like uh, Camp David, until now, nothing. Since uh, 40 years, yes, there are diplomatic relations between uh, Israel and Egypt, but on the ground, there is no real normalization. We need to make real relations with the people with a different way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you. I, I hadn't thought about the angle that there was fighting, and that's the only 
Abraham Accord country that actually fought with Israel. And that's a very interesting angle that, that I don't think we are so aware of here or we think about. No, no, not fight really. <laughs> Proxy. No, I know we didn't no, really but fight. Different. But there was... <laughs> Exactly. No, but that's an interesting angle. Suzanne, I met you, uh, I had the privilege of meeting you a month ago. Um, and I'd like to move completely back to our region and talk a little bit about Kurdistan, the Kurds. You know, there's a lot of people in this country who feel very emotionally connected to the Kurdish cause. I'm not sure you know that half of this city was built by Kurdish Jews. Um, most of our cuisine here is Kurdish cuisine, even though my Iraqi husband will say that it's Iraqi, but let's not get into that now. But Suzanne, what is your perspective of the wider Middle East and the Kurds and their role and how we can help them and they can help the Abraham Accords? Um, first of all, I would like to say thank you to Dan and Dr. Yachel for inviting me. Uh, though it's a daunting experience because uh, I'm in the business of asking the question, not the other way around. Oh, it's fun, isn't it? <laughs> yes, yeah. So I would like to approach this topic as a journalist, but also as someone who's Kurd and Iraqi. Uh, first of all, and I say it with all sincerity, Israel is the only country when I, they ask me where you're from and I say I'm, from, I'm Kurd, they don't question they don't say, what's Kurd? What do you mean by Kurd? And I like that. And I'm not talking about, I'm talking about, you know, the, from the, um, the average man in the street, the taxi driver. Till well, they're all Kurds, that's they're why. All Kurd, <laughs> yes. Till the meeting Benny Gantz uh, back in the summer in June. And when I said to him, I'm Kurd, he also had something positive to share about, you know, the Kurds. So... Um, uh, before speaking about Kurd, I need to speak about Iraq because sadly, Please. Kurdistan is not independent. And as you all know, uh, last year in October, uh, the Iraqi parliament, um, they approved a law uh, against uh, any Iraqi citizens or institute to have any ties with Israel. And, and you might think, uh, hang on, but I will tell you that most Iraqi they do not support this law. And I will tell you why. Um, I was brought up as a child to have no aggression or hatred towards the Jews. And my family was not unique. I was brought up in diaspora with mom telling me stories about Iraqi Jews, how we all lived as Iraqis. I mean, not many people know, um, back in the 1930, 40% of Baghdad was Jewish. Yeah. The Jewish community in Iraq is one of the oldest in the region. Um, the Talmud, the, uh, the Babylon Talmud was written in, in, in Iraq, in old in Spain. So I was brought up to have no aggression about Jews or Israel. And uh, I always wanted to visit Israel, but I was scared because at the same time when I grew up, I was a journalist and I used to work for Qatari media. And Israel is uh, it's an apartheid. Israel is dangerous. If you go to Israel, uh, it's horrible. It's awful. I didn't believe in that, but I, I didn't have the courage. I was scared. I was scared how the community will react. And I'm not talking about the Kurdish community because the Kurdish community has absolutely nothing against Israel. We have been in peace for decades, but unofficially. <laughs> so, Suzanne, what's going to happen in Iraq, in your, in your view? What... what is there any hope at all? There is a hope, because when this law was approved, yes. uh, some Iraqi politician, and especially Muqtada Sadr, he went on Twitter and said, oh, what a great achievement. And he asked Iraqi to come out and celebrate. And surprise, surprise, few Iraqi went out. I mean, maximum, we're talking about hundreds of Iraqi. They went on the street and, you know, they chanted. But the majority of the Iraqi, they didn't care about it. Iraqis have no issue with, uh, with Israel. In fact, most Iraqi, if Iran wasn't involved in, in Iraqi affair, they would welcome to be part of the Abraham Accord. I'm a strong believer that it will happen, but it will happen only when Iran is out of the equation. So again, what, uh, what uh, Dr. Neria was saying, we go back to Iran as the main source of the problem. Let's move uh, to Somalia now. Uh, Ambassador Eid Bedel Mohammed, 
Um, Somalia is a country that also has seen its share of uh, instability, political instability. Um, I have received personally many overtures from, from uh, policymakers in Somalia about the wish to get closer to Israel. So there is the real desire there from what I can see how, how do you, what is the view from, from your perspective, especially as somebody who was in the UN for so long? How do you see this panning out? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the question. But let me first uh, uh, th thank the president of the JCPA and the team for inviting us and according uh, good hospitality while we're here. I'm also very thankful for the president of state of Israel, Issa Khartak, for his speech of peace and harmony between the state of Israel and the countries who are participate. I can assure you, Mr. President, your message of peace will be delivered in Somalia and we will convey our president and the prime minister and the government of Somalia the wish of creating a close partnership between the state of Israel and Somalia at large. Coming back to Somalia, state, Somalia and the state of Israel relationship and how we are now, uh, I can assure you some sort of uh, strategic relationship has started not only recently, but has existed in early 1953 when Somalia was looking for an independent. Our foreign minister at that time in 1953, Abdullah Isa, has met the foreign minister of the state of Israel uh, and has agreed that the, the, the two countries will become independent they will form a formal recognized state. And by the time we become an state in 1960s, uh, Israel foreign minister was invited by, by our president to come and, uh, and, and play our celebration for being an, a newborn uh, African state. And on and on, that relationship has existed. And I think there's a window of opportunity that we have some sort of uh, a relations that has existed and the state of Israel, formally or informally, has contributed and assisted Somalia on certain uh, Fast forward, uh, after signing an uh, Abraham Accord, uh, I think there's a debate in our country, in Somalia, where will Somalia stand when peace agreement has been signed between the Arabs and the Israelis? Uh, Abraham Accord is maintaining and strengthening peace in the Middle East, but also the rest of the world, including Africa. And the conflict or, or lack of conflict in the Middle East is by extension a conflict or instability in Horn and Africa. The two regions are interconnected. Yeah. Somalia is a member of African countries, Arab League and OIC. is the founding member of African state, uh, African Union, founding member of Arab League, founding member of uh, uh, OIC, an important uh, member state for the United Nations. Uh, who have uh, uh, existed for so long. So the debate has existed and has created a new window of opportunity where Somalia will stand if the Arabs and Islam, some countries, have signed an agreement. I can tell you all indications are, are, are very positive. Senate Sudan, Morocco, United Emirates, Emirates Egypt before, uh, Jordan before, have signed an agreement. Uh, then there is no point why Somalia not have an agreement with the state of Israel. The question is one and how. That is where we are. The question is one and how. Is your uh, government ready for this, you think? Well, I, if, let's put in the context. Somalia is a member of African countries. Africa is an important continent. All statistics are showing that there's an interest, given we are a multipolar system now, there's a huge interest in Africa, and particularly in Horn and Africa. In 2050, the population of Africa will be 2.2 billion, out of 7.2 billion. One in four population of world will be in Africa. 70% of that population are less than 30% in Africa. So Africa become an attractive to many countries, particularly in Horn and Africa. Our leadership, we have a new leadership. We have President Hassan Sheikh Mohammed, who was re-elected, who appointed his close friend, his ally, his political partner, uh, Hamza Abdelbar, as the Prime Minister. In first time, we have a unified leadership in the country. 
who can galvanize any agenda in the country, who can pass legislation in the parliament and Senate. And, and I think I'm, I'm sure 100% that they already welcome the, the signing of our Abraham Accord. Any peace agreement, peace agreement in the Middle East, is peace and prosperity in Somalia and Horn on Africa at large. And in that context, uh, without hesitation, I'm sure that the President and the Prime Minister not only welcome the signing agreement of Abraham Accord, but also Somalia, to the same degree, at the timing of his willing, he will join and sign an agreement with the State of Israel. I can tell you, I have statistically, uh, in the early 80s when we have a Cold War where Soviet Union and, and Cuba was engaged in the conflict, Somalia shifted to the West. And one of the countries it reached out, Mohammed Siad Barra, is the state of Israel. They welcomed him, they assisted him, and they have a security partnership. While I was in New York, as an ambassador, we have all kinds of resolutions in UN General Assembly. How do you guys vote? We voted in to some degree uh, a vote of Arab League and OIC. But more important, I have a good relationship with the Embassy of Israel at the United Nations. And on the day that I needed most, Israel voted me. Voted me because Somalia has a candidate for International Court of Justice. It's very critical. It's the first time we have a vote in UN General Assembly where Somalia has a candidate for International Court of Justice. Israel, I can assure you, 100% welcomed me and voted me my candidate after I lobbied. So we have that kind of interest, <laughs> convergence of interest between Israel and Somalia. Um, so in overall, in overall, and let me give you a very good example. I left Somalia 10 days ago because I have received an invitation on February 2nd, and I knew I was going to Jerusalem first time and discussing the issue of Israel and Africa relationship. In Kismayo, Southern Somalia, Jubalan, before I traveled to Mogadishu, I called four, four people sitting with us, informally asking, how did you see guys Abraham Accord? They're a businessman, there's a religious leader who are well-respected sheikh. The well-respected sheikh, we signed it. of the mosque in Kismayo. I said, why? He said, you know, we are Muslims. We have to promote peace, regardless of differences. So that is the kind of perception that exists in Somalia. So coming to back to the leadership, I'm sure uh, Hassan Sheikh Mahmoud, the president of Somalia, and the Prime Minister Hamza, without hesitation, one time comes in, and there is, a, a, there is a time they will somehow have formal or informal relations with the state of Israel. Amen, inshallah, and we very much look forward to welcoming your government here in a day that we will be able to sign peace and normalization and uh, move forward. So, you know, in the Abraham Accords, the whole time um, that I was involved in creating the UAE Israel Business Council and the Gulf Israel Women's Forum, um, everybody always wanted to triangulate with the Abraham Accords. So you've all obviously got the American relationship because they were the brokers, they were the conveners. Um, and I really, and we have the uh, I2U2, which is the triangulation of the Gulf, Israel and India. But I really think that uh, strategically, the African triangulation can take us to a whole new place and a very stable region and a much better world. So I thank all of our participants. Thank you so much for being in Jerusalem. And please do come back. It's been wonderful having you. Oh, questions. Okay. Anybody have any questions for our panelists? Yes, sir. Tell us who you are. Liberian-American, welcome, welcome to Jerusalem. Jerusalem. So my question goes to the ambassador. Do you see it? Mr. Ambassador, do you see a disconnect between what African youth that is considered to be the future of Africa and those of you who are in political power in Africa, do you see a disconnect between your perception of Israel between the youth and the political leaders in Africa? That's the first question. The second question is, do you think financial incentives drive the way African leaders, those of you who are in political power, do vote against Israel when it comes to international issues? And I'm saying this because I want to put it in a context. Gambia, the former president of Gambia, Yaya Jemi, 
wanted some money from the Arab world. And so he decided that Gambia needed to be a part of the Arab League, even though Gambia is in West Africa. That's one. The second thing is, I have been advocating on several levels at the United Nations with many of you who are ambassadors. And few of the ambassadors will tell you they will vote simply because their principles, the presidents of their country, respected countries, will tell them, if you vote this way, we may not get resources from the Middle East. It happened in the case of Liberia, where a friend of mine, Louis Brown, was the Liberian ambassador at the United Nations. He had to escape from New York simply because he didn't want to take a vote. And the reason why he did that because the president informed him that if we take out of position, it has economic consequences. And there are few ambassadors at the United Nations who do vote based on financial incentives that those of you who are in political power may want to receive from the Middle East. But by that rationale, the Abraham Accords mm -hmm. would actually be a positive influence in the fact that the whole region is now you know, less belligerent and the countries are no longer in conflict. Or are we just talking about Iran again? Well, if you, because I travel a lot in Africa, I just came from there, several countries, I'm fo focused on creating jobs. And if you see the role that China is playing in Africa, that role is limited. If you see the role that the United States is playing in Africa, it is also limited. What Africa needs is what Israel offers, technology, innovation, private, public partnership. When so, it comes to the Abraham, Abraham Accord. So, so let maybe let them answer the question yes. about the, the, okay. the, the, the financial incentives not to vote with Israel. Let, let's put the clear, yes. One thing I agree with you is African leaders and African young generations are in a, not the same beach. There's a huge gap, and we need to reevaluate how our leaders think when it comes to uh, our national interest in Africa. In terms of transactional politics, it exists everywhere. Money is a soft power. It makes influence, and it creates countries who need a development assistant to be influenced by the countries who have money and resources. Uh, in the context of the United Nations system, and I speak on behalf of, uh, from the Somali perspective, it has never influenced. It has never influenced my voting so on behalf of Somalia to be a transactional one. I can tell you, and I said it in publicly that, when I needed vote in the UN General Assembly, all countries come, but let's look in terms of the Security Council. Africa is always have a agreed method of candidates. So we select our candidates without competition and we nominate for the regional rotation when it comes to who will be a member of the UN Security Council. Not in the Western countries. There's always competition within Western countries who will be a member of the UN Security Council. And when it comes to issue of the Israel and Palestinian issue in the UN General Assembly, uh, all kind of rotational issues has existed. There's some countries who might be tempted to have a development aid from Gulf countries, and in that context, food in preference of the Palestinians uh, against the Israel. That has existed. But when it comes to Somalia, it, it has never existed. We were a member of the Arab League, founding member of the Arab League. We are a founding member of the African Union, by the way. We are a founding member of OIC. So our strategic interest always comes first when we vote in UN General Assembly or any other forums. How that voting pattern reflects in the, in the vote of the Israeli issues is one issue. There's one thing that I have learned in the UN system. Whenever there's a resolution in UN General Assembly about the issue of the Palestinian and Israelis, always there's a lot of uh, 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 campaign and, 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 and trying to win the votes. The Israeli reach out to the certain countries, particularly in the West, some Arab countries, some African countries that they have relations, and, and seek uh, in favor of their position. So does the Palestinians and others. In that context, in that context, it's not a transactional one, I can tell you. 
what was transactional to some degree and issues are much more higher stake. If you look in the case of Iraq war, if you go back to the UN Security Council, uh, where when Americans were preparing to go to war in Iraq, and Secretary of State went to the UN Security Council and was seeking a vote to authorize. Uh, uh, at that time, it became a very serious issue. Certain countries have interested and voted in favor of the US and America went to war in Iraq at that time. I remember, to some degree, a country from Africa who are a member of the UN Security Council voted the vote of the, 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 the war of in Iraq. And later become, by the way, that ambassador later become UN Special Envoy on Somalia. He was appointed as a UN Special Envoy on Somalia. So in African countries, yes, to some degree, money and resources influence their own voting system. Ambassador, but, let's hear from our second ambassador. I, I think, I think <laughs> the, the most important thing, uh, uh, look at it from a bigger picture. Africa is, if you look at its map, is an island with very important four coasts. The, the east coast, where we come from, the southern coast, the western coast, and the northern coast. All these from geopolitical perspective. If you look at it from current stage of underdeveloped we are in, we are in a sorry situation. But as he said, beyond 250, 270, our population will become very important population. And therefore, the kind of politics we are using now may not necessarily be the same. And that's why we are saying, if the Middle East is trying to redraw, or what uh, somebody actually said, renewal of the Middle East. Realignment. Realignment. If it is going that trend, it is our obligation for the sake of our generation, our continent being very young, that we, our decision must be informed differently from the perspective we are saying. So it is a good advice, let me put it this way, that there is something bigger than that, that we will become the, the eye of the world. Any, any, any country that is important should take us very serious because the forecast I said make us very strategic compared to other countries that are either too old and too tired but they want to retire, and they have to retire somewhere. Dr. Thank Belletti, you. you had an insight about this. Yeah. Uh, let us, uh, I think, steer the waters a little bit deeper. I just returned from uh, a task force meeting where the majority of IGAD states were represented, and Israel was mentioned. There was this kind of nervousness among representatives. Where? Uh, shall I mention? <laughs> the African Union no, Conference? <laughs> no, uh, and IGAD Conference. Right. And, and uh, representatives from Somalia were also there. Yes, everyone admits the importance of Israel to the Horn of Africa, to Africa in general. But how we are going to handle Israel is a little bit difficult at the moment because Every member state in Africa, in the Horn of Africa, is undergoing a difficult period at the moment. And there are far greater transactional actors invested in the process. So what Israel offers as an alternative to Horn countries, to Red Sea countries, to Gulf of Aden countries, is not that much visible compared to others from the Middle East, others from the West. So how we are going to manage the Israeli Horn of Africa relationship requires a deeper assessment. So, I mean, when Sudan joined the Abrahams Accord, it is not in the best of its shape. There is this transition going on. Somehow it was imposed on the Sudan Somehow, the U.S. administration, particularly the Trump administration, imposed on the Sudan as an ultimatum to join the Abraham Accords. What a strong Sudan would decide later on remains a question. Well, let's pray that they, that yeah. they decide So the again. Somalis <laughs> as well might join the Abraham Accord. That is why I said in earlier, for the Horn of Africa countries, including Ethiopia, 
the Abraham Accord or not, Israel remains important. But it is how we manage that relationship in ways to shape the peace and security architecture, on, on, on ways to make it more beyond the transactional relationship is in the interest of both Israel no, and the whole Thank state. you so much for such an honest answer. Any other questions? Yes, over there. S sir, who are you and where do you come from? <laughs> we can hear you. <laughs> the microphone. Thank you. Thank you so much. I am actually from Somaliland, not Somalia. We are actually independent country from Somalia. We say we are the only democracy in the Horn of Africa, only democracy country. And we are the most peaceful country in, so in, in the Horn of Africa. We have separated from Somalia for almost 30 years ago. And we have got more in discipline in terms of democracy, stability in the Horn of Africa. We actually, I'm not in the panel, unfortunately, I should have been in the panel, because we are struggling for recognition for over 30 years from Somalia. The ambassador forget that we were the only country, the first country that created Somalia in 1960, and he forget that in, it was actually Israel which recognized Somaliland at that time in 1960. And at that time, there was two, two, two countries. One was in Libya, and the other one was Somalia. The Israeli voted for Somalia to become a member of the United Nations in, in 1960. So actually, and we have got problem with Somalia. Somalia is actually suffering a lot of Islamists and militant groups, Al-Shabaab, and they are suffering in this factional government, because there is a member of federal states, a member of federal states like the ambassador mentioned from Jubaland, Butland, and Gelmuduk, and you know, southwestern Somalia. So they have got a mechanism which will not be able to work, and they are also dragging us that problem to them. So I think the president Hassan Sheikh Mohammed, and are you going to? Uh be part of the Abraham Accords? We, we, we will be first, actually, before them. In, uh, sign <laughs> Only in the Jerusalem Abraham, are we going to solve... The Abraham Accord. We, We're going to... I, I suggest that yes. we have a peace conference for the African nations <laughs> in Jerusalem. <laughs> Amen. Thank definitely, you very much. Th thank you. Thank you so much. We, we will definitely sign the Abraham Accord faster Amen. than Somalia. Thank you. Uh, we, we'll be happy to broker that peace, by the way. Ambassador, two words, we need to finish. Well, I just want to thank my brother from uh, <laughs> Somaliland. Uh, actually, uh, I haven't forget anything. The reality is Somalia is sovereign, independent, recognized, one state, where even if Israel recognizes any country in, in our region, it will be the sovereign state of Somalia. It's not going to be any other. Uh, well, let's work towards so, everybody recognizing everybody. But we wish them. Uh, <laughs> our point, we wish him all the best. Amen. Uh, Somalia is recovering. It's doing very well. And I can tell you 100% in the next 5, 10 years, it will be one of the most stable, not only stable, but one of the most prosperous countries in our region. Well, we in look... our region, it has the best time in our history. Well, we look forward... We have a new leadership in Somalia. We have a new leadership in Ethiopia. We have a new leadership in Kenya. We used to be a rival. We're no longer a rival. We are our ally and friend and working one another. Somalia, Ethiopia, Kenya, Djibouti, Sudan, South Sudan. Our region, Horn of Africa, has the best time in history. And peace and stability will be coming very soon as a last year. Well, we hope Jerusalem, the city of peace, can help in any way that we can to make a better region, a better world, a more cohesive world. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Flora. Thank you very much to the panelists. We're going to take a 10-minute break exactly at a quarter to 11. We're going to start the panel on security, counterinsurgency, led by the president, Dan Dyker. No. A quarter to 12. Thank you. A quarter to 12.
time when there's not too much noise, you know, maybe in between, whenever you feel comfortable, but it's probably best after the main course before dessert. Okay. What's that? But Sachi's going to come. Sachi hasn't canceled. He'll be here in an hour and a half, an hour and a quarter. Head no, 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 no. He's independent. He's not in the Knesset. So he has his own security detail and my own decisions. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have to begin the session. Uh, Jack Khalid. Ahadia. I have to start the session, please. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Jack, to Daraba. Okay. Ahadia, uh, Dr. Amin, please come forward. Uh, Professor Simin, please. Uh, Dr. Berko, please join us. Gadi Yavarkan, is Gadi Yavarkan in the audience, please? Odelia, please close the doors and tell everybody to come in. If everybody would be so kind as to take your seats. General Cooperwasser, please. Gadi Yavarkan. Hey, for Gadi. Dan, you've got musical chairs going on. Dr. Dawit. You're missing, you're missing Dr. Burak. Ozbek. Dr. Ozbek, please. Okay. I'm going to start in exactly one minute. The countdown is on. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we're about to start. If you can please take your seats. Ladies and gentlemen, it's difficult for us to start. Uh, Odelia, we're waiting for Gadi to introduce Dan. Okay. You gentlemen have seats in the back. Don't see you standing. We'll give Gadi Avarkan another 15 seconds to 
make his entry and introduce our president. The OF, can you check, please, if former Knesset member Gadi Avarkan is outside? We're waiting for him. May just, yeah. yeah, I'll just, I'll just introduce Gadi. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is a, okay, that in the spirit of this is really a family, I think by now we can say it's truly a Middle Eastern African Israel family meeting. Uh, and we're, oh, did you want Should to I introduce you? Oh, <laughs> I think we all know who we are. It's <laughs> cool. Good morning. It's not African times, okay? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Jerusalem, the center of the world. My name is Gadi Varkan, former Deputy Minister of, the, <clears throat> of Public Security and former member of Knesset. I am, in Bo I am an Israeli Jew who was born in Ethiopia and lived there until I was eight years old. Even though I grew grow up in Israel, my memories of childhood in Africa were formative and remain very positive. I have always believed that the Africa-Israel Israel relations are, are, we, are vastly important. Hence, it was always crucial for me to foster these ties. When I was member of Knesset, I had the opportunity to do so by creating conference attended by Israel and African countries. As an, as an Israeli who was born in, in Africa, I believe this continent and, and it is citizen in many, in many fields Africa is the future of humanity. However, in order to master the future, it needs to be independent and united. Africa is a voluntary continent full of resources, its great potential, greater than any of the world continents. I believe that Israeli, that Israel and Africa have many mutual interests and ideas. As the neighbors we live in the region, we should collabor co collab collaborate on matters of the research diplomat, agriculture and education. When I left my position as the deputy minister, I decided to pursue this goal further. I took the president of the GC, G, JCPA, Dan Dyker, to Ethiopia with me. I ordered to show him the first hand the, the important of building ties between Israel and Africa. And he quickly understood what I was trying to explain to him. He then decided the Jerusalem Center should embrace Africa's huge potential and security and importance and integrated them into the center's agenda for the coming years. I delighted that this idea that become a, re a reality. Indeed, shortly after this trip, I short 
the Dan, you remember, I think. And uh, shortly after this trip, the center in initiated this conference that are intended today. And I believe it's only the beginning of the future. Relations bet between or Israel or countries, the director is the director of the Africa initiative in the Jerusalem Center. I am, I am dedicated to foster relations between Africa and our countries. Ladies and gentlemen, I think it's very, you know, Dan, uh, where, where's the, please, Boregalopo. Uh, come with me, Dr. Yahya Leiter. Come, Bolmala, Bolmala. This is completely unrehearsed, if anybody is wondering. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I, want, I want to explain in Hebrew, please. Uh, the event of the event was happened in the event of the Knesset. This amazing gathering is the result of a chance meeting in the Knesset. When I came to age 8, I met Dan, a Jewish person from the United States. As someone who grew up in Ethiopia and came to Israel at the age of eight, he met Dan, who grew up in the United States, in the Knesset. And he feels this is one of the highlights of his life to stand here before you all because he believes that the ties between Israel and Africa have to be deeper and richer, and he'd like to work towards that end. And he wants to see collaboration grow and believes that our center, the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs, will be at the key to having that happen. And um, I just want to reemphasize, Gadi said he came when he was eight years old from Gandhar. Um, I, I saw Gandhar and I saw the circumstances under which he grew up. And he came to rise through the ranks of society in Israel to be elected to the Knesset and to become the Deputy Minister of Security. And now we're... אני, אני בחרתי בכוונה לכתוב את הנאום שלי באנגלית כמי שהיה באפריקה בלי נעליים, רועה צאן והיה בקוד של הביטחון של ישראל זה היה חשוב לי לדבר בפני אורחינו מאפריקה במזרח התיכון ואנחנו יכולים לחיות בשכנות טובה וזה ההתחלה של הכנס. תודה רבה I don't think I have to translate that. <laughs> he, said, he's, he's, he said that uh, when he came from, from uh, Ethiopia, he, had, uh, he grew up without shoes, and now he's working on his English. So <laughs> we'll, have, we'll have soon both shoes and English. <laughs> when he comes back as minister, not as deputy minister. Dan, it's all yours. Thank you, Gadi. Uh, just a couple of things. Um, when Gadis opened his English speech, which I think was a continuation of the Bar Mitzvah speech when he was 13, <laughs> he said that, you know, Jerusalem's in the center of the world. And we really believe, uh, Yechil and our whole team at JCPA, that Jerusalem is our shared city for all of us here. For Jews, Muslims, and Christians, it is our wholly shared city. And if you look, if you look at the the print here, we never, dis we never discussed why we have this wood carving. This is the logo of the center. Uh, Abdullah Abu Junaid, he said about, we have to restabilize. Where are you, Abdullah? You, you said something very, very important. 
many things important, but at the end, we have to restabilize the region. Here is the vision 500 years ago for the three continents as, uh, as uh, Heinrich Bunting was a German theologian, and he made a wood carving, which became for 50 years as our logo. And in the carving, you see the three great continents, Asia, Africa, Europe, and in the middle, Jerusalem. That was a geographic vision, and it was a theological vision from his point of view. And is it not extraordinary that in 2023, we all sit together, leaders and colleagues of these three great continents, sitting together where? Actually in Jerusalem, to concretize the vision that, the, that was 500 years old. So sometimes dreams really do come true. Uh, and I want to, in that sense, say that when Yechiel and I were discussing having this uh, conference with our team at the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs, we thought about the concept of national security in a much broader context than what we're going to speak about in a moment. Um, usually when we've spoken about national security, we have our discussions with General Kuperwasser about counterinsurgency, counterterrorism, uh, and the classic sense of security. But it was very important for us to understand that food security, water security, agriculture, infrastructure, ex becoming net exporters also becomes part of national security of each country uh, that uh, we represent here today. But at the end of the day, what Abdullah al Junaid said, we have to restabilize. To restabilize, to build a more resilient societies across the Middle East. Israel, Middle East, and Africa, we have to securitize. We really have to securitize, in the classic sense, our societies. We have to make sure that we have physical security. And it's no surprise to anyone here that we all deal with very serious security challenges in the most classic sense of the word. Military security, national security, physical security. Um, Israel had a, in that context, Israel had a very troubling event that took place very recently over our northern border which shook up our security echelons quite a lot. There was a, in the end, Hezbollah has a unit 131 um, that works together with Hamas from southern Lebanon at the instruction of the IRGC in Tehran uh, that sent a particular individual who ended up, we learned two days ago, on a collapsible ladder that climbed up somehow figured out a way to climb over the fence and took a scooter uh, with, and laid down an IED, the kinds that were laid down by uh, IRGC in Iraq against American uh, forces, on a main highway with the intention of killing tens of people on a main thoroughfare. And it was uh, only by luck and, or, or blessing that it didn't happen. But it created a real understanding that this was a strategic game changer from the point of view of, of our security. And we had, I don't know if you know, since the beginning of 2023, uh, and our formal statistics are show, we had 50-5-0 terror attacks in Israel since January 2023. And last year, uh, according to the, also the Global Terrorism Report, Israel suffered more than 5,000 terror attacks. Drones, rockets, missiles, drive-bys, shootings, uh, uh, and, uh, and a lot of uh, uh, stone throwing. And so, but Israel's not unique. Although we're tracing a lot of our, the terrorism that goes on in our cities actually back to the IRGC and uh, the Hamas-Hezbollah intersection, I think in, 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 uh, in the region, we're dealing with a lot of the same, the same issues. Uh, Georgia, you wrote a lot about uh, Hezbollah in Nigeria, uh, in, in fact, uh, northern Nigeria to be specific. Hadia, you talk a lot about, uh, we talk a lot about uh, Bahrain and Hezbollah. So I'm going to introduce now our, our esteemed panelists and talk about the security challenges that each one faces what, and perhaps what can be done in order to uh, generate greater security for our region and our countries. So, Hadia, Hadia it's a great, uh, Hadia Ahmed Al Said in Bahrain, the former president of the Bahraini Journalists Association. She worked as a media advisor to the Ministry uh, of Cabinet Affairs, the Ministry of Information, and um, a political TV host for Bahraini Television. Very, very well known in the region, very outspoken in the region, courageous uh, in your work, in your moral clarity, and, and you write for a number of newspapers. 
Uh, Amin, it's, a, it's really uh, what a pleasure it is to have you from Iran and the United States as well, which gives you a, a bi-continental <laughs> uh, um, perspective. Uh, Amin was born in Shiraz, which is a great wine country, uh, in Iran, and his political activity and education aimed at the actualization of democracy in Iran and laying the groundwork for realistic foreign policy for a democratic and free Iran. He's a frequent contributor to media outlets uh, such as BBC and other international uh, outlets. Uh, Amin is, is a member of a think tank called Anjuman Shahri, uh, how do you say? Shahriar, um, and a writer for a number of magazines in Farsi. You hold uh, two graduate degrees from the University of Oklahoma in the United States, International Studies Philosophy, and his PhD is uh, being co completed in Indiana University. Uh, with majors in philosophy and Middle Eastern studies, and his research interests on conflict in the Middle East, modern Iran, ancient and medieval philosophy, uh, 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 Al-Farabi, and of course, uh, the, what we call the Rambam, or Maimonides. Huh? Epne Maimon, which is a, a quite fascinating. Next name is uh, a longtime teacher of mine, actually, uh, Brigadier General Yossi Cooperwasser, a senior, uh, a senior um, uh, not only senior commentator and expert, but fellow at the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs, and Brigadier General Cooper Wasser was uh, formerly the Director General of the Ministry of Strategic Affairs and the former uh, Director of the Intelligence uh, uh, Assessment Directorate at Israeli Military Intelligence, has been involved on the Iranian, uh, on following and, and recommending on the Iranian file for 30, 30 years, more than 30 years. A little bit more than 30 years, 35, 35, we'll give you a little extra. And, um, and Professor Antonia, it's really an honor to have you. Uh, Antonia Tai Sim, um, Simbain from Nigeria, Director General of the Nigerian Institute of Social and Economic uh, Reform. Professor Antonia is the immediate past uh, National Electoral Commissioner of Nigeria's Independent National Electoral Commission. And she holds a certificate in international civilian peacekeeping uh, and peace building from the Austrian Center for Peace and Conflict Resolution. And, uh, Professor Antonio, your areas of interest include peace and conflict, government politics, elections, and women's p political participation in Nigeria. Uh, and, and next to Professor Antonio is, is a longtime friend and, and colleague. Ah, oh, we switched places. That's okay. Dawit Wild Georges, also a friend and colleague, but not from the Knesset. <laughs> Um, uh, Dewit is a, a commentator, writer, scholar, and executive director of the Namibia-based Africa Institute for Strategic and Security Studies. Um, and Dewit served as the PS of Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Governor of Eritrea, prior to its independence and Relief and Rehabilitation Commissioner during the famine uh, relief operations. And then you served as a UN consultant uh, in the 11 African conflict and post-conflict countries, and was a, f a, f a visiting fellow at Princeton University and the University of Cape Town in South Africa and Foundation for the Defense, FDD, in, uh, in D.C. So you have a very broad, uh, broad perspective. And DeWitt has written a lot on, on the challenge of Hezbollah in Africa, and we'll, we'll ask you uh, a lot about that. And next to DeWitt is a dear colleague and, and friend, former member of Knesset, Anat Burko, Dr. Anat Burko, uh, who is one of the leading experts uh, uh, since her, her, her esteemed Ph.D. on the issue of the, psych the psychology of terrorism, the psychology of suicide bombing, what's the mindset, how do we understand uh, what turns children, and, and in your particular area of research, women and children, to become suicide bombers. And she's advised uh, the highest levels of many Israeli governments, not just one, and uh, was an esteemed member of Knesset uh, two Knessets ago and uh, had the great privilege of being a guest in her committee. Uh, uh, and we'll be delighted to hear um, from you Dr. Anat Burko, and finally, last but absolutely not least, to, to uh, round out the picture, Dr. Uh, uh, Barak Ozbek from Turkey. Uh, professor uh, Barak is the Professor of Political Science and International Relations uh, at TOBB University of Economics and Technology, and your main interests include de facto state, civil conflict, contemporary politics of the Middle East, and Turkish foreign policy. So we really have a panoply of experience, of vision, of perspective uh, on this issue of the need to create physical security across our uh, extended region. Uh, Dee, I'm going to start with you. Um, what, I, what I spoke about uh, Hezbollah for Israel, it's not just for Israel. I mean, Hezbollah has very, lar has very long arms across Middle East region. Uh, Bahrain 
was a, uh, Bahrain was really a pathbreaker. In 213, was the first Arab country, actually, to declare Hezbollah a, a terror organization, and since then the GCC in 2016. Give us your sense from where you sit about, about Hezbollah, uh, perhaps uh, the Iranian regime, and your great security challenges in your very little state, in your small state of Bahrain. Thank you very much, Dan. That's right. Can you hear me? Okay, to start with, um, hello everyone, shalom, salam. And um, yes, Hezbollah, um, if, um, anyway, I just want to comment on something, if you may allow me, Dan. Uh, this session is called the Trusted uh, Partnerships. Yeah, the whole I think, trust. exactly. Right. And I think the biggest elephant in the room is Iran. Now, as, as we speak about diplomatic ties being established between Iran and some of the countries in the Gulf. And why is it the biggest elephant in the room? Because this country, since the doomed Islamic called revolution in 1979, has been the worst neighbor the Arab countries could ever have. Everything Iran has done since 1979 until this day isn't something that the people of our countries can forget overnight. Now, 169 people in Bahrain were arrested in the year 2018 under a so-called Hezbollah Bahrain in cooperation with Hezbollah Lebanon and Hezbollah Iraq. So that was something that we needed to recover from. 2017, for 54 people were arrested and they were associated to Hezbollah uh, and um, involved in acts of uh, terrorism in Bahrain. When, um, when uh, the normalization between Bahrain and Israel took place, uh, the Islamic uh, Revolutionary Guard threatened Bahrain by saying that we will uh, get our revenge in the most cruel manner against Bahrain for normalizing its ties with Israel. That was 12th of September 2020. Again, I'm sharing dates with our audience here because this is not something we're going back to 40 years ago. I'm going back to four to five years ago. In November 22, November 22nd, 2021, a terrorist cell of 15 people were arrested associated to the Iranian Revolutionary Guard and were trained there. Uh, Nasrallah has, uh, has described our leaders as tyrants, and that was most recently on the 9th of August 2022. He has been speaking, uh, he has been referring to our leaders as um, uh, Bashaa and Qubh, ugliness of our leaders in 29th April, April 2020, 20, 2022. And Rouhani, the Iranian president himself, has been describing the UAE and Bahrain after the normalization agreements with Israel as shameful behavior. Now, Iran is taking its final breaths, and by Iran I mean the Iranian Ayatollah regime, is taking its final breaths after... Uh, everything it has been doing in the region, funding Hezbollah, funding the Houthis. Do you think that we can overnight forget that Aramco and UAE were targeted by Houthis that are funded by the Iranian Revolutionary Guard? We cannot forget that overnight. But at the same time, now there is some conflict of intellectual analysis. Now, you live in countries where you have always trusted your leaders that they have the bigger picture of what's going on. These are countries that have grown over the years. For the past 40 years, Bahrain has grown, UAE has grown, so they have been in good hands. Saudi has grown. The past few years, the changes in Saudis, human rights, uh, women's rights, they are huge growth um, that's happening. Um, with Hezbollah in the Iranian regime, and if we speak about the two-state solution, I sincerely believe that as long as the Ayatollah regime exists, there is not going to be any two-state solution because this regime is going to continue to fund Hezbollah and the Houthis, and it's just a matter of time. They are just, they need a break just because of the internal issues they have. So now they need some alliances to cover up for what they are doing, but they will remain to be the regime that rapes people, rapes women in prisons, 
that throws them into prisons just because they remove their hijabs, whether it's compulsory or not. This is between people and their and their and their creator. So when it comes to trusting partnerships, Iran is an entity. The regime is an entity that cannot be trusted with all these interferences going on, with all this funding of Hezbollah and Hamas. You cannot trust it. Iran is, an, is a regime that has been capable of bringing Sunni extremists and Shia extremists together on a table to discuss how to tag team against our securities. So how can that regime ever be trusted? I have trust issues with Iran, and no matter what happens, this trust issue will continue. I do not believe that they have good intentions. I do believe our leaders have great intentions, but Iran will fail because this uh, greed that it has had towards the region to dominate the region is not a dream that will end. This was Khomeini's dream since 1979. It continues to be, and it has been repeated by all the Ayatollahs and all these so-called supreme leaders of a so-called Islamic nation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This might be a one-two punch. <laughs> I mean, I'm wondering how you see it, uh, both as an Iranian and uh, having residency in America and learning in America. Your view, you know, when people talk, when uh, Ahadiyya talks about Iran, there, there, there's ir the regime, there's the IRGC, there's the Ayatollahs, the IRGC, and then there's Iranian people. Right. And what we understand, certainly in, in Israel and in the West, is that some 75% of the Iranian people are very much, are, are not with the regime, but with the West. How, how do you see, first of all, the differentiation when we talk about Iran, the Iranian public, the Iranian people, civil society, people who are in the streets today in all of the Iranian cities uh, following Amina, the murder of, uh, uh, of Amina, Masa, yeah, uh, and the hijab, yeah, in the hijab protest, so-called, uh, and, and, the, and the export of the IRGC ideology as well as uh, weapons, uh, ammunition, training, ideology, etc. Yeah. around the region. Right. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I would thank you, actually, JCPA for inviting me, and thank you, Dr. Liedel, for having me here. Um, uh, this is my first time visiting Israel. As an Iranian-American, it's a great experience. I cannot wait uh, to go uh, visit the city and interact with uh, average people here. Uh, well, um, yeah, I believe in that distinction between Iranian regime and um, Iran as a country. Um, some people uh, argue that, um, since I was a student actually studying Middle East in the, in the U.S., some of my professors would convince me that Islamic Republic's foreign policy reflects Iranian culture, history, and its geopolitical imperatives. So even if uh, Islamic Republic falls, uh, the new government, even democratic Iran, will continue same foreign policy. Well, I disagree with uh, my professor. Um, as time goes, I believe that this actually uh, bringing Iran and Iranian regime together and saying that Iranian regime foreign policy reflects its cultural and historical experiences, I think it's false and it's misleading. Um, Islamic Republic has, three, its foreign policy has three pillars. One, anti-Americanism, second, anti-Israel, and third is supporting Islamic extremism. I mean, nothing in Iranian culture actually support these three. Uh, what it started, uh, it starts from 1979 revolution. Before that, Iran had a great relationship with the United States, had a great relationship with Israel. I mean, uh, Iran was, a, I think after Turkey, was first country uh, in the Middle East that uh, recognized Israel uh, as a sovereign state. Um, Iran had an extensive agricultural relationship with Israel, uh, intelligence, uh, technology, and everything. So if it was uh, basically embedded in Iranian culture to be anti-Israeli, it would not happen before revolution, and ordinary people didn't have a problem with that. 
So, but the ideological thinking, but the Islamists that came to power, they change everything. They change everything. I mean, now, after 40 years of having Islamic State in Iran, you can see that Iran has become the most secular society in the Middle East. Uh, many people here talk about people-to-people -people relationship. I agree with that. Uh, I mean, people's relationship and conscious relationship are not limited to governmental levels. It includes people-to-people -people relationship. But what cements actually uh, people's relationship or turn uh, people-to-people -people interaction into more uh, uh, cooperative uh, uh, relationships uh, is shared values. So I, I believe that Iranian society, not the Iranian regime, actually much more similar than Israeli society, than American society, than any other uh, society in the Middle East, even Turkey, even Turkey. So that experience basically has shaped by uh, very painful experiences that Iran had of uh, Islamic regime. Uh, if we didn't have uh, an Islamic regime, maybe people would go different direction. Still, they think that Islam can be a solution to all social and political uh, problems. But uh, Islamic Republic showed Iranian people in a very hard way that, no, if religion will rule a country, it will turn it into hell. And Iranians, you see, in the last four years, Iranian had three major nationwide uprising to come to the street and chant people's chant things that exactly what people want in the West: women's right, tolerations, democracy, free election. So uh, this is remarkable in Middle East. What I don't understand, uh, actually, that's my criticism of Biden administration could not take advantage of the situation. It's still, they have some sort of JCPOA hangover. They think that still they can change Iranians' behavior by appeasing it. It hasn't happened yet. It hasn't happened yet. Um, if, if Iran's regime changes nature, or if it changes its behavior, it becomes different regime, and it cannot become a different regime. So that's a mistake that I think the Biden administration is doing. Um, talking about having a more stabilized Middle East, I mean, think about a day that Hezbollah is not funded by, uh, by Islamic Republic. Think about a democratic Iran that can help Hezbollah to become part of uh, Lebanese political process to be part of the solution, not, not the problem. This not, will not happen as long as this regime is ruling over Iran. It's, it's not going to happen. So if you want to have more stabilized relationship, if you want to solve Iran's um, nuclear threat, you cannot solve it as long as this regime is ruling over Iran. OK, so from security point of view, any any regime who wants rule over Iran, if they have anti-Americanism and anti-Israel foreign policy, they had to seek nuclear weapon. Because when you actually deprive yourself from America and Israel, you deprive yourself from modern technology to modernize your army, to beef up your security. I mean, Iran has not been able to modernize its air power since 1979. We know the significance of air power since 1967 Arab-Israeli war. That made miracle. The, sh the late Shah after that realized that if you want to have a very a, a robust security system, you need to have a robust air power. Iran has not been able to modernize its air power. So what are options? supporting extremism, having proxy groups, having nuclear weapon, or trying to have a nuclear weapon. So, as, so what I'm arguing is that this regime cannot act differently because of the limitations that its ideology defines for itself.
That's yeah. perfect. That's perfect. For that. that's, that's a perfect. That's Thank a you. perfect transition from there. Uh, uh, General Kuprasser. Uh, so Amin says the combination of uh, IRGC proxy groups plus its uh, intention to nuclearize nuclear weapons is this sort of double-headed threat. You at Israeli military intelligence for many decades have tried to create, I think for the West uh, uh, and others, the notion that the Iranian, th <clears throat> the Iranian regime threat to Israel is not only the nuclearization threat, but it's what they, we've called it the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs, a number of publications, the, Isra the Iranian regime octopus. As a matter of fact, um, His Majesty King Abdullah II called it, he didn't mean to insult Shia, but he said the Shia crescent in 2004. He meant the Iranian regime crescent from Iraq to Syria to Lebanon and down to Gaza, uh, uh, in fact. Can you create perspective for us on this, on this, uh, dual, on this dual threat? Well, first, first of all, I want to really share my appreciation for this meeting, it's, uh, for this conference. It's amazing to see all these people sitting together. Uh, as we say, chapeau uh, for uh, Dan and Yechiel uh, for bringing all, all of you together. It's, uh, it's amazing. And one of the things that brings us together is this uh, concern about Iran or concern about radicalism. Uh, why we are concerned? Because radicalism is, uh, is first and foremost an ideology. And we are worried about this ideology. We uh, confront, we don't uh, support this ideology. We actually have an uh, opposing ideology. And, uh, and we are worried about the tools, the structures that this ideology uses in order to promote itself. And we have a good reason to, to be worried, an extremely good reason to be worried, because as we speak now and we sit here all together, the radicals, and they are not only Iran and its proxies that I'm going to speak about in a minute, but also there are also some radicals on the uh, Sunni side, that, uh, especially within the Palestinian community, but not only, that are also raising their, hand, their head. But what, what's happening right now is that we are getting very close to what Amin was saying about uh, something that the Iranian regime wants to, to achieve, and as they become so close to having the capability to produce a nuclear weapon within a very short period of time. And not much is being done about it. It's, uh, we have to be really worried about it because the entire picture is going to change once Iran has nuclear weapons. And we see that, uh, in my mind, the way uh, the Saudis responded to the Chinese initiative to uh, have a rapprochement with, uh, with Iran was based on their uh, assessment that nobody's going to stop Iran from having a nuclear weapon. So we'd rather be friends with Iran instead of uh, confronting Iran because we don't have anybody to support us, especially not the United States. And they are even not sure about Israel, unfortunately, because what happened here was the agreement about the gas with Lebanon raised some uh, questions about Israel's uh, uh, commitment to, to do the, what needs to be done in order to uh, protect its interests. So that's, that's where we stand right now. The structures that Iran has built, especially Hezbollah, but all the other groups that uh, are cooperating with it, in the Houthis and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad and so on and so forth, are uh, feeling that the, the forces that are there to stop them suffer from weakness. It has to do with what's happening in Israel these days. It has to do with the uh, approach of the uh, Biden administration towards them. That's uh, what makes them feel that they, they can reshape the rules of the game in the Middle East, first and foremost, and uh, elsewhere as well. We see it both in the fact that the Iranians are getting so close to producing 90% of rich uranium. that was supposed to be something that was a red line. Panetta. As, uh, 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 Secretary of Defense at the time, Leon Panetta, said that uh, the United States is not going to tolerate Iran developing nuclear weapons. Now, uh, the chief of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, General Miley, says that uh, the United States is not going to tolerate Iran fielding a nuclear weapon. Well, that's a big difference, a huge difference. And uh, that's something that we have to be worried about. And uh, so Iran is getting closer to this. And Hezbollah 
is uh, according to the picture you just portrayed and what happened uh, three weeks ago in, uh, in the north, is trying to reshape the rules of the game between us and uh, Lebanon, saying we can carry out attacks inside Israel, but if you carry out any, any operation inside Lebanon, we, shall go, we, are going, we are going to retaliate very fiercely. That's uh, what Hezbollah is saying and, uh, with the support of Iran, uh, obviously. And uh, I'm not sure if it is 131 or it is the Palestinian Islamic Jihad. It doesn't matter. It's some group that has uh, good relations with Hezbollah and Iran that uh, carried out this operation, maybe Hezbollah itself. So it's, uh, th that is the feeling that we are facing. Now, in order to stop that, and we need to stop that, we, we wouldn't like Iran to have nuclear weapons, and we cannot afford it, and we cannot afford Iran having this uh, room of maneuver around the, the area, uh, the Middle East, and definitely not in Africa, which they, where they're trying to be more active, as well as the other radical groups, uh, the uh, Shabab and all, all the rest. Uh, the, uh, in order to be able to stop them, we have to sit together like we're sitting here and cooperate much more and show more determinants to, to uh, stop it. Uh, we are not determined enough. No, we don't seem to be determined enough to do that. And we have to be more determined to stop this uh, radicalism. Now, radicalism doesn't uh, show any shyness about uh, the tools they, they use. We are very, always we think to ourselves, oh, we are, we are not going to do this, we are not going to do that. We are not going to carry out, of course, any military activities, God forbid. Uh, it's, uh, we, we have to be looking for diplomatic uh, ways to handle every, every problem. The radicals don't have this uh, way of thinking. For them, carrying out terror attacks is just fine. It's uh, killing people, that, as you said, they were trying to use this uh, uh, explosive device in order to kill many people. Unfortunately for them, I, when I was the head of the uh, military intelligence uh, research division, uh, I always said 80% of my job is being done by, by God because somehow 80% of the attempts to carry out terror attacks fail without our intervention. So uh, this was another case of, uh, of this being done. But uh, we still have 20% to deal with. It's, uh, and, we, uh, and, the, and they are very effective. They are carrying out attacks. Look at the number of terror attacks around Africa in, in uh, recent years. It's, it's enormous. And, and uh, very vicious ones. Uh, we have to, to remember what's being done to Christian villages and, uh, and other t uh, targets uh, around Africa. Radicalism is not shy about using these horrible ways, just like what uh, Amin said about what's happening inside Iran. Same thing. They, they are not shy about doing that. And we have to be aware that in, in order to fight against it, we have to be determined. We have to cooperate much more and operational and intelligence fields to share together the information we have, to be more aware, as it was said in the first panel, of the needs of the others in order to be there to help them be more effective and more uh, efficient as well in what they're doing. It's, it's, yes, we have to focus on economic cooperation, we have to focus on uh, food security, all these matters are extremely important, but life is on the... Uh, uh, and the agenda, on the line. So, yeah. on the line. So we have to, to be able to, first of all, deal with the number one issue, which is life. Yeah. And that's uh, what I think uh, has to be done. Uh, we have just one last issue in, in this respect. One of the tools in which this ideology reaches and gains more uh, support is through social media. And uh, we have to be more effective on cyber issues in general, but on social media in, in particular, and uh, the uh, uh, American Supreme Court is sitting now on the, in the case of Gonzalez versus Google, uh, in which uh, Gonzalez' uh, uh, family claims that uh, Google had a role in radicalizing the, the people that killed Naomi Gonzalez in, uh, in uh, uh, France in 2017. If, some, if we do not do anything about the, the role of social media, the situation is going to be even worse. We see it all over the place. It's uh, something that we have to take uh, action uh, in, in this respect. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Cooper. It's a very uh, important remarks. <laughs> yeah. Professor Antonia, it's not by chance uh, that you're sitting here uh, representing Nigeria. Nigeria, the most populous country 
in Africa, 240 million people, and stakes are very high. As you mentioned before, Boko Haram, Al-Shabaab, Sunni, uh, Al-Qaeda, and ISIS affiliates as well. And as, as DeWitt has written uh, over the last 10 years, you wrote in 2013, DeWitt, I read an analysis about Hezbollah in northern, in northern Nigeria. Uh, so there's no shortage of, uh, of, of, counter, of, of insurgency groups and, and terror groups in Nigeria. Can you help create perspective when Cooper talked about the determination? What is the sense of urgency in Nigeria about these types of groups and uh, their ability to completely uproot the fabric of uh, Nigerian society? Um, thank you very much. I'll join others in thanking the GCPA for this opportunity to be here and uh, particularly to be in the midst of uh, the representatives that are here to listen and uh, to learn a lot, uh, but especially to see how partnerships can really help all of us make progress forward in terms of the uh, problems of our various societies. They look different. They look difficult to each society, but at the end of the day, they are really uh, interrelated. Um, talking about the situation in Nigeria, it's uh, really precarious. It's been uh, there for more than a decade. It's uh, had a very grievous impact on the society particularly the security uh, of the nation, which uh, when you look at security, it begins to affect, you look at military security, the sovereignty of the country, it's beginning to affect other aspects of society. So uh, you, you, you see the um, refugee situation, increasing uh, IDP situation, poverty uh, of uh, very high dimensions, increasing uh, agricultural output, manufacturing index reducing, and so on and so forth. In all these areas, one of the ways to counter radicalism, uh, terrorism, uh, uh, and uh, counter insurgency is really by dealing with the day-to-day uh, -day lives of people. But as long as this situation continues, even the government is uh, hamstrung in terms of dealing with these day-to-day -day situations. No matter how much effort is put in place, you see that it's like a, a cycle. You, you are going back to where you started from and uh, the like. So the situation is really worrisome, it's, but it provides opportunity for partnerships within, but much more importantly, without of Nigeria. So we look at the context that we're in today. Uh, we have a large population of both Christians, Muslims, and other religions. And uh, even the large population of Christians do not, they, they hold on to Jerusalem as a place of, uh, a place to come to for rest, a place for succor. Uh, I think that uh, the general can be talking about uh, being more aggressive, but I also think that the diplomatic needs to come much more with regards to Nigeria. We, we, we broke our relationships uh, about 30 years ago, but I think there's much more that Israel can do with Nigeria. And there's much more to be exploited. There's much more with the impact of the uh, Shiites, for instance, in Nigeria, trying to form counter administrations in the northern part of the country, um, questioning 
uh, sitting governments, you see that even among core Muslims, they are not widely uh, accepted. So I think that knowing that there's room for uh, partnerships, there's room for Israel to come in to make support, to uh, make the relationship stronger, uh, wake it up, strengthen it, and ensure that it is one that is sustainable. And with regards to the negative impacts on social life, I think that areas and sectors like the agriculture, the energy sector, are areas that can be focused on in the support of the Nigerian government to move the nation forward and to see that uh, issues of counter-insurgency are really broken down so that we do not continue in this cycle that we find ourselves. One quick question to you, yes. President. Do you see the possibility of creating a regional security architecture with colleagues in the room and, and not only looking at bilateral diplomatic um, partnerships, but actually building you know, an overarching security architecture to, to uh, feedback these threats? I see threats. that walking through the African Union, but as one of the uh, uh, speakers, I think, in the last uh, session, one of the uh, UN ambassadors, I don't remember his name, but we need to remember, some, no, he was sitting somewhere here. Um, we need to remember that uh, the, it's a continent that is also, you have the north, you have the east, you have the west. People are different somewhat, and we should look at each region differently and not do a cut and paste like one said, but from the African Union uh, angle, I think that there is also room for this kind of synergy. Thank you very much, yeah. Professor Antonio. I want to move to Lieutenant Colonel Reserve uh, Dr. Anat Burko. I, I didn't mention that you were a very high-ranking officer in the Israeli army uh, and having served many years in, in uh, those capacities in addition to being a criminologist and a, and, uh, a doctor. Uh, help us under. Somebody told me because of the gender issue, you need to insist. You need to insist that, that uh, you'll be presented also with your rank from the army. <laughs> okay. because, so I insisted because nobody give up from the you know the men's side. That's right. That's right. So, uh, Dr. Burko, help us understand the mindset. Of, uh, of, a suicide, of, of suicide terrorism, which has, you know, certainly since 9-11 uh, entered into the mainstream discourse and psychological discourse as well of, 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 of terror. Help us understand the, the, the profile. Okay, before that, I, I would like to say that it's a great pleasure to be here today, Dan, and thanks for having me. And uh, I agree with Professor Antonia that there is no different. We're speaking about the Iranian uh, groups, militias, Hezbollah, and we're speaking about the Sunnah and the Shia groups. Hamas, Islamic Jihad, who are also Iranian militias. We have them in Gaza Strip, but they are also, you know, supported by Iran. And you have Al-Shabaab, and you have uh, ISIS, and it's more of the same in the mindset. Although, you know, it's a Sushi issue, Sunnah and Shia issue, but it's more of the same. And as Ahmad Yassin told me, and I'm speaking as a criminologist, this is my expertise, face to face with terrorists more than 20 years inside jail. And uh, first interview that uh, maybe I need to mention that I'm from Iraqi origin, my parents, refugees from Iraq, all my extended family, Linda, like you and like you, and, uh, and uh, Ahali. <laughs> and um, I want to say that because in the West, people do not understand the mentality and the mindset. 
I remember that one time when I gave a lecture at Columbia University and I spoke about a female suicide bomber that want to, to clean the, her uh, owner and her parents actually want to solve the problem, a clean owner problem. And they said, okay, you will be a shahida. You'll become a female suicide bomber. And, uh, and it was a great solution for the whole family. But one woman, American woman, asked me, Nina, it's very interesting. Uh, she asked me, but why she didn't buy a ticket and fly to London? And this is the whole thing. They do not understand that we are speaking here about obsession. Like a duda, a worm that dig inside the mind. The same uh, psychological process that we see with drug addicts that want to find the next fix. The same process. And we're speaking about alternative reality. If if you spoke then about uh, the uh, September 11 terrorist attack, take Muhammad Atta. He was, he has a problem with sexuality. When he, uh, he spoke about that, that he cannot see even women, uh, pregnant women, a lot of them repress sexuality and the only woman that they can hug and touch before getting married is their mother. And the mother is a key here because the mother emotionally can be very influential. A few years ago, I interviewed a, a, a Kurdish terrorist from the PKK, a PKK that was on her way to the target to explode herself. And she said, if my mother told me to stop or just call me, I would change my mind. And I saw it in many, many times that the mother is a key here. But we see people with a, a very low self-esteem, marginalized. They think that if they cannot fulfill things here in this world, they will get it in the other world. And many times you saw also um, like... Uh, I remember a 15-year-old boy, a stutter boy, he was the first minor that uh, 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 carried out suicide bombing attack in Israel. And his sister was also a female suicide bomber, then she was divorcee. So she has a cause, if you can say, to erase uh, uh, the shame of the family. But uh, he said, you know, I was a very shy boy, and we see very introverted boy, and I didn't know anything about the girls, the banat, and I thought that in the next world, I'll have sex and beer, and I didn't have experience in these matters. So 72 virgins to the male virgins, what we're speaking about. And it's very, very tangible. Uh, we cannot say that we see her here mental illness. It's not mental illness. Sometimes we can see borderline personality with the suicide bombers. And for sure, we don't see that with the dispatchers of suicide bombers or terrorists. And the dispatchers, the senders, are the key to understand this phenomena, and we can we can have many levels of dispatchers, and I think that they are much much more important. But we see sometimes borderline personality, but not mentally ill. So not they can know what is good and not is worse, and they can choose the path that they can go. So. We are not speaking in the level of the individual as mentally ill, but we can take this obsession, and I suggested the terminology uh, that uh, I wrote about, shahada mania. And this is something that we see also with jihad tourism. 
that you see with ISIS. To Syria, I call it jihad tourism and shahada mania. The obsession to carry out is tishad, self-sacrifice. And this is something with a channel vision that cannot see and, and change the mind if somebody pushed the bottom. Very robotic behavior, very, and the, this duda warm the digging inside the mind. Also, the, pre the perceived life in shades of black and white. Even Sheikh Ahmed Yassin, the founder of the Hamas organization that I interviewed uh, with Reuven, Dr. Reuven Berko, my husband. He's from Ashkenazi origin, Holocaust survivor family, but he's, he's much better than me in Arabic. You know, I know the Iraqi Arabic, the Jewish Iraqi Arabic, which is like uh, Yiddish and German. It's, it's different. It's not the same. But so we came together and uh, we interviewed Sheikh Yassin. And uh, I asked him, is there any age that you'll send somebody to be a shaheed? Would you send your own child as a minor to blow up in a bus? And he said, and this is, remember that, because I'm not just from the academia, I'm practitioner for psychological warfare. Remember that my son, my son, and this is the key answer. They wouldn't send their own children to carry out terror attacks. They wouldn't. They send them, as a mother of Shay told me, they will send them to get the best education in America and Europe, and we will pay for it. So uh, Sheikh Yassin said, okay, you know what? At the age of 15, it will be okay. And I said, okay. But he said, but if... He looks like a man, Rajal, a man. We can send him before that. And, uh, but, and if something, and if he hurry enough or would send them before. So it's ridiculous. They send children, they abuse children. And even one woman told me they used and abused me. It's a way to solve problems. And now when we are getting to the social media, which become a tool for terror, for terror. And it's so dangerous because they want to have a short film in TikTok or to put their uh, poster on the wall and I'm going to show that I'm a man. And all this perception of manhood is is so twisted, it's so different. They look at the men in the West like, you know, very, uh, very um, feminine. They're not the real men. And they also cannot suppress violence. They, they, uh, they use violence as a tool. They compete. And you see the organization in groups of terror that become like a fun to rape and kill with, uh, uh, with impunity. To rape and kill with impunity. What is Daesh? What is ISIS? Same what they did. So this kind of Islamism and many, uh, you know, turn from Christianity to Islam to join Daesh. And you see also in Gaza a lot that convert to Shia, we see that. And uh, I, I, I must say, also from the perspective of a former Knesset member that dealt with uh, counterterrorism led legislation, that there is something that we need to, to do. If you have jihad, jihad tourism, and you see girls or boys that living their country, living like uh, in New York just to join ISIS in, in Syria or elsewhere, or El Shabaab or elsewhere, don't let them come back to your own state. Protect your own citizen. Don't import this radical perception and mindset and this duda and illness because you say human rights, 
human rights and they don't have any other citizenship. So we cannot take it from them. I think that human life much more important than human rights. And we need, we, need, we have the obligation to protect our own people from terrorism. And terrorism, and you know, I just, the, the last uh, sentence then, my book, The Smarter Bomb, about women and children as suicide bombers, I finished this book with a woman that board on a plane with explosive tampons. Who can stop her? You can have so many tools to do that. And you see right now that the technology is so advanced, science and technology and terrorists and Islamists take this technology to harm our life take this technology to harm our life and use the, the social media and the platform to do good, to, 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 to improve our life in the world. And they do it just to harm all of us. So we need to protect ourselves, human, human life before human rights. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it, it's that uh, Dr. Berk, we're just going to take, before we come to you, because we're all going to take a deep breath, we, we actually have the uh, uh, Tzachia Negbi, uh, Attorney Tzachia Negbi, who's the head of our National Security Council, is here, and the security, National Security Advisor of the Prime Minister, uh, who's come in. Welcome, Tzachia. I'm going to introduce him. If, stay here. Don't move. No, no, stay here. Stay here, because Tzachia will speak from there, and we'll continue our discussion, but he came a little bit early. This is one of the first times I've seen an Israeli statesman come early to... <laughs> but, this is, but this is Saki. He's always been on time since I've known him in the Knesset. So I'm going to introduce you. One second. This is... Yeah. That was good. This is actually a, a very special opportunity. I've had the, the great honor of knowing... Um, uh, Director Tzachia Negbi, member of Knesset, um, and one of the most experienced ministers in the history of Israeli politics, frankly, uh, for many, many years since I myself was a reporter many, many years ago for, for uh, Israel's English News Service. And at that time, um, uh, Director Tzachia Negbi, member of Knesset, Tzachia Negbi was the head of the Foreign Affairs Defense Committee of the Knesset, and I had the opportunity to interview him many, many times. I don't think there's any minister uh, in Israeli politics today has had so many different roles as minister, which I think prepares um, uh, Member Knesset Anegbi perfectly uh, to be head of the National Security Council. He, let me just say, his biography is, is fascinating. Also, um, uh, Director Anegbi, Member of Knesset Anegbi, was born to a Yemenite Jewish, Moroccan Jewish, and Turkish Jewish um, uh, parentage, and as well as uh, having Polish Jewish descent, and his mom is very well known, Gila Cohen, one of the great uh, leaders and, and figures in Israeli politics. Uh, and um, uh, Tzachi has been the Minister of Health, he's been the Minister of Justice, Minister of the Environment, Minister of Transportation, Internal Security, uh, Minister of Regional Cooperation, of Communications, Agriculture, and then also uh, in very sensitive positions in charge of uh, Israel's uh, 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 intelligence ministry, and, and having very, very sensitive uh, responsibilities as a, as a minister in the prime minister's office. Uh, and uh, he will please come up, uh, Minister Anegbi, or Director Anegbi, and share with us your sense of where, what Israel's uh, security profile is at the current moment. Good day to you all, my friend Dan, my friend Gadi Eberkan, my friend Yechiel Leiter, good friend who we spend a lot in the Israeli Knesset, Anat Berko, Dr. Berko, 
distinguished guests. I'm pleased to, to one second, make sure. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to be here on this special occasion at the first conference of its kind organized by the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs. I commend the GCPA team and its leaders for their important work and for promoting crucial issues, such as the issues that you discuss here. The impressive turnout by our friends from other countries in our region and Africa provides us with hope that through this visit, we will be able to further advance the important perceptual changes that the region is undergoing. So I really wish you success and bless you, uh, welcome all to Israel. In the era of constant change in which we live, regional partnership are an important cornerstone in shaping the policies of Middle Eastern and African countries. We still have many challenges ahead of us and it seems that in recent years they are increasing. Continued destabilization by Iran and proxies, the threat of murderous terrorism, global environmental changes, and the effect of the climate on the region all pose challenges to the energy security, food security, and water security of many countries in our region. For all of us, these challenges point to the necessity to work together and take joint regional action. The effects of climate change are not limited by national borders and they dictate the need for us to act quickly. We must act together with our close neighbors, Jordan and Egypt, as well as with our friends in the Abraham Accords in Africa. Our goal is to create connections and increase cooperation in order to work towards a more prosperous and sustainable environment. Joint mobilization and the designated knowledge and tools to combat these existing challenges can ensure an environment where every child receives what so many of us take for granted, running water, food, proper shelter, quality education, and beyond that, hope and opportunities. This year, we mark three years since the historic Abraham Accords were signed. In this short period, we have come to a long way working together productively in many fields. The Abraham Accords are a prime example of and model for courageous partnership. I was privileged to be a member of the government that signed these accords that were initiated by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and then President Donald Trump. And this cooperation, while working to repel common threats, are also successfully identified opportunities for real positive change. We also extend our hands to other countries in the Middle East, Africa and around the world to come join us under Abraham's tent and together enjoy the fruits of this important process. A recent example of this, of this is Prosperity Green and Prosperity Blue projects. Jordan's willingness to supply Israel with green electricity together with Israel's intention to supply Jordan with this salinated water in cooperation with the United States and the United Arab Emirates is evidence or creative regional partnership that provides value for all partners involved. Today as the head of the National Security Council, we practically almost every day are involved in implementation of these projects and we make sure they're going to succeed and set an example for a future pro uh, projects. It is a win-win situation for both countries involved in the stability and for the stability of the entire region. Israel is a hub of knowledge that can be of service to many countries in the Middle East and Africa. Over the years, we have developed a great deal of expertise and many quality tools to make advancements in the fields of agriculture, innovation, and water and food technologies. This has enabled us to face many of the world's modern challenges Head on. We share this insight with partner countries through professional training, equipment, and the implementation of useful knowledge and tools. As I expect you will see in your visit, during your visit, Israeli expertise provides water 
and renewable energy, even in remote villages in Africa, helps improve health, makes deserts bloom, and can produce readily available substitutes for meat and dairy to help ensure adequate food security. In the not too distant past, Israel also suffered water shortages due to our dependence on limited freshwater reservoirs. Today, we have developed technologies and desalination capabilities that have dramatically changed our situation. In the field of energy, we improved energy security by promoting renewable energies and also gradually transitioned to the use of natural gas. This has led to a significant reduction in air pollution and a greener and safer environment. Distinguished guests, in addition to all the challenges and threats I have mentioned here, it is impossible not to refer to the largest and most significant threat, and that is the one posed by Iran and its terrorist proxies. The Iranian regime, which openly calls for the destruction of the State of Israel, views these regional connections formed between Israel and its partners as a negative development. They are committed to disrupt it. They will fail as long as we stand together with a clear and uncompromising unity. We are now entering the period of holidays, including Pesach, Passover, Ramadan, and Easter. In the holiday of Passover, which for us symbolizes spring and renewal, we celebrate the exodus of our people from slavery to freedom. I am hopeful that in the spirit of these holidays, we will be able to expand our cooperation and create different types of freedom. Nutritional freedom, energy freedom, and security freedom. By working together to fulfill this vision, we will ensure a better future for the generations to come. Thank you all. Thank you very much, uh, Minister, uh, Director Anegbi, uh, for your words. And these are busy days for him, no doubt. You want to turn to do it? I want to go back to you before I come to Dr. Barak. Yeah, I'm going to come to you and, and ask you how you've been uh, quite visionary in your security, in your security sense and vision for the last 10, 12 years. You've been writing a lot. Now, Namibia. If you do, if you do research on, uh, if you do research on Namibia, you don't find a lot of terrorism. Right in, in in Namibia, people sort of flee to Namibia from other countries in order to to live safely in a, in, a, in a city in in a country of refuge uh, since 1990. Certainly, right. Um, however, you are security. You're, you you have a, a security vision, and I'd like you to share that with us uh, up for Africa, and and picking up uh, what uh, uh, what Dr. Antonia said, uh, give us kind of a regional view or a continental view, if you will. Of, of the real threats uh, that, that the continent is facing and what we might do to, to approach them and to address them. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> thank you. I, do you mind if I go back and talk a little bit about the evolution of Israeli relationship with African states? Um, I'm not as young as I may look, but I can go back as far back as 1967, when I was um, a young officer in Fort Benning, Georgia, taking advanced infantry school, advanced infantry training. And <clears throat> there were Israeli officers there with me, and the Six-Day War started. They were recalled to Israel. They went, we, we were friends, we were friends, they went, um, after two weeks, they, went back, they came back. So it was a lot of fun. Eh? Yeah. It was um, an exciting moment for me because during that time, during the Six-Day War, the entire Ethiopian church, over 1,000 churches, eh, were open for service, for 24-hour service, and bells were ringing and prayers for Israel. 
that was historic, and that explains how the relationship between the Ethiopian Coptic Church, not only the Coptic Church, but entirely the Northern Ethiopia, how their, their relationship um, existed throughout history. That is 24 hours until they heard the news that Israel has been victorious. Then all the churches were closed back. That is the kind of relationship Ethiopians had, um, have uh, with Israel. It is not transactional. It is not diplomatic. It is natural. It is biblical. It's religious. It's spiritual. So it's everything. Whatever happens in the world, that relationship cannot be changed. If you walk on the streets of Addis or it's any, any street in, in Ethiopia and somebody hurts you or somebody does something wrong to you and you want to stop him and you just shout in the name of the God of Israel, stop, and he will stop. And if he doesn't stop, the crowd will, will, will really strange. We, we, what, they'll think that he's a strange person because he should stop. Would that work here in Jerusalem? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, I don't know, I think, but that was my age, that was, uh, I can't I get a, uh, way back. And sometimes later, I was an official in Ethiopia, I was a deputy foreign minister, and I was a um, relief and rehab commissioner during the 1983 crisis of drought, during Operation Moses. Huh? Um, so I had uh, connections with them. Um, uh, with many Jewish organizations. During all those time, beginning uh, the, uh, towards the end of the era of the emperor, there was a decision, a resolution by the African Union that every member should suspend relationship with Israel. While it was easier for many African states, it was difficult for Ethiopia. It was extremely difficult. And how do we sell this to the people that we are not going to have any more uh, formal relationship with Israel. It was a difficult relationship, but it had to be implemented because it was an African Union decision. And um, it fortunately, our, fortunately, our, the Israeli government understood and they said, it's okay, we understand your problem, but we can always do it in a different way. So that relationship continued in a very discreet way without hopefully uh, anybody else knowing it, uh, the world knowing it. It's, it continued. I went, came to Geneva one time, uh, sometime in the, 19, the end of the 70s, um, to have a meeting in a safe house with the director of African Affairs, uh, the Israeli Foreign Ministry. And we had to do it in a safe house because we were afraid that if others know about it, then it will reflect on its image in the African Union. So what I'm trying to say is the evolution that we have gone. It's Israel with the pariah set in, the, in those days. Eh? It was completely disconnected with Africa. But over the years, today now, great majority of Africans um, recognize Israel. They work very closely with Israel. So it's more the consciousness, the efforts of the Israeli, successive Israeli governments, and knowledge that really, really rich, brought us to this level. So it's, uh, now you call it Abraham, Abraham Accord, but I think there was this Abraham Accord in a very different way. You have been doing it and made it a success. Now we, have, we are in the next level, how we can strengthen that relationship. The, uh, it's a, a very great improvement, a great um, uh, um, success for Israelis. So I, I just remember these things, so I just wanted to share my experience. Um, I had an organization, at, uh, the, an institute, the Africa Institute for Strategic and Security Studies. Um, I founded this uh, uh, after my fellowship with the uh, um, Foundation for the Defense of Democracies, as you know. Um, I was the only African fellow there, and I saw the gap because when there was no knowledge, real knowledge about Africa, in most of the institutes in, in the United States, it's experiences, short-term experience, scholars who call themselves scholars, but they are scholars, who have short-term experiences in Africa who come up and tell us what uh, about Africa so, and what to write about Africa. So my idea was to have 
African scholars or even if Europeans or Americans or Israeli scholars who have stayed in Africa, who have experienced life in Africa and who have written about Africa, these kind of people together with African scholars who can write about Africa. So we focused on, um, on security, strategic and security studies, um, mainly because in the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies, I was working on terrorism and violent extremism. So we, the main focus was violent extremism um, um, and transnational crimes, human uh, trafficking, uh, migration, uh, well, arms trafficking, all these well, was the focus of our organization. And we do that and we have invited many African scholars and those experts on, who know Africa well and that's what we do now. Um, it was interrupted for two years because of the COVID so we the headquarter is in Namibia. Namibia is the most peaceful place in Africa, uh, the most beautiful place in Africa. It's a place to visit, for sure. Uh, the most democratic state in Africa. I'm not a Namibian, I'm an American, but I work in, I've been working in, in, uh, in Namibia as a United Nations official, and, and I decided to have this uh, office in, Africa, in, in Namibia. So do refer to our website and please, if you feel like writing, uh, we can publish your articles on our website. Um, on the issue of... Uh, Africa security uh, extremism. Extremism, yeah. Optimistic, pessimistic, what can be done? Very pessimistic, um, very pessimistic. Uh, I bumped into um, the... Um, uh, the the Shia, the in Africa, the, the Hezbollah in Africa. The article I wrote on Hezbollah in Africa. I bumped into this organization in in, in Nigeria while studying other extremism in in in, uh, in Africa, uh, and I bumped into this organization. It has um, exactly a duplicate of Hezbollah right in the center of Nigeria. And it had a vast number of militia. They have uniformed, they have armed uh, tanks, and not, no government official can enter that compound. They are protected. And I wondered why a government, an independent government, a large government, a democratic government like Nigeria would allow such kind of an organization, militia, to exist uh, in, in the heart of Nigeria. So I started digging, I went, I went even to Nigeria, and I, I wrote a big article, and it was a surprise for many, for many um, uh, Nigerians themselves. Uh, they were commenting, a lot of dirty comments on me, because he was a CIA agent, a Mossad agent, who just wants to uh, spoil the image of uh, Nigeria, but they eventually they found out it was true. And re very recently I heard that there was a, um, the army, the Nigerian army, raided the, the compound and uh, disbanded the. Uh, I don't know how, how successful they have been in disbanding the the organization, but uh, it was revealed eventually. So I did it not. I didn't relate it with the with Israel, but I was curious why uh, we should have such organization in the heart of Nigeria, while Nigeria has got a more serious problem of Boko Haram. Imagine having both a Sunni-inspired or terrorist organization and the Shia-inspired, Iran-inspired organization in Nigeria. It would completely complicate the situation in Nigeria. Uh, so I asked the government, why should you allow this? And they really heard us and they uh, have uh, uh, removed this, I think. They have done with it. Uh, done with it. But in Africa now, I, we do this study in Africa, violent extremism, extremism thrives more than it did a few years ago. It's, uh, people don't talk about it, but it used to operate Boko Haram and 11 um, Sunni-inspired organizations and two, in, two organizations Shia-inspired, uh, which operate both in, um, in, in Nigeria, leftovers, and in the in DRC. And 
over 10 organizations operating along the Sahel. It's a lot of destruction because people don't hear it. You hear about it. But a lot of people are dying. A lot of uh, governments are being destabilized and a lot of destructions are happening in Africa. Uh, there is three quarters of Africa in some kind of conflicts, mostly uh, that comes through the, this kind of extremist organizations. So in security-wise, Africa is moving backwards. In every aspect, Africa is moving backwards. Um, some might tell you the narrative, the government narrative, or a narrative that has got a, an agenda, but the truth is there is a lot, a lot, a lot of problems in, in Africa. Read my article, The Wahhabi Invasion of Africa, uh, it's a big article of 25 pages. You find it somewhere, but it's, it, it is happening. It's a lot of uh, problems in Africa. So that's what I can say. So we can uh, get into the details if necessary, but that's Thank what I want to say. Yeah? Thank you very much, Stuart. That's terrific. Thank you. Thank you. Now, now we move maybe to Dr. Barak to perhaps one of the more complex situations. I remember, uh, by the way, in 2010, um, going with a small delegation uh, to Turkey to speak with then Foreign Minister Dautulu uh, because of the crisis at that time on the, if you remember, the Mevi Marmara uh, ship that was on the way to Gaza, to Hamas, uh, and there was this confrontation. And, and I realized at that moment that the Kemalist uh, Turkey that, that we learned in university and in high school, and that something had really changed. Now, it had changed well before 2010. It changed uh, some years earlier. Help us understand uh, the Turkey of today. In, on the one hand, Istanbul has become a home to, to Hamas, a, a comfortable home for Hamas. The government has not uh, designated Hamas as a terror organization. It's welcomed Hamas openly without uh, any, making any excuses. On the other hand, uh, Turkey, as Professor Bernard Lewis uh, has said for so many years and written so many books, that Turkey was the great hope. Uh, of, uh, of for the region in terms of mixing democracy, Muslim majority country, democracy, uh, and 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 very good close friendship between Israeli security certainly and and uh, and Turkish uh, uh, security echelons, and so we have a very complicated situation in Turkey. Help us understand where you are today in terms of security, exporting, importing security, and and, and threats and so on. It's a very complicated issue, and it, it's lunchtime, so. Uh, <laughs> but it's before lunch. Okay. Uh, I don't know how to conclude. Yes, it was hope because Turkey is the first modern state actually in the Middle East and it had a secular character. And the secularism, you know, was extremely compatible with the Turkish, you know, society and culture. Then Mustafa Kemal transformed uh, the, the, the Turkish culture, culture and the Turkish society into modern citizenship with integration to the Western security architecture and close relations with, the, with the Israel after 1948. Um, which means that the identity of the state was quite clear. It was pro-Western, it was pro-secular, but I'm afraid I cannot say that it was a full-fledged democracy because you know the army's tutelage was like a monitoring mechanism over politics and the army was functioning as a mechanism to limit the political parties, to marginalize the, the political system. Um, and the national security definition was the main instrument in the hands of the army. By that I mean army was using national security to, 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 to uh, demarcate the framework of legitimacy in the, in, the, in the political system. Some political parties were legitimate, some political parties were not legitimate. For example, Islamist parties were not legitimate parties, according to national security conception of the military. Or Kurdish secessionist parties were not regarded as legitimate parties. Uh, they were closed down, and this was a very fundamental principle of army. They were the guardian of national uh, nation state and secularism. But when AK Party came to power, Erdogan came to power, uh, you know, this has dramatically changed because Erdogan declared himself as the champion of democracy, you know, after the Cold War ended, you know, democracy, you know, was a very popular term and the, 
many circles in Turkey, including conservatives, liberals, including businessmen, supported Erdogan just because they viewed Erdogan as the champion of democracy. They, they expected Erdogan to integrate Turkey into the Western, you know, global economic world and, you know, the, the Western, you know, organizations such as European Union, anyway. But this story ended in a very tragic way because uh, Erdogan undermined the autonomy and power of the military, which was the guardian of secularism, and uh, democratic institutions could not be replacement of the army. We were expecting a Supreme Court or independent judiciary or independent media to be replacement of the army, to be tutelary on the, on the political system, but all of these bureaucratic institutions and all of these democratic institutions has been dominated by, by Erdogan. Still he is dominating all these institutions. And this also changed the identity of the state. The state's identity was secular before Erdogan because you know, the army was on power, in control. Army was secular and state's identity was secular. Now, state is represented by Erdogan and Erdogan is not a secular guy. He's a conservative guy. But I should note that when Davutoglu was prime minister, when Davutoglu was formulating the foreign policy, the Islamist character of Turkish foreign policy was very apparent because Davutoglu is a university professor and he is a philosopher talking about Islamist foreign policy or some civilizational foreign policy things. But Erdogan is not like Davutoglu. Erdogan is not a very sophisticated, is not a very academic guy. He is a mercantile, pragmatic guy. So, when a friction happened between Erdogan and Davutoglu, uh, Erdogan fired him. He established a, another political party which is not very popular. Erdogan is still popular. And Erdogan is looking for having, you know, pragmatic and rational relations with Egypt, with Israel, with Saudi Arabia. Because Erdogan's identity is not, is, yeah, he is a conservative guy, he is a Muslim guy, he is a very, you know, you know, uh, very well known Islamist figure, but he has also another identity. He is a very pragmatic guy. You know, so if it serves Erdogan's survival in the domestic politics, he can have very close relations with Israel. No question. If Erdogan inflames Islamism or nationalism, this means that Islamism and nationalism helps him to survive in domestic politics. The formulation is quite clear, clear in, the, in the mind of Erdogan. So, there is a difference between Islamism in Turkey. Davutoglu was representing idealist, academic, or philosophical Islamism in Turkey. So, he is very romantic. He is a decent guy, by the way, but I'm, I'm afraid of romantic ideas. So, it's not, you know, undefinable. It, it, uh, you, cannot, you cannot expect where, where rom romantic guys stop. But you can always know that pragmatic guys can stop somewhere. Anyway, Davutol is gone, and we have Erdogan. Erdogan's Islamism is very result-oriented, is very pragmatic, is very cost-benefit-based Islamism. Uh, that's all. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yechiel, do we have time, five minutes uh, for questions? Or five minutes do we have? Uh, do we have yes, questions, please? I have interviewed Kurdish leaders, Baluchis, Ahvazi, and they're all dying, crying for Israel to help them. Why Israel is not taking this golden opportunity to further destabilize Iran? Thank you. 
thank you for your question. Israel, it's not the problem, just the problem of Israel, you know. I can tell you when my father fled from Iraq as refugee, he spent two years in Iran. He was in the underground that smuggled Jews from Iraq through Iran that gave him and other Jews a shelter on the way to Israel. So it was totally different. But now we see Iran acting not just in the Middle East, in Europe. In Europe, the drones, the, 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 the weapon, and the collaboration with Russia. And all of this without the nuclear umbrella. And still, America is begging for an agreement with Iran. So it's, it's, it's something ridiculous in my point of view. And uh, there is another thing when we are speaking about mindset. The West do not know how to negotiate with Arabs, with Iranian, with Turks. They, they need to just to buy a rug somewhere and to understand how to negotiate when you start with a very high price and you lower it to the ground. And, uh, you know, it's very funny because uh, when we built our house, um, I made the negotiation with the workers, with the Arab workers, and my husband, who speaks fluent Arabic, said, you know, they look at me and they said, why you give this Iraqi to deal with me? Why? And it saves a lot of money. So... <laughs> This is something that they don't understand. Look, the involvement of Russia in Ukraine is amazing. And nobody stop it. So Israel needs to stop it. We have Russia and the Iranian on our border. And believe me, we do a lot to stop them. Much more than everybody, anybody else. And I think that uh, part of the uh, uh, Abraham Accord is that they saw that Israel is the only, only power, only state that dealt with the Iranian effectively. But now, America needs to lead the, take the, the leadership, and not by agreement. The agreement wouldn't uh, solve anything. Yeah, well, I'm just going to, ladies oh, first, we're going to have... Just yeah, a second. Yeah. Uh, okay, quickly. Yeah, quickly. Uh, very quickly. First of all, I hear your call, and I think that you're totally right. And we should do more. And uh, because, as Amin said as well, yeah. the solution is regime change. That is the solution. The easiest one. The, the cheapest one. The right one. The good one for the people of Iran. Not only the Baluchis and the Azeris and the, the rest of the Kurds and all of them. Also for the Iranians, uh, people of Iran. That is the solution. By the way, Mahsa Amini was, was a Kurd. Uh, she became so famous as, uh, as a symbol of this uh, direction. Having said that, I hear, I hear this call not only from you, I hear this call from many, from many of my Iranian friends who are saying the same thing. And I hope that what we see is not what is actually happening and much more is happening. Because we need to be there. And, uh, it's, it's unbelievable. Look. Uh, I was in, uh, in L.A. a uh, couple of weeks ago the, uh, on Wilshire Boulevard. The entire, the entire boulevard was covered with signs, women, freedom, uh, life, right? That uh, just was amazing. So the people understand that this, something is happening, and we need to take advantage of that. And the time is now, because, before it's too late, because they are right, just because they understand it. As Amin said, just because they understand it, they rush up towards having the capability to produce the nuclear weapon. They understand that the uh, terrain is shaking. And uh, that's the time when we, we, not only Israel, Israel amongst other Western countries, lead, led by the United States, has to do something about it. That's the time. Please, please. Yeah, that will come. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Um, my name is Toby Love. I'm a Nigerian Israeli advocate for Israel African relations. And my question to the panel um, a subject that I was expecting to be addressed more was the importance and maybe mobilization through education of the youth and the younger generation. Because when we speak of extremist ideologies, radical groups, even interconnectedness, in my opinion, the youths are insufficiently engaged and are either going to be opposed to these movements or be recruited into them, or even worse, be bystanders. If you could relate to this, I would appreciate. And also if you can, I can take advantage of this platform and address the wider audience here. This has been an amazing day so forth, and I'm looking forward to the second part of it. But if we're speaking about shifting alliances, then we can also speak about shifting ideologies. And I'm very happy to say that all of the regions, all of the countries seated here in this room today are part of the highest fertility rates in the world. And so, as humble as we are, we have a lot of work to do if we want to address a better relationship and better interconnectedness between everyone. But also, it is crucial that the younger generations and the youth are involved in these dialogues. And I invite anyone who's struggling in that aspect to reach out to me, because that's what we do. Thank you, and I'd really love to hear your answers. Um, this is a very important point that you've made about youth. You know, we always talk about that the time bomb is Iran becoming a nuclear country and a nuclear bomb country. We talk about the Russian threats, uh, about using the nuclear bomb. We never talk about the time bomb being youth and children. In France itself, there are thousands of children who um, seek political, their families seek political refugee to France. Yet when it comes to school time, their parents refuse to send them to these schools and call these schools schools that adopt infidels and atheists. So these children end up at home getting education from Hamas and Hezbollah funded television channels. These are the time bombs. These are children who will go to the streets and shoot innocent people. So I think no one is addressing even the laws and regulations in these countries about how to deal with the future in 10 years, who these children will become. Thank you. Yeah. One of the things that we discussed this is with John from Liberia is to create uh, innovation, young leadership innovation uh, initiatives around various technologies and really begin to raise the next generation together with the United States and together with Israel to raise the next generation of young women and men who really will be innovators across all of the categories we're talking about and to formalize those relationships to create a counter narrative that way through innovation and leadership. So that's one of the things that comes out of our three day uh, meeting. Abdullah, please. Uh, hello, thank you very much. I want to, Abdullah Hamdinu from Mauritania, from Mohit Center for development and peace issues. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, the Jerusalem uh, Peace uh, Center. Center, President uh, Dan Baker and Aviram and all the team to give me the opportunity to be here with you today with all the bright spirit here. And it's a great opportunity for me. I have two questions. The first one is for President Dan. Regarding the Abraham Accords, do you think this accord can have in a long term, a positive impact on the normalization, not only between Arab states and Israel, but also between Arab people and Israel, and bring peace to the entire region between all Abraham sons to live together in, this, in peace in, on this holy, holy and wonderful land. This is my first question. And the second one to Mr. Amin. Do you think that there is a chance to see a collapse in the middle term to the Mullah regime in Iran, and the pressure coming from interior uprisings and external sanctions to lower tensions in the region coming from that regime and his allies. Thank you very much. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, is there any possibility that regime collapses? Uh, yeah, of course. I mean, regimes like Islamic Republic, uh, they appear very strong if you look at them from without. But the collapse happens very quickly. Just, I mean, imagine 1985 and look at Soviet Union. I mean, many experts would say that, yeah, that's a regime has a lot of problem, but it's not going to collapse soon. So that's a possibility for regime. I mean, regime has lost all of its legitimacy. I mean, no legitimacy whatsoever. And regimes know that. It needs to actually suppress people on a daily basis. So once you do that, it means that you have lost all of your authority. I mean, re regimes cannot survive without authority. I mean, you can have all power, but it doesn't chance for authority. So Islamic Republic has lost its legitimacy, it has lost its, its authority, and um, it's not able to deliver to people. I mean, um, millions of Iranians just fall be, uh, below the poverty line now just because of the regimes, and it's not able to solve problems. So there are some dictatorships in the re region but they at least developing their country. And I mean, look, China. Yeah, of course, it's dictatorship, but uh, it's, it's advancing in the country. But uh, Islamic Republic is dictatorship, but it turns people's life into like disaster. So I don't see any future for, it's a matter of time. It's not, uh, it's not that whether Islamic Republic will collapse or not. It's when he's going to collapse, and the question is that is uh, the West, uh, the United States, is ready for that or not. But um, I will advocate that uh, uh, if you one of this regime collapses, uh, 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 maximum support for Iranian people. That's the solution. Um, well, Trump actually did uh, maximum pressure. So that, that's a one pillar of that. Another pillar is... Uh, maximum support for Iranian people. I think that would be solutions uh, to to region. Uh, it's good for Iranian people, good for region, good for Israel, and good for United States. Yeah, uh, Abdali, I'll answer your question right after. I want to just get. I promised uh, uh, get come come quickly. Have your question, and we'll have a question, and we'll go eat. We have a great lunch, so thank you for the patience. Well, the lunch. The and lunch is getting cold, Dan. Yeah. yeah I know. <laughs> Very quick. Uh, my question is to Dan and the general. I believe uh, we have addressed the system after the flea, you know, uh, the, the disease have uh, spread all over. What we need to understand is how we have failed to understand U.S. foreign policy in terms of containing uh, the containment of Iran since uh, 79. The present time, the U.S. have persisted in, um, you know, uh, uh, addressing failure with another failure since that time. Now, we need to develop a real understanding. And if we're going to contain Iran, we need also to, um, uh, you know, aid the Iranian people to evolve and take down this regime. But, you know, regime change from outside, it's not going to be the right approach. What we need to do is convince the United States to start with, is to abandon its yesterday's foreign policy toward this region and enter a real partnership and not dictating terms. And we have seen what the result of uh, uh, 2003 invasion of Iraq. It was disastrous. It was, uh, you know, accepted by a lot of parties in the region, but at the end, we all paid for it. And uh, to Dan, the first uh, suicide attack was in 1983 uh, in the barracks of the Marines and not the uh, uh, 1911. Oh, yeah. uh, the, no, no, I didn't the, say yeah. it was yeah. the first one. But I didn't it say was it was a very powerful. It is. It is. Okay, so uh, please... Can, can we address U.S. foreign policy? Yes, it's not a matter of time. You want to ask my question and then the last of both? 
I say in one word. Okay. So I agree with you completely. <laughs> yeah, and that's why. And by the way, that's why we're here, Abdullah. That's why we're here because the build trusted. We chose the words carefully. Trusted partnerships in a period of shifting alliances, and that's where Israel understands its role as an indigenous member, but a, a member together with you, with these nations, to build within the cultural intelligence sensitivity of these regions to build those partnerships. That's why. That's what this is different. This conference is different. The relationships will be different. So thank you. So being the last one between you and your lunch, I'll be very brief. Uh, my name is Gilad. I'm an ambassador in the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs. My question goes to Professor Antonia. Um, uh, under P President Bukhari, bilateral relationships were somehow bumpy. Now you have a new president, Tinubu. We say Mazel Tov. Uh, do you, can we expect that the relationship, bilateral relationship, will be improved under the new president? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the, I think the environment is uh, open now, uh, maybe more open. Uh, uh, the new pres the president-elect, I'm sure, is ready to work because we need those relationships more. We need the partnerships. You know, we have a number of issues caused by uh, the insurgency that has happened over the years. I believe that uh, the government will certainly be very open. That is my expectation. Thank you all. Please uh, no, join me you. in thanking our panelists for this great, lovely great panel. Great panels this morning. Riveting, and by the number of questions, obviously a lot more to talk about. So <clears throat> we're going to go up to lunch. It's two floors up, minus two in the elevator. Um, enjoy the lunch. Please be back here at a quarter to three promptly to start the afternoon sessions. In preparation for the afternoon sessions, we're screening a survey. Please participate in the survey, and this will enable us to fully integrate. It's up on the screen. Okay, take your cell phones and participate in the survey so we can fully integrate and involve all of you this afternoon in the panel that's going to be run by Emily. Uh, we're going to talk about that so shortly. Um, two flights up, a quarter to three. Survey, we'll see you soon. Enjoy lunch. Thank you.
Dan, if it's possible, just to, we have to get started. So if you want to just tell people to come in, please. Um, את יכולה בבקשה לבוא עם הבנות, עם מי שיש, אם תרצה, אני צריך עזרה. אם אפשר בבקשה Good afternoon. Uh, Dan. If I could have your attention, please. If I don't get your attention, I'm going to have to start singing. Then I'll get your attention. I might have to sing and dance. Uh, in strategizing at the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs, when we strategize in the evening hours after we spend the whole day thinking, Dan and I often talk about involving the American Jewish community in our activities. both in Africa and in the Gulf. And we are delighted to have with us today a representative, probably the representative, of the most important Jewish organization in the United States. William Daroff is the CEO of the Conference of Presidents of Major American Jewish Organizations. So for those who don't understand, It's an umbrella organization of all the major Jewish organizations in the United States, and he's the CEO of that umbrella organization. As Chief Executive Officer of the Conference of Presidents, William Daroff is the senior professional guiding the conference's agenda on behalf of 53 national member organizations that represent the wide mosaic of American Jewish life. Named by the Jerusalem Post as being among the 50 most influential Jews worldwide, Daroff steadfastly guides the leadership of American Jewry through its thorniest issues. He advocates for a secure Israel, for strengthening the U.S.-Israel relationship, and the protection and security of Jews worldwide. Daroff is an international leader fighting anti-Semitism in all forms, both domestic and abroad, and he is adjunct professor at George Washington University and a life member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Bill Daroff, please. Greetings. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to address this historic gathering. It is truly a testament to the impressive work of Dan Dyker and Yehiel Leiter 
and the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs that representatives of more than 20 countries are here. This is an essential collection of delegates and thinkers and one that I'm certain will lead to great results for Israel, for the Middle East, for the nations of Africa, and for the world. As we approach the quarter mark of the 21st century, we stand at the precipice of regional change. Looking back, our countries have been rocked by cataclysmic events that reshaped our expectations and altered the expected paths of our nations. The attacks of 9-11, the US invasion of Iraq, the growing threat of nuclear proliferation, the Arab Spring turning into the Arab winter, Yemen, Syria, and Libya consumed by a decade of civil war, the spread of ISIS throughout the Middle East and Africa. And as we've discussed this morning, we've also witnessed the Abraham Accords, a monumental achievement that melted away 70 years of frozen hostility and shattered a paradigm of regional diplomacy. In tandem with great efforts by the United States, Israel established diplomatic relationships with the UAE, Bahrain, Morocco, and Sudan. This diplomatic coup demonstrates that mutual goals and cooperation can bring about regional cooperation. The Abraham Accords bring about a level of stability and cooperation to the Middle East that has not been seen since the fall of the Ottoman Empire over a century ago. I was just in the UAE and Bahrain and witnessed firsthand how collaboration between Israel and the nations of the Gulf are helping to create a flourishing, prosperous, and promising future. We heard from the entrepreneurs who spoke about the new financial MOUs between governments and between Israeli and Emirati high-tech firms. We heard in Bahrain about the amazing cooperation between the US, Israeli, and Bahraini militaries that are providing an exponentially greater level of security and safety for the region. As a testament to the Accords, also bringing countries closer to America, I, was also, I also visited the UAE space program just days before their first astronaut participated in a NASA launch. The Abraham Accords provide a model for regional cooperation between the Middle East and Africa. In a time of shifting alliances and global instability, new relationships and partnerships will mutually benefit all involved and help us to prepare for the challenges we face in the future. Collaboration and friendship between Israel and countries in the Middle East and Africa is of the utmost importance to Jewish leaders in the United States. As you'll hear in the next panel, there's a long history of Israeli efforts to collaborate with and provide aid to the nations of Africa. From the earliest years of statehood, Israel's leaders were moved by compelling desire to share the knowledge gained from Israel's own development experience. David Ben-Gurion, Israel's first prime minister, believed that, quote, the principles of mutual assistance and equality should also constitute the basis for international relations between people and must be based on the solidarity of all human beings derived from fraternity and mutual assistance in every sphere of life, the economic, the social, and the scientific, unquote. Israeli Prime Minister Gorda Meir, one of Israel's great strategic thinkers, saw enormous potential in these relationships and helped to found Mashav, Israel's Agency for International Development Cooperation, in 1957. As African nations achieved independence not long after Israel, after Europe's decolonization, these new nations were experiencing the same challenges Israel was facing. Mashav continues to this day to share the know-how and technologies that provided the basis for Israel's own rapid development and other developing countries. As the United States and global organizations focus on environmental issues and water scarcity, the lessons Israel has learned and its partnerships with your countries and others have changed hundreds of thousands of lives. The innovations that stemmed from these partnerships are transforming the world. And certainly there is much that African nations can share with Israel, such that it will be a true win-win scenario for all involved. The Conference of Presidents of Major American Jewish Organizations, which is the umbrella organization for 53 national Jewish organizations, has long supported ties between the United States, Israel, African countries, and Jewish leaders. We've sent delegations for high-level meetings with governmental leaders, as well as on-the-ground education about the challenges and opportunities that each country faces. We embrace the opportunity to discuss how the American Jewish community can act as a bridge between African nations, Israel, and the United States. The American Jewish community is strongly committed to continuing the work of building robust and durable relationships as we appreciate the value of steadiness and security in a time when the ground seems to be constantly shifting beneath our feet. Beneath our feet. A Middle East and Africa bound by new partnerships and relationships 
strengthened by projects that promote mutual benefit, is a source of stability for the region and the world. We in the American Jewish community are ready to assist making this vision a reality and believe that it is in the best interest of the United States that these benefits bear fruit. The Middle East, after the normalization of relations brought on by the Abraham Accords, is starkly different from the region beforehand. We've seen new ground broken in every type of economic, environmental, diplomatic, and social field, with the hope that these advances benefit and spread throughout the world. We look to you to act as evangelists for this new vision in each of your home countries, just as I will go back to Washington, D.C. to spread this message to those who need to hear it. We have a chance at new friendships and a prosperous and stable future. Now is the time to make this future into reality, a reality that will lift up the trilateral relations between your countries, Israel, and the United States. Thank you again for the opportunity to address you. I look forward to engaging with you all today and throughout. Uh, please be in touch with me when you come to Washington. I'd love to engage and interact with you. I look forward to a bright and collaborative future for us all as we look forward to the months and years ahead. Thank you again. I've been to the hinterland of Nigeria and the highlands of Ethiopia, and one of the names that I hear repeatedly is the Tony Blair Institute, the great work they do in the African continent and elsewhere. We're privileged uh, to have with us today the head of the uh, Tony Blair Institute, um, Grant Merrick of the United Kingdom. He's the head of agriculture and food for the uh, Tony Blair Institute for Global Change, who's agreed to moderate the next session on food and water security. Uh, he'll be joined by our own Daniel Abraham, the executive director of Volcani International Partnerships, an NGO dedicated to tackling global food insecurity with Israeli agricultural expertise. Daniel Abraham started her career in Israel as a senior policy advisor in Mashav, which you just heard from Bill, Israel's Agency for International Development Cooperation of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Previously, she worked for the Strategy and International Directorate of the UK Home Office. Daniel and Grant, please come on up, take chair. Uh, we'll be joined by uh, Phoebe Gross Kandaya of Malawi, uh, of Karis Invest and Consult. Phoebe is a co founder of. Uh, a Moshav-trained eco-agribusiness, -agri social enterprise that harnesses Israeli agricultural expertise for Malawian youth. As an agro-entrepreneurship ambassador, she uses her renewable energy engineering skills in producing import substitute crops using smart farming techniques and promoting food security in rural Malawian areas. Kofi Bentil from Ghana. Uh, Kofi is a lawyer, a business strategy lecturer, and consultant. He has lectured at Asha... Asheshi, Asheshi University and the University of Ghana Business School. In 2009, he was inducted into the Africa Leadership Network, part of the Aspen Institute's Global Leadership Network. He is also an activist and has been involved in many good governance and social causes. Now for a little bit of a special surprise. Uh, tomorrow, those of you who will be joining us on our field trip will go to the, the Negev, uh, and the mayor of the Ramada Negev Regional Council is with us, Iran Doron. Iran works... Okay. Iran works vigor vigorously to build pluralistic and tolerant communities that reflect the diversity of Israeli society in the heart of the Israeli Negev, strengthening the connection to the physical and human environment and promoting and establishing multi-generational, sustainable communities that maintain the quality of community life. Iran holds a bachelor's degree in geomorphology. Did I say that right? Geomorphology? Okay. And a master's degree in environmental studies, both from Ben-Gurion University of the Negev. Grant, it's all yours. Thank you and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the, the session this afternoon is really looking at food and agriculture through the lens of government policy with a specific focus on innovation. And if we talk about the state globally of food production, we 
face a difficult situation, the dual challenges of COVID and the Ukraine war have exposed the fragility of our food systems. That fragility has existed and was first evidenced back in 2009. Grant, excuse me, I completely forgot. Richard Morrow, the researcher of Brenthurst Foundation in South Africa. Richard focuses on public sector reform and policy strategy. He has worked across 10 countries in Africa, served on two presidential advisory teams, and has designed investment strategies for numerous investment promotion agencies on the continent. Richard, please join the panel. My, my, my apologies, my serious apologies. The challenges of our food systems have resulted in new relationships being formed between suppliers. They have resulted in disrupted supply chains, uh, a working capital crisis for farmers all around the world based on increasing, rapidly increasing input costs. And in the context of all of that, we equally face the challenge of climate change which is being felt on a day-to-day -day basis, but nevertheless is requiring that we adapt. Fundamentally, the question that the panel faces today is how do we adapt? What role does innovation play? And what can governments do in, at a policy level in order to support innovation to create that adaptive capacity? Danielle. Israel is perhaps the prime example of adaptation and innovation in agriculture. Its conditions are tough, its soils are tough, and against all odds, it has become a global leader in agriculture, in agricultural-based technologies, and its innovations have spurred agricultural development in many countries particularly in Africa. I've worked with many Israeli uh, technology suppliers over the years myself. The question I have for you, what role did government have to play in this innovative approach? And specifically, what policies have assisted in achieving the results that Israel has? Thanks, Grant. Is this on? Yeah, great. Okay, so this is one of my favorite questions uh, you'll hear, but I'd like to start by just seeing a a uh, show of hands. I know we've got a difficult spot right after lunch when everyone's uh, maybe tired and eaten too much. So I just wanted to ask and see in the audience, how many of you have visited Israel before? Okay, so the majority of you haven't. That's excellent. So the guys that you have visited, I want you to back me up and grant up when we tell the others who have yet to see our agriculture coming out of the desert that Israel is a crazy place to do agriculture, okay? It makes no sense, really. When we say it's a miracle, it's really not far short. It's a tiny country, which means we don't have a lot of land. It's two-thirds desert. There's a shortage of water resources, and geographically, we've been, we normally say we're situated in a difficult neighborhood, which means our export markets are just that much further afield. So how on earth did Israel not only realize food security, but position agriculture as a key driver of economic growth, and then emerge, as Grant said, as this global leader in agriculture and water? And we often used to get asked that question all the time, like, this makes no sense. How did you do it? Okay, and so I actually approached Grant's organization, the Tony Blair Institute, and AGRA, the Alliance for a Green Revolution Africa. And I said to them, the answers people are giving, it's because of the kibbutz. Do you know what the kibbutz is? Yes? The kibbutz is, you know, the cooperative socialist slash nearly communist model where sometimes they even shared their underwear and not just their farming equipment. Um, and sometimes they said, oh, it's because of drip irrigation, that's why I succeeded. And I said, actually, I don't think that's the answer. And so together, um, we actually wrote a case study. Uh, the Honorable Tony Blair actually wrote the foreword. It's titled, How Israel Became a World Leader in Agriculture and Water and Insights for Nations Today. And I can tell you that the foundation of the key driver from Israel was the government policy and approach. There are a lot of policies that Israel implemented, but the one I wanted to highlight for you today, could you hold my microphone? Thank you. 
It's something we call the golden triangle, okay? It's this. This is why you need my microphone. This is one of the key secrets to Israel's agricultural success. What the government of Israel did is it invested very heavily in Israel's agricultural innovation ecosystem, the triangle, okay? At the top, this point bit here, is the research and development. Israel poured money into the development of the scientists and enabled them to do research. Over here in the bottom right-hand corner is the extension service for those who are not in the ag field, extension of the agronomists. If you tomorrow pick up and say, I want to become a chicken farmer, you've no idea about chickens, right? You go to your extension officer. They're the ones that teach you everything you need to know about chickens. Okay, so the extension service. Israel poured money into the establishment of a brilliant extension service. And over here is the private sector, which is critical, as we know, because agriculture must be treated as a business. We're not just growing for food security to eat. We're growing because agriculture is a business. Now, what is in the middle of this triangle, and this is the most important part, is the farmer. I feel so often we're talking about food security, but most overlooked are sometimes the farmers. So you've got the... R&D, extension, and the private sector, and the farmer is in the middle. Now, what you can't see... Thank you very much. Oh, you can? Yeah. <laughs> now, what you can't see on that triangle, which is critical, and I don't know how much the government is responsible, Grant, is the fact that there is no hierarchy here in Israel. Most of you haven't visited, and you've only been here a few days. But Israelis have no respect for authority whatsoever. This is why we call our prime minister... <laughs> This is why we call our prime minister by his nickname. This is why we're not afraid to share our ideas. And what that means, which is not very common in many countries, definitely across Africa, and I'm not as familiar with the Gulf, is that this farmer in the middle has no qualms whatsoever about picking up the telephone and calling the top professor in the country and saying, listen, Yoram, I have an issue with my tomato. Can you come and check it out? And he will say yes. Because the actors in this golden triangle are all interacting and the government has a critical role to play in enabling that. And I don't want to keep talking because I know there's other panelists, but there's a short story I can give. But, yeah? All right, I want to make this tangible for you, okay? Because sometimes it's very theoretical and it feels like a geometry class because we're talking triangles. Okay. In the north of Israel, there was a group of farmers who identified an opportunity in the basil market. You all know what basil is? On the pizza... Basilicum Yoffi. The issue was for these farmers is that the basil market in Europe, they had to grow it in the winter and it was too cold in the north of Israel. So they went to the innovation ecosystem, this triangle, okay? And they said to the scientists, to the extension officers, this is what we want to do. Can you help us? What we need to do is to raise the temperature in our growing environment in the basil, but without using energy because then it's too expensive. Can you come up with a solution? So the innovation ecosystem went into overdrive and they start brainstorming with the farmers. And they came up with a crazy idea, which is to fill plastic polythene bags with water. And they laid them down literally between the rows of the crops. And during the day, the water absorbed the heat from the sun. And so when the temperature dropped at night, it started emitting the heat, raising the temperature in the environment. It wasn't quite enough, so they decided to build a fence with the uh, plastic polythene bags. And they got excited. They called the farmers. Listen, you guys, we found the solution. You have to come and check it out. And they're like, are you crazy? That would never work. So in true Israeli innovation style, they invited the farmers in the middle of the night <laughs> to come and see the uh, basil growing. They gave them infrared goggles so they could see the temperature. And lo and behold, these plastic walls of water <laughs> was raising the temperature. And now we have a thriving basil market in the north of Israel. And I think this is just one of many examples we've got that actually demonstrate the role the government played in enabling the innovation ecosystem and how critically it works with an entrepreneurial mindset and engaging the farmer. Thanks. Thank you, Danielle. Uh, Phoebe, you, you have a personal mission to uplift smallholder farmers in Malawi. And... A key part of that is bringing sustainable technologies to, 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 to play. Do you enjoy the same level of support that Danielle has just described from government? And if not, where do you see opportunities for governments in Africa to learn from the Israeli model? Thank you. 
thank you so much. As I have already been introduced, I'm a farmer. By profession, I'm an engineer. I did electrical engineering, but I'm applying the skills into farming. And first of all, let me thank the organizers of the event for giving me such a great opportunity. Thank you so much, JCPA. And then let me also extend my gratitude to my chef. I'm a co-owner of Garissi Invest and Concert. Actually, we were supported with a grant by them, and they also gave us expertise. So we are so grateful because that was the genesis of the journey. Let me also extend my gratitude to Volcani, Internet, Volcani International Institute for supporting us with expertise. Um, okay, first of all, I'm a youth image model for youth employment in agribusiness. So as such, there is a very big platform for transformation in the agriculture sector. And apart from that, we are using the Israeli technology to train local farmers surrounding the community. There's always been a gap between the elite and farmers in the rural areas. And yet, the people who can also transform Malawi's economy are those smallholder farmers. So when we saw a gap there, we started now using Israeli expertise and technologies to train the farmers in the rural areas to increase their productivity and in order to take farming as a viable business. And I can say here that, yes, we are working with the government of Malawi, but it has not been there for us because even the trainings we are offering the farmers, we use our own resources in order to go and train the farmers because we won't change. We can't keep on talking about food and water insecurity, and yet we are just folding our hands. No. So we have begun. And the government is not yet supporting us. It's actually the government of Israel which is coming in. And we are trying now to involve the government for the project to be scaled up. Because maybe, if you don't know, we also experienced cyclone Fleddy. And out of 28, villages, 28 districts in Malawi, 12 have been affected, meaning that these 12 districts will be food insecure. And it needs the government to support those smallholder farmers in order to make sure that there is food security. But the government is not doing enough to support people or initiatives which can lead to food and water security. And what I think the government can do is, first of all, to support innovations with high impact in food and water security. And this can be done by maybe building excellent centers, centers for excellence and innovation hubs, where all these innovations can be supported technically and financially in order to be adapted and implemented. That's the first thing. And the second thing can be actually attaching these innovations to sectors in agriculture. There, there are different innovations, but if the government can take specifically those innovations with high impact in food and water security, and make sure that these, these innovations are integrated into the agricultural sector. It means food insecurity will not be an issue. Phoebe, um, many governments in Africa see agriculture as the way to create employment for our very broad-based population. Are you finding interest from the youth in engaging with agriculture? Yes, actually, I'm, I'm so passionate about this. As I told you that I, I, I left the engineering role and ventured into farming. So farming is an easy way. Because in Malawi, we have plenty of resources. For example, we have 13 livers and three lakes with fresh water. And those waters are underutilized. 
So when, when I'm training the youth in agriculture, they have land, they have water. So they have their capital there because when we talk of mechanization, that's the issue for another day because we are not yet there. <laughs> we, we, are, we are going there and hope, hopefully we'll be there. But the, the youth for a start can start with them being the, the capital now. They can be doing the actual work on the farm. And at times we do give them seeds and we connect them to organizations that can assist them in the same. And that's why we are conducting webinars with Volcani Institute in order to improve the, 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 in order to change the mindset of the youth in the way they perceive agriculture. The youth need to perceive agriculture as an important business, a vital business, and agriculture actually pays. So if, if we are talking about food, everyone here was there eating. We can't live without food. So it's a viable business. It doesn't like markets. And it's important for the youth to venture into agribusiness. Thank you, Fabi. Um, if I can... <laughs> Kofi, if I could move to you. You have the difficult role of making small businesses profitable. You support entrepreneurs. You advise them. My question is really one of what can governments do at a policy level to try and level the playing field for entrepreneurs that are involved in the SME sector? Well, um, we have a view that what's more important for government to do is to get out of the way. <laughs> and, and it's not just ideology, because um, again, like she said, we have a lot of youth in Ghana, and the opportunity is there for you to see, literally. I mean, we are opposite Israel. So if you take Ghana, for instance, Ghana has one of the largest man-made lakes in the world, the Volta Lake. And it literally flows from the north through Ghana and goes into the sea in the south with very good fresh water. And we are cut across by rivers. Every place in Ghana is arable land. You can grow crops on the highest mountain in Ghana. 12 months a year, you can farm every day. I told somebody sometime, if you live in a world house, you can go naked for the whole year in Ghana. The weather is that good. You know, and so the, the, you, you, you don't understand why. And even with all the agriculture that goes on in Ghana, only 30% of arable land has been farmed in Ghana. If you go to the northern parts of Ghana, which is about half of Ghana, it's amazingly beautiful flat land that goes on forever and nobody farms it. The thing about Ghanaians is that we are very relaxed and we like it that way. <laughs> the, the satisfaction threshold for the average Ghanaian is pretty low. It's a good and a bad thing. It's a good thing because we've never had a civil war in Ghana. A Ghanaian will bend backwards and you know, take it and you know not bother much. You can push him as far as, you know, he'll go and he'll just walk away. And because of that, things are not too difficult in Ghana. But the other side is that he will farm just what he needs to eat. And once he's okay and his neighbors are okay, that's okay. All right? But things are changing because you have these young people who want to go into agribusiness and all the other things. Then they keep hitting government they keep hitting all kinds of regulations. They keep recently, just last year, one of the biggest problems in farming was fertilizer. When you didn't have government subsidies in fertilizer, you had a bound down fertilizer and it was well distributed. Now the government says, I'm going to subsidize fertilizer because I want everybody to have fertilizer. Then they intervene in the fertilizer market. It kills the market. And then the government is the one that brings in the fertilizer and they smuggle the fertilizer. People who need the fertilizer don't get it except you're buying black market fertilizer and it creates problems for you. And I could go on and on and on and on. My point is, if the average Ghanaian 
did not have to deal with seeds and government regulations around it and all those other things. And many people, especially in the villages, who don't have to deal with these things, they just go into farming and they farm. And a lot of times with a little technology here and there, if you take mangoes, for instance, the normal yield was multiplied by about a hundred times just by introducing some technology and you know uh, people combining with other people. One of the things I hope we can do from here is for Israelis to come to Ghana and farm. You can get a hundred times more what you are getting here. Okay, and I'll be your champion to get rid of the government out of your way. So if you ask me what should government do, I'll say look, appreciate that there is a certain natural tendency for people to want to do something for themselves. And yes, you might want to help them, but just leave them alone for now and then find where they actually have a problem. Markets, roads, okay? I mean, uh, the business of farming, that's a problem. And everything grows in Ghana. Flowers, you know, there was a business plan I looked at where people were going to, grow flowers and fly them out of Ghana and it was perfectly viable because we are on the equator in nine hours you'll be in the UK everything and then you start hitting the problem you have to register your business you have to do this and you have to do and that is the problem so get out of the way maybe that's a good start Kofi uh, before you uh, put the mic down um Referring back to the Israeli model, research is something which is evidently key to lead innovation. Does government, government not have a role to play in the field of research? Yes, they do. And we have quite a number of research institutions in Ghana for agriculture. Um, my disappointment with them is that I think they should make it more locally relevant. And we even have the extension officers but um, somehow it doesn't hit the ground, right? I spent a bit of time in farming in my youth because my uncle had a farm. My uncle was a banker who wanted to farm. And for the 10 years or so that we farmed, we did not see any influence of the research institutions in Ghana on our farming. So again, there's a lot of money spent in that area, but it's just not properly targeted. Now, if you put me in research put me in charge of research in farming for Ghana, I would put half of the people there to be actual farmers. And I want people who are engaged in farming to determine how research funding for farming or agriculture is spent. All right. I think it's the other way around this time. The people who are involved there are policy people and academics and whatever. And I think there's a bit of disconnect between they and the farmers. So I would say there's a role there, but the role is not just to spend money in research. It is to make research relevant to people in Ghana. And I believe if that's done, there'll be a positive difference. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, perhaps a, a, a good opportunity to turn to you, Iran, and ask on the issue of applied research, which Kofi has just talked about, what has Israel done to get that so right? Uh, and number one. And number two, does it have application beyond Israel into countries in, for example, Africa? Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, first of all, I'm sharing the same uh, philosophy that uh, the best thing that governments can do is not to disturb. That's uh, the, pr the first principle, because te governments has the tendency to be uh, usually to disturb uh, innovation, to disturb with uh, not necessary bureaucracy. But after I said that, uh, at least in Israel, uh, today the government uh, support uh, eight uh, R&D, agricultural R&D. Tomorrow you will visit the one that we have in uh, our region and uh, you will see, uh, I think, probably the most advanced uh, agriculture that, uh, that's been done in the world in desert uh, agriculture. And the way that the, the, the system works is that the Ministry of Agriculture is supporting, subsidizing, uh, R&D together with another um, uh, another uh, agency. Uh, it's called the KKL, uh, Kakal in Israel, and they are giving the seed money to 
conduct those uh, researchers that uh, eventually will be uh, implemented by the farmers. I can tell you for many years, and I've uh, been in many places all over the world, always the farmers think that the researchers are not uh, efficient. It's also in Israel. But when you check, again, the market and what we added into the market in terms of um, if, if it's new crops, or new things that are uh, more um, uh, sustainable and can um, deal with the different viruses that uh, we can have or we add. Uh, I think we had a crucial uh, contribution to the research and the implemental research. And I can give a few examples, but tomorrow you will see it with your own eyes, uh, so I'll, uh, you'll, with your eyes and you will taste it. By the way, the best food that we can, that you can imagine. There's the most tasteful cherry tomatoes, pineapples, uh, strawberry, cherries. Basically, we know to do everything in this desert. And I think one thing that we need to understand, uh, first of all, the farming in Israel was uh, strongly connected with the ideology. Uh, you cannot uh, disconnect it because in the times where there were the, the farming was not uh, too profitable, always the government needed to subsidize if, if it's with the water or with different incentives. And there are incentives to the farmers, there are incentives uh, the government does subsidize the water, but in terms of the search and uh, uh, the R&D, I think we got to the stage and uh, only in the past five years that we understood that we need to go one layer above, which is the technology. Most of the R&D in Israel were focusing on, uh, as I said, the, the different crops, uh, different uh, variety, maybe to do it more efficient with better yield. But now we got to the point of the technology because Israel is a start startup nation. Uh, at least uh, that's the reputation. And we uh, now see that there is a big demand for the knowledge that we produced about Israel desert uh, farming and to connect it with the technology. What kind of technology? It can be optics, it can be remote sensing, it can be a, a sugar testing, it can be in many, many fields. And once you do this integration between the technology, the startups, the high tech, the, the, those uh, uh, very uh, dynamic uh, uh, industry with the farming or the agriculture industry, things, interesting things happen. But you need to take in consideration and maybe this is again one of the basic rules: uh, you need to, to be, you need to uh, expect to fail. Without failing, there won't be any success. And we uh, now we are developing uh, desert truffles. And if it will work, and I think it will work, it will be something outstanding. And many of our farmers will make good money out of it. But it will take us another two or three years to pr to to develop it, and then. Uh, there, and, on, and on the way, we assume that there will be uh, things that we won't uh, succeed. So, uh, first of all, you need to, 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 to initiate, uh, to think out of the box, and, and making des uh, farming in the desert is thinking out of the box. And, uh, ben and it was said before, uh, before me, Ben Gurion, and Ben Gurion lived and uh, passed away in our, uh, in our uh, district. Uh, thinking about the potential of the desert and now we see it with the climate changes, with the connection with other countries and we uh, definitely working with countries in Africa, we're working with countries in the Far East and, uh, and basically almost all over the world and I'll just uh, finish with a, s a short story that uh, two months ago I had a visitor from Vietnam, the mayor of uh, Ho Chi Minh City it used to be known as Saigon. He came to me uh, with uh, like 20 people that uh, accompanied him. And I asked him, how many people do you have mayor in Ho Chi Minh City? He said, we just a little bit about above 10 million people. I said, them, we are a little bit below 10,000 people. But we know how to feed those 10 million people. Actually, we know to feed, to, to feed our uh, 100 million people. And, and now with the Egyptians and many, many other countries uh, as, as well with the uh, United Arab Emirates, we're uh, uh, exporting our uh, knowledge in order to feed uh, many of the uh, people that need to be fed in this world. Thank you.
Thank you, Ran. Uh, Richard, over to you. Uh, the Brent Hurst Foundation advises governments across Africa on policies that promote economic development. What sort of challenges do you face in getting policies adopted by governments that are supportive of free trade and uh, developmental outcomes? Last on the stage and last to speak. Um, before I jump into that, I just want to sort of echo what's been said already. I was just writing down on my phone, taking a note that, you know, in order to be successful, you have to be scared to fail. I think governments are inherently risk averse. They, they don't want to fail because they know they'll suffer come the next election. That's probably the biggest concern. I share the opinion that, yes, governments should get out the way. Governments should not be in the business of doing business. Um, so that's, I think, a key takeaway. And unfortunately, what we've seen in Africa is too often governments um, getting a bit too comfortable with, with doing business. Um, and that's very perplexing. I was talking to Febi before lunch about ADMARC in Malawi, the Agricultural Development and Marketing Association, Corporation, sorry, and just how that sort of existed to set a, 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 a floor and ceiling price on maize, but somehow found itself owning a football team in Malawi. Just one of many examples. I'm sure the, the cocoa board in Ghana as well, Kofi, um, you know, we can go on and on. And in my home country of South Africa, we're very good when it comes to state-owned enterprises and uh, running them into the ground. I think when, uh, to answer the question, the biggest challenge that we've seen when we've sat down with, with governments and heads of state is, and it, and it lends itself to what I've just said, is that governments, they want to control as much as possible. And that's ideological as it, as it is economic, right? If we, if we look back at when governments gained independence during and at the end of the Cold War, there's been a very strong state-centric mentality uh, in African governments. And just two of the examples I mentioned now in Ghana and, and Malawi, there is the focus on we know best, we will deliver for our people, and we can make a bit of money whilst we do it as well. There is not always a distrust, but there certainly is a uncertainty around the private sector in, in, in many countries. Um, again, South Africa being one of them. Uh, we are notorious for, for not wanting to work with the private sector. And so it's, it's about trying to break down those barriers. And in my experience, the best way you can do that is seeing is believing, right? Um, we've all heard about Israel and, and the success it's had in agriculture. I know many people here have, have come have come to uh, to Israel to see. I, I've been to Ramat Hanegev. I've met with uh, is it Lion Lion David um, and and seen firsthand. You know the success. Um, and really, it's it's about doing that. And it's about more importantly actually giving local ownership to the African stakeholders. Um, you know, it, there is a thing known as neo-colonialism, the idea that, you know, in Africa, things still need to be provided for Africans, they need to be shown, they need to be taught, they need to be um, essentially managed by, by a Westerner, by a Mzungu, you know, such, <laughs> such as myself. So really, if you want to in, enjoy buy-in at, at the highest level, it's about actually getting local ownership. Because again, you have to think about this, and perhaps this is, this is somewhat pessimistic, but you have to think from the government's perspective. They want to stay in power. If they want to stay in power, they need the electorate to support them. The best way they can get the electorate to support them is for the government to be seen as doing good by the people. And so if they can get foreigners such as Israel to come in and actually not just hand over the technology or, or, or train them and, and have a, maybe a weekend seminar, but actually give them the tools. You know, you can give a man a fish, but if you teach a man to fish, you feed him for life. Uh, and this really goes back to the origins of Israel's endeavors on the African continent. You know, the first embassy was opened in Ghana back in 1956-57, Golda Meir. You know, the idea that Israeli agronomers were lauded for their ability to roll up their sleeves and actually work in the fields with, with the local African counterparts, whereas the Brits and the Americans wanted to have tea and coffee um, and lunch. So, so 
Israel, for the most part, has enjoyed that, that benefit. And, you know, I've seen it in countries like Tanzania, Kenya, uh, and Ethiopia, where there are Israelis, you know, working in the fields. They've, they've been living out there. They've been training locals. Um, and they really do have a lot to give and a lot to offer. The question is, how do you then get that to a higher level into policy? And that's where we certainly try um, and, and bridge the divide and bridge the gap. But ultimately, it does come down to a question of, how do you tie something like this, or a particular policy, to, to government benefit? And in many cases, that's difficult. Sadly, in South Africa, our government doesn't want really anything to do with Israel. Uh, we've recently just downgraded the embassy here to a liaison office. Having said that, Innovation Africa, um, that operate out uh, of Tel Aviv, their largest presence in Africa is ironically in South Africa. Um, so it just goes to show that just because the government says one thing, it doesn't mean that the benefits aren't being felt at a grassroots level and that everyday folk don't actually stand to gain. So really it is about, you know, if, if Danielle mentioned a triangle, I'm going to mention a Venn diagram. You know, it's about trying to get all the right stakeholders to amass or to coalesce around a central, central point um, and to actually move them forward by, by showing them just what is uh, possible. Thank you, uh, Richard. Uh, I'm going to kick off the first uh, question for the panel, uh, not to any of you specifically, but I want, to, I want to get back to our theme of innovation. And my question is really one of what does the future of food look like to you? At the moment, we have some quite polarized views in terms of, number one, a return to very environmentally sound agriculture, the agroecological approach. And on the other hand, we have a very industrial approach, which is, uh, let's say, looking at new technologies or not such new technologies, but things like precision fermentation, where we actually have industrial manufacturing uh, operations that will provide the future uh, of the food that we eat. So really, uh, from your personal perspectives, what does the future of food look like? I, I instinctively picked up the microphone, so I think I'll, I'll start. Um, for context, I'm not a scientist or an agronomist. I'm a politician by training, uh, shamedly. Um, but I think, the, I think the key future for food, specifically in Africa, is going to come down to, to urban farming. Um, I think when you, and someone mentioned earlier, Africa's population... By 2050, you're looking at 2.2, 2.3 billion people. About 1.5 billion will live in urban centers. Urban centers which we know today, Lagos, Dar es Salaam, Johannesburg, but completely new ones. And I think when we talk about farming and agriculture in Africa, we automatically think about the smallholder in rural Africa. But what we, what we are perhaps forgetting is that many of these rural farmers, or at least their children, will move to, to urban centers. And as we know, urban centers are already scarce when it comes to space. If you've visited Lagos, for example, you will know firsthand. So the question becomes, how do you feed the, the millions and billions of people that will be living in these urban centers if you're already struggling in terms of logistics to get food from the rural areas to the metropoles to begin with? So really, we need to start, in my opinion, when we talk about the future of food, is we need to start thinking about how do we, yes, incorporate new systems and technologies when it comes to agriculture, but how do we do it whilst being cognizant of the fact that much of the farming that's going to happen in the future will be in very dense spaces uh, where, where, where real estate really is at a premium and perhaps the access to resources won't be what, what we understand them to be today. Thanks, Richard. So basically an intensification which allows food to be produced closer to market. Iran, your, your view. Oh, um, sorry. Uh, sorry. Please. Okay, I was going to say I'm not sure how popular this is but I am quite convinced that the future of agriculture is agribusiness. I think many more people are going to move to urban areas and you are going to have more specialization in farming. 
you are going to have more innovation in farming. I think you are going to have more scientific farming. And you are going to have the situation where it happens somewhere and there's a supply chain. It is shipped somewhere and it's consumed. Now, in Africa, or if you take just Ghana, we can produce everything we need in Ghana. But it won't make sense. It won't make sense because the future of agriculture is agribusiness. Economics will drive this thing. Right? If you have a situation where we realize our dreams in ECOWAS, for instance, and if we have a situation which is my dream that we get the kind of connection we need with countries like Israel, okay, we are having interest from as far off as China. People are buying huge lands and producing things we don't need in Ghana and just exporting it because it just makes economic sense. If we have that arrangement, you can have what people need in Lagos grown in Ghana and shipped across. And then you can have Israeli farmers come to Ghana and take a quarter of the northern region because it's cheap to make a lot of money farming over there. You just need to see it and grow wheat and export it to you know, Israel. So for me, I think the future of agriculture is agribusiness. I don't know why people have a certain resistance to that. Yes, COVID saw the disruption of, you know, uh, supply chains, etc. We will look back at COVID in the next 20 years and call it a blessing. Mark these words. We will call it a blessing because COVID basically shifted us 20 years ahead. We use Zoom today. All right? And COVID just taught us that our supply chains are not as resilient as they should be in this age. So the way I see it is that, look, if all this opportunity is there and Chinese are coming into Africa, buying lands and growing crops and shipping it back to China, we are going to see that the economics drives the agriculture. And the innovation makes it like that fewer people will be needed there. You send the machines over, they produce the crops, etc. cetera. So agribusiness will be more and more and more important. Yes, we'll still have agriculture, but really, I think the future will look more like what you have here in Israel and somewhere in the West. Excellent. Iran, over to you. Um, theoretically, there's supposed to be a very good business because uh, there will be more people. The demand will be bigger, right? Uh, but on the other end, we know the shortage of water uh, and the lack of land, fruital land, will be making uh, uh, a, a dangerous um, uh, situation. So first of all, we need to deal with the climate changes uh, and then see what will be the outcomes. The, my optimism is about two things, is that first of all, the uh, growth of uh, demographic growth will produce a lot of sewage. In Israel, we use 78, between, th between 70 to 80 percent of the water, of the sewage, we use it back to uh, recycling into the uh, farming. So theoretically, as many as people will go to the urban places, there will be more sewage with this sewage will be, there will be more sewage with this sewage will be able to irrigate the, uh, the crops. So this is one thing. The second thing is that we need to to to, to improve much better the synergy between the waste and the waste of water. So the waste uh, of farming waste uh, and um, all the waste that we are uh, accumulating, if there will be, um, the technology will need, to, will know how to handle. And unfortunately in this um, thing, Israel is uh, be behind uh, other countries, but eventually that's what we need to do, to take the waste to take the sewage and create a new uh, farming that will be uh, feeding the world the population and, and it can happen and it should be. And of course, uh, after I said that, maybe the main uh, focus will be on the aquatech, which will be on water in the oceans and uh, of course all the replacement for meat and for dairy products. So there is so many options, so many opportunities. We just need to focus on solving those uh, things that we produce as problems, sewage, uh, waste, and I think we'll be able to uh, pr uh, live to our kindergarten, uh, kinder kids, our children, uh, a better place, hopefully. But, uh, you know, optimism and pessimism, it's just a matter of uh, experience. Phoebe, in uh, this high-tech future for uh, agriculture, do you think that smallholder farmers have a role? <laughs> Actually, okay. I, I'm, I'm divided. 
if you want to play around with government policies, food will be expensive. Because we are talking of using technology, digitizing processes, we are talking of using ICT, we are talking of use, mechanizing everything. But these things come with a cost. They are not for free. So if food is agribusiness, it means the one who is producing the food needs to get profit out of it. And if we are not careful enough, if we are not working around with government policies, smallholder farmers will be casualties. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure where the future of food, food is going. I'm not sure if we hold this conference in 10 years, we'll all have just feasted on you know, a plant-based burger or you know, replacement milk. I do hope the future of food will be agribusiness. But after a trip to the US last week, I just uh, had several engagements with the US government, and I think the key driver or determinant of where our food systems are going to be going will be based on where we decide to invest. And I say we, I really mean governments, and, you know, the big DFIs and the big money players here and the kind of infrastructure we're deciding to invest in. I heard a lot in the U.S. about investing in, you know, the roads and the markets and the enabling ecosystem. I think coming from Israel's experience, not only that is critical, but as we always discuss, Grant, the investment needs to go into the knowledge as well, the capacity for the people. And I think that's a key government role to determine the future of food systems with the R&D and the extension. But also, as Phoebe said, they have to be investing in training the farmers, and I hope they're the ones that will actually be leading this agribusiness revolution. So just a quick thing. So assuming that a farmer in Israel who has to deal with every problem, water, land, this, and he's thinking about you know, repurposing sewage and using it in farming, etc. Assuming that farmer travels to meet me in Accra, and I, we go on a trip to the north, and he realizes and I bet you it's true, that he needs just a tenth of the investment and just a tenth of the effort, all right, to produce twice what he's producing in Israel. You will learn very quickly that unless there's a government in his way, he's going to move his farming to Ghana and he's going to produce those crops there and ship it to Israel. I think that's going to happen more and more. My problem is governments. And if we can make those links happen, we will realize quickly, and I'm so sorry to say this, but it's true, that traditional farmers who farm as a way of life will be the first casualty. You would have to make farming a business and a serious business. And again, sorry to say, but if they don't find a way to connect with economics and investors in food and agribusiness, they would be pushed away. But any country that trades efficiently never faces a famine. If you trade, if you don't have too many you know, barriers to trade, you will never have a famine. We're having a situation in Ghana today where you know, the economy is in trouble and we're going to the IMF and all those things. And I've lived long enough to remember the last time we had a situation like that, which led us into a very terrible coup, and a soldier took over for 19 years. The difference between now and then is that at that time, we had shortages. You had to queue for everything, toilet roll, food, everything, and it erupted. Now, the problems are worse, but there is no shortage. Petrol prices went up, food prices went up, everything went up, everybody screamed and shouted and insulted everybody, and then we went back to our lives. So as long as you don't have those shortages, which trade would deal with? And as part of trade, you realize, like I'm saying, instead of farming at a certain price here or anywhere for that matter, if you can do it in Ghana for a tenth of the price and twice the output, you are going to have to move to Ghana. So that's the future I can see. And I hope it happens quickly because it really is going to be better for everybody. Fantastic. Can we open it up to the floor? A couple of questions. Working? Hello. Okay. Um, my name is uh, Eric Schmidt. I'm a, kind of a hybrid of a new immigrant to this country and one foot in Africa. I lived in Africa for 35 years. I'm an agronomist. I was a farmer myself in the Cape. You come from Cape Town. Um, a, f a few maybe remarks, maybe to help also in the discussion and to move forward. Um, I work for an organization here uh, with Dan 
for uh, called Israel for Africa. And what we do is, or well, let me do one step back. We found from the the data here in, in Jerusalem from the Chamber of Ch Chambers that two percent of the GDP of Israel comes from Africa. Despite all the good work that has been doing already, so there is a huge market for Israel to go still to Africa. That's, that's one remark, what strikes me. Um, I worked with many Israelis in Africa um, and do fantastic work technically. Uh, I think there might be an, a need, and the panel maybe can confirm this, that um, I've seen many turnkey projects and they do fantastic work with irrigation, but there is always a link. Sometimes when it's finished, it's finished. There's no continuation. So um, I, I spoke with you over lunchtime and you confirmed yeah, that training of training is important. So if I can plant a seed in our Israeli brothers and sisters here who want to strengthen the linkages, come to us, Israel for Africa, and we, we link you with opportunities in Africa with our brothers and sisters here to avoid this gap. I've seen it with USAID. I've seen it with um, many, many organizations. They do the same. After a few years, the whole thing collapses. And if you talk about food security, you have to give our people in Africa the opportunity to continue. It might not be going as we, we Westerners, and I speak for myself as well, want it, but let it flow. And it's, I say always in the hands of the good Lord to make it happen eventually. Um, I also have a question, maybe in the discussion, we can now after this to Israeli companies here and representatives. Why do you do what you do? Yeah, it might be interesting to have a super interesting um, good system, irrigation system, but is that what people want? I would rather suggest let the dialogue come from Africa to us here in Israel, and I'm sure Volcano is doing this already and on a high scale, to identify what's needed. For instance, you do work here in Israel about sweet potato. Till I went to Rami Levy, the big supermarket is that, is a, and they, they sell yellow sweet potatoes, which is high in vitamin A. Excellent. So maybe the technology you do here, I don't know if Volcano is doing this, but inject it more with institutions, international institutions in Africa. Achla, fantastic. Um, thank you. Thanks. And you're welcome to come and to me and Dan after the, the conversation. Excellent. Thank you. Long-term engagement, I think, is what it's all about. Agriculture is exactly that. Uh, was there a question over there? In Africa, and a lack of, you know, the climate change, a lack of water, and there's uh, also a lack of government investment. The government is not government investment. The government is not investing enough in terms of technology, in terms of, of water catchment. We are wasting too much water annually, and people are still, the country is still dry, and a lot of deforestation and the environmental is not protected by government. And unlike my friend over there, I think the government should step in to actually, and I like the Israel model, the triangle, which in, in our panel in actually suggested, the government need to step in and invest more into water technology, water catchment, in building dams, that kind of things. And above all, we need more market access. Because if we, our farmers produce, and we are, cannot access international mainstream markets, there is no point farming it. So most of our farmers are actually don't have appetite because there is no market accessibility internationally. So that's actually putting most of our farmers back because they produce, they're not making any money. The other thing we have in Africa is we are not trading each other in you know, we are not exporting, importing each other. We're not buying from each other. So Maryland, Richard, being there, we buy, we buy, we buy more in, from Ethiopia in agricultural products. 
annually than any other African country. And so we need more integration economically in Africa. And we need more in, in, in terms of uh, integrating our farming into the world. Because most of our farmers, uh, it's, not, it's not because we have got more land. In Somaliland, it's bigger than Emirati Arab, in Bahrain, Kuwait, in, you know, the Qatar, all of these countries put together. We can start big farming tomorrow, but the problem is we have not the access to the market. And we, there is a lack of environmental protection, lack of water catchment. We have got enough water. Unlike the Middle East country, we don't need to drink water from the sea. We have got fresh water annually, but we need to catch that water and produce more agricultural products. So I think that is the key problem, is the market, investment, more involved in government, because if government is not investing, is not encouraging investment, then the, the, the ordinary farmer will don't have know-how, you know, how to access to the international market and where they can get the technology, the research, and all the things. I really strongly think the Israeli model is the best thing that Africa can copy it. Thank you. Thank you. Interesting perspective. Uh, quite correct. The, the issue is complex. Infrastructure, climate change, innovation, research, the development of knowledge, accessing the right markets, accessing the right appropriate technologies, having policy that is supportive. It's a holistic solution that is required. Uh, I think it's, it's, a, it's, it's a very relevant uh, comment. Danielle? Yeah, I just wanted to respond. I love the comment very much, actually. I think I mentioned very briefly the importance of government investing in infrastructure. I think the other thing you mentioned about this Israeli model, well, after we launched the case study, we actually launched it in Ghana with your Minister of Agriculture, the case study. We started to get inundated with requests from countries across Africa saying, can you help us implement that triangle model? Um, so we've actually created a partnership with Grant and with Tony Blair Institute for Global Change to actually come together with African governments and look at that triangle model. What does it look like to translate it and adapt it to a local context? And I tell you why this is critical. Number one, because you need that investment in the knowledge, and this is the innovation ecosystem. We're empowering local actors. We're not coming in with a turnkey project and leaving. Someone said that. We're actually empowering the local stakeholders to do it themselves adapted to local context. But more than that, you're trying to attract foreign direct investment into your countries to invest in the agricultural sector. What you want is to help de-risk those investments. You do that by giving them confidence that your farmers and your agribusinesses can succeed because they have that support ecosystem. So we very much believe, number one, that introducing this golden triangle approach is not only critical investment in the capacity to innovate, but will actually help de-risk direct foreign investments. And just a word to our collaboration actually with Phoebe too, the other area which we know Israel invested in, does anyone met Yossi Vardi? Do you know who Yossi Vardi is? He's like the forefather of the startup nation. Is that the best way to describe him, Aran? Okay, he's like the forefather of the startup nation, right? He's advising government leaders around the world on how to do innovation. We asked him personally when we wrote this case study, what would you do if you were leading an African nation today? How do you invest in agricultural innovation? And he said, identify those leading agricultural entrepreneurs that are going to be that change no matter what. And just lift them up. They're the ones that you need to be providing the support with. And so we've actually also just collaborating with Phoebe and the National Youth Council of Malawi actually to bring to them the know-how from Israel to both invest on the top down with the governments, but bottom up too, and actually to give them capacity. Quick question to you. Yes. Why did, he say, why did he say identify the leading agricultural entrepreneurs and not the leading farmers? Because he believes in agribusiness. So he's going to come to that, and I think that's a paradigm we need to deal with. I, the average Ghanaian farmer, for instance, and I say this very carefully because it can be taken very wrongly, but the average Ghanaian farmer is a smallholder, peasant, subsistence farmer. A number of them who have tried to 
go beyond what their natural strength can happen have faced catastrophe. Why? Because they stretch beyond what they are normally able to manage and maybe took on a loan to do some big farming and there's a fertilizer or something and something happens and boom, they are in debt. So I have this clear feel that the future of agriculture is in young, educated people who don't want to do agriculture but want to make money. And they see agriculture as a means to make that money. And so we need to find these guys, all right? And we need to keep those nice farmers who farm for the love of farming and all that. But the future of agriculture is in these young, educated people who want to make money through agriculture. What governments can do is build roads to farms, from the farm to the market, all right? And make the triangle, at least these agronomists, available so these guys can tap into them because it takes 30 years to you know train that person so if they are there these guys are going to pick them up They're some of the most successful farms there's a company called golden exotics in ghana they 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 they, they came to farm their fruits and to export basically and they have created these wild chains of private, smallholder, medium-sized, all kinds of farms and farm holdings, all right, to produce the fruits which they process and then they export. The reason why that's an important case study is that, of course, they came in with government knowledge and some support, but they have had to make their way every step of the way to create the science, to find the investment, to create the uh, communities that will produce those things. It didn't take government to do it for them. And I believe if there was a government to help them, they would be happy to take it. But the entrepreneur must have a clear view from end to end. And then find the wherewithal to plug those things in. And if I had anything to do with it, I'll say, find those entrepreneurs and let's help them. Yes. Thank you. Okay, let me come in. Final, final comment from Phoebe. Okay, fine. The reason why we are also dealing with agripreneurs is that you can train 10 people and those 10 people are working in different areas. So we instruct them, those 10 people to teach their communities whatever they are getting from the trainings. And that's why there was also a comment about a train of trainers. These are responsible for training smallholder farmers in their surrounding areas. There are places you can reach there are places you can't reach. But those people will be able to reach those places where you can't reach. And the other thing is, most of those people are elite. So it's easy to transfer information to them. It's easy to transfer knowledge to them. And they will dilute the knowledge, interpret it, and then give it to their communities. Thank you. Wonderful. Good luck. Thank you, thank you so much to the panelists. I think uh, some, some interesting conclusions, but the one very clear conclusion, the experience of Israel and the agricultural model that it has created has relevance within the region and beyond the region into Africa. And I think that when one talks about agricultural research, it's a win-win game for everyone. This is not a trade negotiation where there are winners and losers. Everybody wants their neighbor and their region to be food secure. So I think the transfer of knowledge through research and through collaboration, particularly when it comes to food, is a wonderful icebreaker for political context as well as that of food security. Thank you so much. Works when you talk into it. Oh, here we go. Um, uh, Grant, uh, thank you very much for moderating the panel and to all the panelists. It was great. Um, you know, Kofi, when you say um, to the government, build roads, right? So I'm reminded of an, of an anecdote I'd like to share with you. I uh, was advising the government of Paraguay on economic development for a while. And uh, I wanted to try to understand why it wasn't working, 
why 20% of the population was living in acute poverty, although they're exporting soybeans to China, right? So how you, how you feeding China and not your own population, right? But one of my trips out to the, the hinterland went to a very small village of about 150 families. And um, I, I, I drove in a, you know, a, a Cherokee Jeep to get out there. And it was a very, very poor village. And while I'm talking to the mayor of the village, uh, I noticed that there's clotheslines that are very thick clotheslines. And I look, I look closely, and I see they're drip irrigation. Drip irrigation lines. I look a little closer, and I see Nitafim, you know, the famous Israeli company that developed drip irrigation. I looked at the mayor of the village, and I said, why are you using drip irrigation for clotheslines? And he laughed. You know, he didn't have any shoes or any teeth, but he had smarts. He looked at me, and he said, how did you get here? I looked at him, I looked at, I pointed to my Jeep Cherokee, and he said, ah, four by four. He says, I've got a four by four too. And he pointed to a donkey that was about to, that was about to die. And he said, you give me, you give me drip irrigation, I don't have a road. So let's say I increase my production, how do I get my production out to the market? So build me a road and then give me the drip irrigation, right? I came back to the president and I said, look, you've got to turn your policies around. You don't understand what you're doing. Did it help? No. Anyway, we're going to take a short break for 20 minutes for coffee. And we have a very exciting result of the survey we took and a very, very exciting panel to close out the day on ESG regulations. Is European regulations, U.S. European regulations, choking the African content or is it providing it with an opportunity? You'll hear the answer soon and the things that we can do to use it in a kind of jujitsu turnaround in our favor to the benefit of raising the level of humanity in Africa. So short coffee break and please come back in on time. Thank you. Excuse me, sir. Just, uh, I want to say uh, just uh, a, a word. I want just to say a word yes, for the from, first... Uh, Ambassador, uh, Israeli ambassador in Mauritania, in my country. He opened the uh, Israeli embassy in Waxhot in 1999. And I want to thank him. And we wish to see him back to integrate the next uh, Israeli embassy in Waxhot. Thank him so much. Thank you, Hamidou. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate that. Thank you, Hamidou.
uh, gentlemen holding court in the back of the room. Lenny, at the Cholof Hazert Afghana. That's from your police work. That's the most important word to know here. Um, Dan Gerstenfeld, the whole of the Um Ladies and gentlemen, we have a riveting session coming up. I'd appreciate your undivided attention. Do, Lenny, do, do we still have troops outside? Give it one more minute. Just some uh, housekeeping while we're waiting. Um, at uh, six the end of this uh, session, we're going to have our first practical application of uh, this conference. And we're going to sign a, JCPA is going to sign an MOU with the uh, think tank of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of uh, Ethiopia. We've prepared the documents. Um, Dr. Belete and Dr. Amari were kind enough to prepare the documents and send them beforehand. We're going to take this opportunity to make an official signature as we conclude the day. That'll be at 6. Um, at uh, a quarter to 7, we're going to be going to a uh, private dinner held by uh, a local businessman who's been involved in uh, Africa for many years. It's just a five-minute walk from the hotel. And we'll meet at a quarter to 7 in the lobby and walk over together. Uh, those going to the MENA 2050 dinner will meet at 7.15, a little bit later um, in the evening. Um, Emily, who you'll meet in a moment, uh, Emily Nielsen Winkler, is the CEO of Vallop. Uh, she's an entrepreneur, a public speaker, and she's on a mission. You'll find very soon that she's a lady on a mission uh, to develop financially viable, high-impact initiatives that empower economies from within. As the founder and former CEO of Link, she provided sustainability alignment services to large-scale infrastructure projects in Africa. She's a great lady and knows more than anybody I know about how to develop Africa. So she's going to moderate this session and uh, teach us about how to confront the issues of ESG um, she conducted a survey with some very interesting results. Emily, if you'd please come forward. On Emily's panel, and they've, they've spoken, so they've consulted about the nature of the panel and where it's going to go. I'd like to invite uh, Jones N. Williams from Liberia. Uh, he's the CEO of Macrovision, an institutional development think tank and management consultant firm. Jones is a Liberian-American public service administrator, policy professional, and senior project and program manager with more than 20 years of experience in international institution development, financial services, health systems management, business management, data governments and privacy, cyber and information security, regulatory compliance, workforce development, labor market analysis, industry innovation, food security. How did you, how did you do all that? Goodness. I didn't even finish. <laughs> Uh, I, had the, I had the pleasure of uh, meeting Dr. Hosni Gedera from Tunisia, UAE, just a few weeks ago in uh, Abu Dhabi. And uh, it's great to uh, continue and see you here in Jerusalem. 
Dr. Gadera is Director of Research Engagement in Mohammed bin Zayed University of Artificial Intelligence. He served as Director of the Research Center for Renewable Energy Mapping and Assessment at Mazda Institute from 2010 to 2020. He is a former Assistant Professor and Research Associate Professor at the City University of New York. And lastly but not least, I met Dr. Kennedy last night when I came to check in in the hotel and we had some internet problems. You solved your problems last night. I've got my problems all day with the internet. Dr. Kennedy Oyanga Osembo of Kenya is Associate Director, Global Center for Policy and Strategy. He has 25 years experience in training, research, and public policy advisory. He has consulted and implemented public policy programs for the African Union, UN Development Program, UN Office on Drugs and Crime in Eastern Africa, U.S. Embassy in Kenya, Embassy in Japan in Kenya, British High Commission in Kenya, Refugee Consortium of Kenya, Women in Law and Development in Africa, and the Ministry of Education, Kenya. Wow, this is going to be a very, very interesting session. It's all yours, Emily. Take it away. Lovely. Well, thank you all for hanging in there. Jeez, it has been a day with a lot of content, and it's all been amazing. Um, a special thank you to the JCPA, to Dan, and to Yechiel, and the amazing staff that's been behind this conference. Um, to President Herzog for his opening remarks, and Deputy Mayor of Jerusalem, Fleur Hassan Nahum, who was present with us today. Uh, honored ambassadors and amazing delegates. Uh, I could go with something more formal to explain what I've seen today, but I'm actually going to go pretty real and raw and to say that this really has been inspirational and amazing to see the people that have been here today. And for me personally, because 12 years ago, I went, a very young lady, after my Israeli military service, and I got on a plane, and I went to Washington, and I spent months in an internship in a think tank. Members here today come from all walks of the different variations of think tanks in Africa and the Middle East, Europe and America. And what I've seen here today is different than what I saw 12 years ago. Because 12 years ago, it didn't take me very long to realize that that was not where I wanted to be in life. I did not believe that think tanks were going to bring the policy changes or solutions that my region, as a young entrepreneur in the Middle East, was going to bring. And today I stand corrected for sure. I've been among people who are showing courage and bravery and doing, actually acting to make change in our region, for your own countries, for our countries together, for collective regions. And it really is inspiring to see everyone here leading by example. But 12 years ago, when I came back from that experience, I decided that my place was not among the think tanks, that it was in business. And I love on our last panel that someone said the young people will come, but it will be from a business point of view. And I came back and I opened my first company. Since then, I've had a number of companies here in Israel that have dealt with impact, meaning I'm an impact entrepreneur. I create businesses because I believe that they serve a purpose and that the purpose it can be delivered by the private sector. And so today, we're going to be talking a lot about the relationships and the collaboration that we can create as think tanks, as do tanks, as governments, but also it's an honor to be the voice of the entrepreneurs in this room today. There's a very vast sector of business and it runs through the DNA of all of our countries. It creates the backbone of our economies. And without that voice, it's possible that these conversations today will never actually be complete. And so it's, It's exciting to be here, and my panelists today are going to give a very interesting approach to how we can deal with one of the biggest challenges in the economic sector today and how it relates to national security, food security, water security, and the potential for prosperity in all of our countries. And so thank you to you all for joining and for dealing with my complete shenanigans up to this panel. We've had intense discussions, the four of us, over the past week. And so it's very exciting to get started. 
Can we get the slides on the screen? So when Yechiel reached out to me and he said he wants me to do a panel at this conference, he said, what would you do it on? And without blinking, I said, ESG. And he blinked three times and looked at me and he said, what? <laughs> and today, I love it that when the panel came on for us to vote, the first thing was, what's ESG? And so I think that that's, great. that's a great place to start. But before we get into what is ESG, I thought that we could all just take a little bit of entertainment after our lunch break and look at this complex process that everyone in this room deals with every day. We collect data, hopefully turn that into information, somehow connect the dots to create knowledge. Our jobs are to create insights from that that will eventually lead to wisdom that will be turned into policy and actions will be put forward. If we do a really good job, we keep the conspiracy theories at bay. But I'm sure everyone in this room has been in the business long enough to know that that doesn't always happen, and sometimes we have to deal with those as well. So earlier, many of you, not all of you, but many of you went into our live poll. And I have the results here, so let's check them live. We still have a tie. The question is, is ESG currently considered a burden or an opportunity in African commodity markets? 31% of the voters said it's a burden, 31% of the voters said opportunity, and 38% said both. You guys may be all a little too political, those that answered both. I'd like to know why. But by the end of this session, hopefully we'll have some better answers as well. So, let's start with data. Breathe deep. It's a lot of data. Don't worry, you don't need to read this. It's simply an example of what an ESG report looks like today. This is an example of a Swiss insurance company. They abide by indicators that we call SASB, S-A-S-B. But what is ESG actually? Environmental, social, and governance compliance. Essentially, the world today expects companies, public or private, in many cases it's voluntary, but in many cases it's now becoming mandatory, to abide by measuring these indicators across environment, social activity, and their internal governance. If I simplify that data and try to turn that into some information for you, this is essentially what a corporate has to deal with. I always try to put myself in the shoes of why this is happening. Why are companies demanding from their entire supply chain, much of which is across the countries we represent here today, to comply with these measurements? Why are farmers all of a sudden being asked about deforestation and if they can commit that they're not adding to the negative effects of deforestation? Why are cocoa farmers in Ghana being asked to confirm that they have no child labor practice? What seems to be a simple question on an indicator list in Europe is a very loaded issue in many of our economies. Then I look a little bit deeper and I say, if it's not mandatory yet, why are you doing it? Why don't you just stick with measuring your own house? your headquarters in Philadelphia, maybe your branches in London? Why are we going all the way down to the specific water levels used on farms across Africa? This example will exa show you exactly why. Once these companies measure and report on ESG, like that very complex document that you saw before, they're then rated and ranked. And if we want to talk about opportunity and economy, there are over 600 entities in the world today that will report and rank a company as a third party asset. The company has no say, except for that one report that they put out. Big deal. So someone says something about your company. They've given you a rank. Well, it is a big deal. 
because that rank goes straight into the stock market, to investor reports and recommendations, and directly to your stakeholders. Ladies and gentlemen, environmental and social issues through ESG compliance are now tied directly to the performance indicators of corporations around the world. So the CEOs and the CSOs, Chief Sustainability Officers, which is a rising career due to these indicators, now report daily, weekly, quarterly, annually to stakeholders on how their company's doing and making sure that they leave the people and the planet in an okay or better situation than when they first came in. So I want you to take a moment, and just like they would teach you at university in conflict resolution, take a moment to step back and put your shoes, your, yourself in the shoes of an international CEO today. Imagine how difficult it is to run a company, to produce a product or a good, a service. Now add on top of that a whole layer of key performance indicators that have nothing to do with their financial bottom line. I've spoken to companies that say, we just make drinks in a can. Why are you talking to me about the energy that I use to do it or the waste that comes out of my factories after the product is made? Well, ladies and gentlemen, we've been talking about it all day. And so if I change that information into something that's even easier to understand, and now we may be getting closer to terminology that we're all familiar with. This is a list of the same indicators that I showed in that very complex table before of the issues, the categories of ESG. We have in here things such as environment, Greenhouse gas emissions, air quality, energy management, water and wastewater management, waste, man, waste management, ecological. If you go over to social, human rights, community relations, customer privacy, access and affordability, human capital, labor practices, employee health and safety. Can anyone in this room tell me if we take that CEO hat off and put our national research institution hats back on. Some of those topics that I just mentioned sound familiar to you. Because there's another set of indicators and frameworks that we're much more familiar with. Can anyone guess what I'm referring to? Give you a really big hint. The SDGs. When people say ESG, I know that I need to say environmental, social, and government to it plain. But when I say SDG, everyone in this room knows what I'm talking about. The Sustainable Development Goals have been on our tables in our policy institutions for many, many, many years. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'll simplify the process and explain that ESG is built on the same science as SDG. And those of us that have been around for long enough know that before SDG, it was called something else. And then there was also CSR, and then there was sustainability reports, and there's about 100 other acronyms that we can put on the table. But in the end of the day, it's based around the same science, and that is what are we as peoples, as corporations, as nation groups doing to make sure that our countries are sustainable, that our people are prosperous, and that we're leaving opportunity for the future. So every ESG indicator can be traced to an SDG. And this is where some insights will start flowing. This is a correlation map of every SDG, all 17 of them, and how many times they're mentioned across the ESG issues. The biggest ones being 3, 8, 12, and 16, with a close follow of 10, 11, 14, and 15. So what does all of that actually mean? Through ESG, for the first time in modern history, corporations are 100% aligned with national agendas to move forward with national goals to ensure environmental and social justice, equality and prosperity, good health, well-being, decent work, economic growth, responsible consumption and production, peaceful 
strong institutions, reduced inequalities, sustainable cities and communities, care for water and care for land. The indicator codes may be different, but don't let them confuse you. The ESGs are SDGs for companies. So is it such a bad thing that companies are now going to be held a little more accountable in our countries to push these things forward from their own budgets? That's always a big question when we're going to do anything in developing any country. Who's paying? Who's doing? Who's responsible for what? And whoever pays normally has a say. But I have a question, and we're going to try to answer it today on this panel. Who should be driving this discussion? Who should be paying? Who should be doing? I, demand, I think a creative solution is in effect here. Because what you may not know yet about ESG is that the environmental and social indicators alone are expected to be roughly a $72 trillion market. These numbers have gone back and forth on the businesses, on the governments. Blue here in the chart representing businesses, orange representing governments. Notice how it's almost equal with a small area of gray on top of philanthropic, philanthropic finances. To give some comparison to what that is, the 2019, unfortunately I didn't have other updated numbers, 2019 GDP of Africa was in the gray next to it. However, I come from the business world. So I want to use a business term here. When I think Africa in the term of ESG, I think scope three. I think supply chain. I think commodities. I think the, the goods and services that make up the backbone of the corporations. And those finances might make up the backbone of African economy. But this is a give and take relationship. And this new market could be the largest financial market that our continents have actually ever experienced. So what exactly are we going to do about it? Is it a burden to comply? Or is it possible that this is an opportunity that everyone in this room should be able to know not to miss? Is it an opportunity where we can say, as scope three, as company's biggest burden, the supply chain, this is how we in our countries are going to meet these indicators because we've been doing it for a long time and we know what's needed. In the collaborations in this room and what was discussed today, we can even collectively come up with the technolo technology and the solutions for them. They exist, but they need to be implemented. And I think that that opens up for exactly discussion today. And I want to utilize the rest of our time to not only have a discussion on the panel, but I challenge each one of the tables in front of me. Utilize what you have, this opportunity, you have brilliant minds sitting around the table with you. Why doesn't every table take out a piece of paper, get a volunteer from one of the delegates, and start jotting down ideas on how your country could capitalize on this economic opportunity that's coming your way? What solutions could you implement? What policy could you put on the table to help your, your supply chain deal with the compliance indicators that are coming in? And in case you missed it in the first slide, Right now, it's voluntary. But come 2025, many of these indicators will be mandatory across the board. And when it does become mandatory, and corporations will have no choice but to comply with these measurements, ask yourself also what that will mean for your country, and if you were ready for it, or if you ignored the early warning signs. So gentlemen, are you ready to give us some insights that are going to lead to some wisdom on this topic? So, as we're discussing, I want us to keep in mind, is it a burden, is it an opportunity? What are the real challenges posed regardless? And what role can we play as research and policy institutions in helping ease and optimize this process? And the provocative question, what are the consequences if we do nothing? So I'll open the floor, um, actually, with Dr. Asembo of Kenya. You uh, wrote a paper for this conference, and I would highly encourage everyone to take a look at it afterwards. Uh, I found it profound and very insightful. And you described in your paper the effect of the drought in the Horn of Africa. 
and what's going on at the moment because of climate change in your region. The numbers to me were quite staggering of the negative impact and what it's caused. You refer to smart policy regimes and innovative technology. And after everything we've heard today and from your insights, from your paper and your knowledge, could you share with us a little bit more about the models that you put forward and what the role the private sector investment can play in climate smart policy? Thank you very much, uh, Emily, for giving me this opportunity. I equally thank uh, Jerusalem Center for Public uh, Affairs for inviting me to Israel. Of course, as a young man uh, growing up in uh, rural Kenya, I remember my uh, greatest dream was to visit Jerusalem because my Sabbath school teacher made me believe that when uh, a righteous man dies, the moment he's buried, his next destination is Jerusalem. So thank you very much. That's how close we are. I want to take this opportunity to briefly uh, give a reflection on uh, uh, the food security situation in the Horn of Africa. And uh, I want to emphasize that uh, uh, currently the Horn of Africa is uh, undergoing uh, a period of, of, of great drought. It's the worst drought in, in 40 years. And that has seen uh, uh, a lot of impact on food production, on livestock production, fish and aquaculture. And uh, this is uh, 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 occasioned by climate change, which uh, a number of uh, Horn of African countries are trying to respond to. But what we are saying is that amidst all these challenges, we do have uh, massive opportunities in terms of the agricultural potential of the Horn of Africa. Today, when we do our calculations, we realize that only 7.7% of the land in the Horn of Africa is arable, and uh, a massive 48, 45.28% uh, agriculturally productive land is not yet put under use. The internal renewable water resources actually stand at 78.7% uh, uh, annually. Horn of Africa has uh, an average 500 millimeters of rainfall uh, every year, and massive underground water, particularly the Turkana aqua, aqua, aqua resources that uh, were discovered recently in Kenya. And so when we look at all these potential, it presents a massive opportunity for the private sector, especially in the agricultural uh, supply chain. There are opportunities in the inputs, there are opportunities in the food processing, there are opportunities in uh, post-harvesting, there are opportunities in, in, in marketing. But how do we uh, ensure that uh, as the private sector gets into the Horn of Africa, we must uh, show uh, responsible business conduct? And so what defines responsible business conduct in uh, agricultural supply chain uh, in the Horn of Africa? That is one question that uh, we are asking. And uh, I want to particularly uh, focus on Kenya in terms of uh, ESG compliance. And I want to situate uh, my uh, discussion on the fact that uh, ESG compliance should ref define responsible business conduct in the agricultural supply chain in the Horn of Africa. Uh, currently, the Constitution of Kenya, Article 69, uh, as well as the Climate Change Act 2016, provide for uh, protection of the environment. Uh, in the COP26, Kenya actually committed to net zero uh, greenhouse emissions by 2030 and uh, uh, commitment to ensure 100% transition to uh, green energy, uh, clean cooking gas by 2028. The Capital Markets Authority in 2015 released guidelines on ESG compliance. The Central Bank of Kenya actually equally released the guidelines. And uh, in 2017, Kenya banned 
uh, the use of plas plastics in packaging. And this had great uh, impact on the manufacturing sector that had to move into getting more friendlier uh, packaging for, for their products. We equally have regulations that were recently issued by the Nairobi Securities Exchange that uh, unveiled their disclosure manual in 2021 that required farms to be ESG compliant by uh, the, the end of uh, 2022. They were given a one-year uh, one uh, window. Of course, the Kenya Bankers Association actually launched what we were calling the Green Bond Program that was encouraging farms to use the bond for uh, ESG compliance. But all these uh, are on top of other policies that have been developed by the government of Kenya on climate smart agriculture. Of course, we have our climate smart agriculture strategy 2017 to 2026. We have uh, the Kenya agricultural policy. Uh, we have our uh, the policy on uh, northern uh, ar uh, the, the arid lands of Kenya. We have the fisheries policy. These are a raft of policies that have been uh, put in place to ensure that uh, there is responsible business conduct. Other farms and industry players have uh, adopted the GRI. They've adopted the sustainability. Uh, uh, sustainability accounting standards board measures. We have the FCI performance index that have been put in place. All these are regulations to ensure that uh, uh, these farms remain uh, ESG compliant. But the biggest question now is, are there consequences? Why is it important that uh, we must compel compliance? I want to give a few uh, case studies in terms of what has happened to the food, food security in, in Kenya. And one of them is that uh, enforcing uh, compliance has uh, a role to play in uh, biodiversity protection. Currently, Kenya uh, in 2022 declared the, 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 the mesquite plant, it's actually called the Matenge plant in Kenya, a threat to national security. Why? This is a plant that was introduced by the Kenya uh, Forestry, uh, Kenya Institute of Forestry Research in 1970, to try and improve the, 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 the ground cover in arid lands. Uh, to date, it has covered over 2 million acres of land in Kenya and it's continuing to spread at the rate of 15% uh, annually. What is it doing on biodiversity? Any other vegetation that grows under the Madenge plant disappears. Wherever the livestock gets into contact with Madenge plant and eats its birds, they lose all their teeth. That is uh, what the Madenge plant does. If it freaks you, the thorns it's, are very poisonous and it has a devastating impact on the health of people. The other uh, uh, case study that I can give is the water hyacinth that was introduced by the Belgium colonialists in uh, Rwanda and Burundi as an ornamental plant. Uh, the, the water hyacinth is believed to be from Brazil, and it made its way into Lake Victoria. Now it has blocked Kisumu port, a lot of uh, resources are being used to uh, work on it, and uh, it is causing havoc and environmental uh, hazards. It's killing fish, because where it is, fish can't breed. The other example that I want to give is the dodder weed. It's called the Japanese dodder. The Japanese dodder is a, a, a plant that is, of course, uh, causing havoc. Uh, we don't know how it entered into the country, but it now uh, has a lot of hazards on avocados, on mangoes, and wherever it, uh, it's a parasitic plant, very in invasive, it covers the mangoes and then they just disappear. It makes sure that the, 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 the plant which it covers uh, definitely disappears and, 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 and dries up. So 
uh, I want to give the, 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 the last example of uh, the Nile patch in Lake Victoria. In 1929, uh, of course, the British colonialists uh, sent uh, Michael Graham to Lake Victoria to do a research. And through their findings on uh, Lake Victoria, uh, call it Victoria Nyanza fisheries and its fisheries. Graham uh, made a recommendation that the introduction of any large predator into the lake without adequate environmental impact assessment would have devastating impact on the indigenous species. These findings were uh, supported by Worthington in 1929 who said that Graham's recommendations must be complied to. But in 1955, the Uganda Fisheries uh, Game and Fisheries Department, led by one John Stoneman, decided to introduce Nile Patch from Lake Albert. He actually picked 47 species and introduced them into Victoria Nile, and he picked another 100 species and introduced them into Lake Kyoga. Uh, why was this done? Uh, the colonialists felt like, no, Lake Victoria has small sp fish species. Why should we have such a huge lake with some small fish species like the tilapia? And so they decided to introduce the Nile patch. That was in 1955. In 1979, we get the, the, the Nile patch boom. And the Nile patch boom actually moved many indigenous communities from uh, the farms. Uh, before then, a number of farms around Lake Victoria, a number of communities around Lake Victoria would uh, till uh, their land. When the Nile patch boom came, they abandoned their, their, their farms and went to trade in Nile patch. What did the Nile patch do to Lake Victoria? it made sure that all the available indigenous species at that particular time were, were almost extinct. In fact, there are very few uh, that, are, that are remaining. What happened later on today, there is overfishing of Nile Patch. But many of the indigenous communities lost their knowledge on food production. They are still uh, fishing, going to fish for the Nile Patch. That is not there. You go to community around Lake Victoria, you see large and huge farmlands abandoned. In fact, there are farms which had been abandoned as, as, as early as 1979. They've never been tilled since 1979 during the Nile Patch boom. And that Nile Patch is no longer there. And the people keep on looking for Nile Patch, which is no longer there. And they cannot come back because of uh, the loss of uh, indigenous knowledge. And all this uh, actually uh, tell us that uh, if we don't uh, compel compliance, the devastating impact on biodiversity is huge. I want to uh, again uh, talk about the issue of resources efficiency. We, if we compel compliance, we are likely to see a lot of uh, savings in terms of energy use a lot of savings in terms of water conservation. I want us also to look at the issue of greenhouse gas emissions. A lot of gas emissions, in fact, 31% of greenhouse gas emissions are from the agricultural supply chain, from the livestock manure, from manure storage. If we compel compliance, we are likely to bring down the greenhouse emission. If we compel compliance, we are likely to have an impact on waste management and, and pollution. These are uh, areas that are causing devastating impact on uh, food security in the Horn of Africa. Thank you. Thank you. Is this one working? Yes? There we go. Thank you, Dr. Assembo. And I think that that goes a lot to many of the regulatory bodies have questioned, do we abide only by environmental or only by social indicators? And there is a very large pushback and I think that I would just ask myself that if before, in the 1970s, African countries would have had the ability to enforce the compliance themselves, 
then something like that case you've just mentioned potentially never would have happened. And a lot of these indicators have been built out of the case studies over the years from these types of incidences that environmental actions could have prevented social damage in a lot of our countries. Thank you. Um, Dr. Ghadira, so you're coming to us from UAE and you also have a, a foot stake uh, uh, out of Tunisia. And I'd like to hear you know, both perspectives, uh, not only both perspectives geographically, but both perspectives out of innovation. Um, your center does amazing work when it comes to innovation, what we call old school, and also new school. The AI revolution and what your work is doing is quite incredible, and I believe it's probably the next step and the next conference. I'd like to explore that even further. But today, I'd like to hear some examples in your opinions around agriculture and water technology initiatives, and in general, what innovation role, what role innovation could play in the ESG process. So thank you, Emily. So we uh, put it in the context. Let, let me start with the UAE first. Um, first, I was fortunate to participate in uh, uh, UN Sustainability Conference 2012 in Rio, where the SDGs uh, goal were developed, and I participated in a couple of uh, working groups on uh, some of SDGs. At that time, uh, the debate was how the adaptation, because each country is different. We have many indicators that some of them are not relevant to some countries. And, and the challenge we are facing until now, the adaptation of this indicator to some specific countries. Uh, if I take the UAE as example uh, and take the water energy nexus, because um, water energy nexus is explained differently in the UAE. And the idea of, uh, you know, the United Arab Emirates started the renewable energy program in late 2000, 2006, 2007. And that time, people are asking why oil-rich countries are investing in renewables. And that time, renewables were very expensive technology. In 2007, the first 100 megawatt plant CSP in the UAE, the kilowatt hour cost 32 cents. Just to compare to today price about four cent. I'm talking about CSP. The PV a third uh, price uh, compared to CSP because CSP give you the option of storage of your energy. Um, so the question of saving water uh, in the UAE is not saving natural resources because 100% of water is coming from desalination. So saving water is saving energy because one liter of water can be converted to kilowatt hour. So this has changed completely the philosophy of saving natural resources by preserving uh, water usage in both agriculture and for household. And, and this is uh, bring the question of um, how we can give more incentive of, 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 of on saving water in, in households. Uh, at that time, the idea of investing in renewable energy uh, for the UAE was around uh, water energy food nexus, because the question how you can sustain life in arid environment, in desert environment, after oil. So the idea at that time was, if we have blessed to be positioned on the sand belt, very high uh, solar resources, so if we can capture if, with efficient technology solar resources, so we can use desalinate water, and we assume that seawater is infinite resources, no one will be concerned about saving seawater. So we can, if you manage to consume, uh, desalinate, but more, more importantly is to manage to save the environment in terms of how you can discharge your brine and the high uh, concentrate of sal saline water back to the environment. So if you produce water from sun and you can irrigate, so you can produce food and you can close the loop in terms of food, uh, water energy, food nexus. And this is, cannot be applied in other countries uh, because it's why, to go back to my uh, initial point, that is, it's country specific. Uh, you ask uh, about some example. Um, I give you an example of study that I participate in terms of using uh, sewage treated water for irrigation. And that time, if you take my initial point that liter of water is kilowatt hour, so we find out that instead of like collecting wastewater, sending to the sewage treatment plant, in general is outside the city, so you have to pump it like 30 to 50 kilometers out of the city, treated. All the water has to be treated anyway, so, but to add the tertiary treatment to make it 
usable for irrigation or for landscaping. So this is also additional cost. And then to pump it back to the same point, to, to landscape and irrigate, if you calculate the energy cost needed to pump it to the sewage, to sewage, uh, sewage treatment plant and pump it back as treated water for landscaping, you find out that the energy needed is much more what you need to signate water directly from the sea and use it for irrigation. So the, so the question how you can take all those parameters into consideration in making those decisions and also in integrating them in some policies as well. So this is for, um, uh, for you. I, I want to give you an example uh, about Tunisia. Uh, you know, Tunisia now is facing uh, uh, scarcity of water uh, due to climate change, so the, the, uh, much less rain. But if you see the water consumption in Tunisia, 80% of the water is going to irrigation, 20% for, for industrial and household usage. So saving water, if you have to save water, you have more to invest in advanced technology and irrigation instead of thinking to add more expensive um, uh, desalination technology to add 2 to 3% of water needs, then you can easily save this one by implementing more uh, efficient irrigation systems. We can use it also by fixing the pipeline because all our old pipeline, we have the leakage rate between 40 to 50% in some places and it, it requires less, much less money to save instead of investing in very expensive technology. I agree that we need in some locations, some, 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 some places, some de small desalination unit to cover a specific uh, area. So if you go to agriculture, i give you an example about orange irrigation. So in Tunisia, one kilo of orange needs 500 liter of water. If you calculate the cost, if you benchmark your cost on desalination, now one meter cube of water, if you have efficient uh, desalination technology, it will cost you between 0 0.8 and 0 0.9. This is the cost in North Africa, by the way, a dollar per meter cube. So the cost of selling orange or exporting orange to Europe will be much less the cost of water if you, bar if you benchmark your cost and what will cost you to desalinate water. So the question is how you can implement this on decision making. So we can make policy, but to go back to the ESGs on, uh, as, and the implementation, the policy is it's, 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 it's different. So this is just uh, any, one example for how um, uh, policies are important, how uh, the full picture is important as well. Uh, I want to go back quickly to one um, about the collaboration with Israeli universities because now in my role as a director of research engagement at our university, I am coordinating many collaboration programs and uh, I am coordinating one of them is with Weizmann Institute and we have very active collaboration with the Hebrew University in Jerusalem as well. You know they have one of the uh, more advanced school of agriculture so in terms of innovation and the ecosystem uh, surrounding the university are producing amazing technology and we see how we can leverage in this knowledge. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We are in some places we are sharing similar environment in desert conditions and how Israeli technology managed to leverage and take advantage and to develop innovative technology to make agriculture uh, more efficient so it can also benefit uh, many other countries. Uh, so to answer now, Emily, your question about data and AI, uh, one of the area of research that our faculty are working on is uh, because you mentioned your first slide, data and knowledge. And, and when you talk data, uh, now the new oil is data. It's very important. And we, are, we have been approached with many entities in, uh, in the smart agriculture for, uh, for Internet of Things, sensing technology. Uh, computer vision, to have cameras with thermal cameras, with hyperspectral cameras that collect terabyte of data every day. So how you can process this data and you can optimize your production. So we have a dedicated team working with, uh, with the Hebrew University in Jerusalem in implementing uh, those technology in large uh, scale smart, smart agriculture. And this is, I think, uh, it's very important uh, to leverage uh, on this uh, relationship. Uh, I think to uh, take advantage as well of the advances made uh, here uh, in Israel and Israel technology innovator and then how we can implement them and adapt them to the needs uh, of the UAE as a country and, and the region as well. As well. Thank you. Thank you. Fascinating. Unintentionally, you mentioned something that's very close to my heart, and that is water leakage. Um, 
I've had a company that's done massive projects in the world of water leakage. Many people don't know that most water utilities leak on average between 30 to 60 percent of their water. And it was mentioned today a lot in agriculture, and I want to take that to some of the food security issues we're dealing with. A lot of us right now are very busy with deciding which projects to initiate that are going to help us make more food, grow more food. But the water leakage percentage is not rare to big industry. The food loss in the agriculture industry is still staggering today. On average, across the developing world, it is 40% of food is lost somewhere in the process from seed through growth to harvest to post-harvest to delivery. Imagine if we have the innovation that could actually reduce that 40% to 5%, 10%. Imagine how much food we would already be saving without having to actually initiate any new projects, just simply by optimizing the operational excellence of our own. And that is a lot of what ESG is coming to do. It's essentially saying companies, because in the end it was talked a lot today, that agriculture is a, is, a, is a business line. It is, and now we're holding those businesses accountable to their part of the burden. To say 40% loss is no longer acceptable. And so what innovation and technology are you going to use to do that? And I'd like to kick that over to Mr. Williams. Um, as the, the fellow businessman on the panel with me as well, we both come from the, the background of entrepreneurship and your initiatives to enhance equality of opportunity and innovation, especially for the young sector, um, is admirable in, Liber in Liberia and beyond. Uh, I'd like you to touch a little bit on that and also how will these new opportunities in the market come to play with the youth and the employment opportunities across the nation uh, once it was considered that innovation could replace jobs, but we actually know now that innovation brings jobs. And how do you see that collaboration happening between the private and public sector? Thank you very much, Emily. And I want to say thanks to the Director General for the invitation for me to participate in this uh, conference. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I would like to say that from as an African, compliance with the ESG, we have no problem with that. It is a good thing. Every African wants some level of compliance because people in the West, for example, I worked for the U.S. government for some time, about 16 years. When there's a spill, oil spilled in the U.S., all, this, all the lawmakers go crazy. The governors go crazy. The citizens go crazy. But when there's an oil spill in Nigeria, nobody hears about it. It doesn't even go on CNN. And then also, it is important to know that there are bad business people and good business people. If you do not have, if you do, if you do not compel compliance, the bad business people will get away free with all the bad things they want to do. So it is important to compel compliance. I also want to stress that the ESG, from an African perspective, what Africans want, particularly what Liberians want, and I'm from the region called the Mano River Union, Sierra Leone, Liberia, Guinea, and the Africans. What we want is to get some social benefits whenever companies go within our region. For example, before I was born, there's a company called Firestone. Firestone has rubber plantation in Liberia. Right now, that operation is going down. But Firestone did not leave any major infrastructure in those areas. There were many companies that did exist in that area. They built shattered houses. Some of the houses did not even have bathrooms. The roads were not good. There are also logging a lot of logging companies in Africa. They go there, they just pull the logs, and once the logs are pulled out of the forest, they are gone. There are no roads. So what people want is that when you have a business, as a businessman or an investor, and you go in those areas, and you want to invest, you want to pull the resources, you have to leave something behind so that tomorrow, when the resources are no longer available, the people can still have some social benefits. That is why compelling, you know, compliance with the ESG is very vital. It is also important to stress that the ESG regulation and all the other things that are written are not written from the pers perspective of the African. These things are imposed by America, in Europe, and I'm an American citizen as well. But if the European Union sends a prescription to Africa, it doesn't fit. 
And sometimes some of these prescriptions are driven by advocates, advocacy group in these countries. And so these things hurt businesses that, want, that have true intention of actually helping Africans. You know, if you have an advocacy group in, 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 uh, in DC or in Brussels that has a set agenda, they do not distinguish between the good businessman and the bad businessman. And so all of the imposition they have will affect the good business people in as much as they are trying to make sure that the bad business people do not carry bad practices in those areas. So this brings me to in innovation. Today we are living in an age of knowledge-based economics. The big companies, Apple, Facebook, Google, these are, not, these are not mining companies. These are not companies that are digging iron ore or diamond, but they have the most revenue. When you look at revenue, they have the most revenue. There are kids in Nigeria, in Liberia, that want to be the like Mark Zuckerberg. They want innovation. They want technology. They want to become part of the global labor market. They want to stay in Nigeria, in Liberia, and work for the company in Israel. You can do that. You know, there are, there are folks who live in South Africa, live in Sierra Leone, and if you know Linux, you know Splunk, you know cybersecurity, you can live anywhere and work for any company anywhere. So innovation plays a major role, you see. And, and uh, I'm a strong advocate of what Israel offers. If you look in Africa, most of the young people want innovation and technology, and they look up to two countries. They do not look up to America. They look up to Israel and Singapore. Singapore doesn't have diamonds. They do not have gold. But see how successful Singapore is. And see what Israel can offer in terms of feeding its people, transporting technology, and all the other things that they do transport to the rest of the world. So if we use technology and if we apply the different innovative methodology that, uh, that Israel offers and that the rest of the world is partaking in, I think Africa will become a better place to do business. And the kind of businesses that will grow in Africa will not just be businesses that focus on minerals. You know, uh, I have a friend here from Nigeria, right? In Nigeria, for example, they, they do mine crude oil. But many of the people in Nigeria sleep in darkness. In the Africos and Ghana, Ghana, I mean, Africos is the largest producer of cocoa. But the very children who cultivate the cocoa, have never, some of them have never eaten chocolate. So there are things that the big business company, the big businesses and the big investors can do to be able to make sure that Africa benefits from everything that they do. And so having innovative approaches, making sure that they comply with all the regulations so that the people can benefit, so that things like health issues will not result from the kind of business practices they have, you know, those things are very important because if a company goes to a place and the company leaves and the people develop cancer, they have different sicknesses because of the pollution, it doesn't affect the company. It affects the citizens who live within the environment where the company operates. Thank you. Um, all great answers um, and really thought-provoking. And, and I like how um, it is different in every country. And so I want to ask um, a futurist question in the sense. Now that we have an opportunity for corporations and government spending to be aligned on moving these types of indicators and goals forward. Give me your ideal picture for each of your countries in 10 years from now. Well, a little less. How far away from 2030? All of our countries committed that by 2030 we would pretty much have these SDGs under wraps. It's a consensus that we're not on track in the overwhelming majority of them. But now with all of the sectors aligned and where companies are normally the number one offenders of some of these indicators and the damage caused, now that they would be in line to make a net zero or a net positive footprint on these issues, what do you foresee that your countries could look like by 2030? Dr. Osebo, you want to start? 
Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, I, I, I have to uh, say that uh, Kenya is on the road to uh, achieving its uh, Vision 2030, and uh, part of the Vision 2030 includes uh, a, a very strong drive towards uh, climate smart agriculture. Uh, I have to say that uh, first we need to acknowledge that uh, ESG compliance has, has challenges, and uh, some of these challenges uh, uh, include uh, the, the, the lack of standardization. Uh, we have the challenge of enforcement because if there is no institution to enforce compliance, uh, some of these things that companies are doing in terms of the indicators are merely uh, they boil down to just beauty contest where farms display their aesthetics just to, to, to be able to attract investment, just showing uh, this is how beautiful we are. Of course, the cost issue is uh, an issue uh, that, uh, uh, of course, countries will have to deal with because uh, complying with the EHG requirements uh, is, is, is very costly. We equally have to acknowledge uh, the challenge of uh, materiality. Materiality analysis involves companies, individual companies, uh, making a decision on what they think is so uh, important to them and uh, they can report on. And if it is individual countries making their decisions on what they think is important, it may actually lead to what we call greenwashing. Now, uh, where do I see Kenya in the next uh, 30 years in terms of ESG compliance? Kenya has put in place a number of measures and policies towards uh, sustainable development. And of course, if we look at its commitment to COP26, uh, uh, by 2030, we want to see the net zero uh, emissions and, uh, and, and of course, uh, a major shift uh, towards uh, clean energy. And so Kenya stands in a better position uh, to drive the region, particularly uh, the Horn of Africa, towards uh, ESG uh, compliance. And how can this be done? We see a lot of opportunity in uh, public-private partnerships. There is need to institutionalize ESG so that uh, it is owned by all the stakeholders in, uh, the, uh, in, the, in the chain. Uh, with the launch of the Kenya Green Bond Initiative, I see a lot of funding opportunities uh, for, for, for companies. And already the Nairobi Securities uh, uh, exchange is working on incentivization of funds so that uh, they, they remain uh, compliant. We equally see a lot of opportunities that can be driven through PPPs in uh, communication and, and information sharing uh, in terms of uh, creating a lot of awareness. And uh, we have to say that uh, the World Bank has launched a number of innovations in place to help uh, create awareness and uh, link uh, the, the, the multinationals and, uh, and, and the farmers on the ground and enhance stakeholder collaboration. And so uh, Kenya is a better place to drive the agenda. And uh, I see a number of, uh, a number of efforts being made uh, uh, towards uh, ensuring that uh, uh, the farms in Kenya and in the region remain compliant and Kenya will definitely lead the process in the next couple of years. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to add to my question as well, just so you can have the opportunity to answer um, as we're coming towards the end. Um, what may also be the consequences, as we mentioned earlier, if we don't align with the compliance elements and where our countries might be on, with the lack of compliance? Uh, what... If there is no compliance, I think the consequences will be grave. But equally so, if we do follow the, the compliance as provided by the Western countries, there will be an issue. Because what Europe thinks about compliance with environmental issues, social issues, and governance issues in Africa is foreign to the African. Very foreign. And it is largely based on advocacy group, as I said. 
For example, in Liberia, our youth is based on self-taught civic education. They are engaged with almost everything that happens in the country. So the current mayor of the capital of Liberia is around 30, 31 year old. We have a lot of young people in government. And so anything you want to do, people question. You know, we have young people who are in ministry, assistant ministers and different things. The government may have issues, but they, in terms of civic education, freedom of the press, those things do exist in Liberia. So when an investor goes to the country and says, this is what I want to do, that individual, that investor is open to critique, is open to observation, examination, to see all the things that you want to do and what are the things will benefit the citizens of the country. So I think if that continues, and if the government and international partners can try to combine all of those different things with innovation and technology, it would make Liberia to excel. Amazing. And you stumbled upon something that maybe wasn't addressed properly during the panel, but important for especially research institutions to know. Um, one of the biggest confusion points and challenges, as mentioned in your paper, Dr. Asambo, is that there is no official standard yet in ESG compliance. It's a very confusing industry, meaning there's no one right framework. Imagine if the multinational companies coming to your country received the framework for activity in your country from you and not from a European entity that decided what their indicators were, meaning there's not only opportunity in the actual the, the outcomes of ESG, but there's even opportunity internally in each country, in each region, potentially the Horn of Africa would unite together to say these are the sustainability indicators for ESG that we're expecting you to abide by because of A, B, and C policies that have been put in place, because of the difference in saying that it comes from us from within and not from you from outside. Uh, Dr. Godina, do you have anything you'd like to add? to the comments already made on the future of what this looks like. I think if we talk about the UAE and what they're doing, uh, because I see more into the, about the energy mix that is being developed in the UAE, and, and I see that they are um, we're on the right track. Uh, now uh, we reach 10% of electricity uh, consumed is coming from renewable energy. Uh, now also we have the new Nuclear energy is, is, is being integrated in the grid and, and in the, the energy mix, adding uh, more than 4.6 gigawatt of electricity. It will be the baseline and will be absorbing all the intermittents because when your ratio of solar energy increases uh, above certain thresholds, so the intermittence of your energy production will be affecting the stability of your grid. So it's, it's important to add this uh, nuclear uh, mix uh, into into the energy mix, but take into consideration because some studies classifying renewable uh, uh, nuclear energy as, as as clean energy if you manage your your nuclear waste well, but it's true because when you go back to the uh, uh, to the solar energy, um, you know that we are located in desert environment, in dusty environment, and and, and now we have a large scale PV plant. The number one world is located in Abu Dhabi. It's about three gigawatt. Production, we are talking about million of panels, uh, the size of eight by five kilometer, all of them like solar panels. When you have a dust storm, so you have to clean them uh, because the efficiency with the soiling, with the dust accumulation of the panels has a significant impact of your efficiency that go, go up to 40% reductions. So it's amazing when you calculate the carbon footprint of cleaning this, uh, this panel, to bring all the laborers, to, to, to brush them to, to, to with, to with the water jets and, and all, 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 all the energy needed to clean them so it sort of should be counted toward uh, the, uh, the, the energy footprint of your, uh, of your solar, uh, solar production. So there, there are challenges, but in terms of uh, reducing uh, the carbon footprint, uh, in terms of energy production, it, it's progressing. And also now you know that the UAE will be hosting the COP28 later this year. And they adding now, there are a lot of programs that would be announced regarding hydrogen and green hydrogen production, and not just for the OE, but to become like platform for, and this will be also the future of, um, of, of clean energy mix, in not just in our region, but also globally in Europe and the US as well. 
Thank you. Can we get the last slide back on the screen to, for the close of our session? The takeaway, at least for me, is that there's something I wanted to put on a billboard, and here in the middle of Jerusalem, this was the biggest billboard I could bring to you. Uh, and during your trip here today, the, and the content that's been facilitated by the JCPA, you're going to realize something about this country. Um, you're going to realize a lot of innovation, a lot of inspiration, and this attitude that we in Israel have of loving a challenge, because a challenge means that there's some sort of solution at the other end. And one of the things that you'll experience is this, and that there is no heavier burden than a great opportunity. And so if I come back to our poll, yes, it is a burden, and yes, it is an opportunity, but that's exactly the mix that we need, because creative solutions are the keys to situations like this. And so I hope that throughout your week here, you'll take advantage of this opportunity to be here among these participants in this setting, and to find the solutions for water, for energy, to have discussions on the collaborations on what solutions we want to bring to our countries and how we can implement that, including taking advantage of what's going on in the world economy at the moment. And the ESG revolution is indeed here to stay. And so the question is really going to be, what are you going to do about that burden and opportunity? So again, thank you to my panelists. Thank you to the JCPA, and if anybody has questions uh, for any of the panelists, we'd like to open it up for the last seven, eight minutes that we have on the panel. So, it, it seems to me, if I understand things correctly, we have a situation where the Europeans are basically establishing what the rules of the game are, and the African countries, not only the African countries, but in this context, the African countries, have to either comply or not comply. And our question is, are we going to comply, or are we going to run into scrimmage and have difficulties and so on? And I'm wondering if it isn't the role of, of us, the think tanks, to come back to the Europeans and say, we have our own ESG compliance program, right? These are our standards. We are not in a position post-industrial age of 150 years. We're still undergoing our industrial revolution. We still have an awful lot to do in terms of development. And we're not going to keep the pace of those that are creating the standards in Paris and Brussels, right? So I'm, I'm curious if it isn't the right attitude that we should be taking not to say, well, no, we're not going to keep up with the European uh, standards. We're not going to live up to the ESG regulations. We're going to create our own. And these are the things that we're going to put before the, the international companies. And this is the alternative that we're going to create instead of saying, niet. You know, we're not part. We're not dancing at your party. We're, we're creating another party. We have a different dance. Wouldn't that be the best approach to take? And don't we, as think tanks, have a uh, job to do in that regard? Gentlemen, grabbing for the mic on that one. Yes, <laughs> I, I think you are one hundred percent right, and that's the point I was driving through to say Africans think differently from the way the Europeans and the Americans think, and the issue is. The way America and Europe think is not just limited to the ESG. They, they, they see Africa as a patient, and everything is prescribed for Africa without asking what sickness you have. So what you just said is that Africa has to find a way, individual countries in Africa have to find a way to kick back and say, no, this is what we want. Give us what we want. And this is the reason why China is overtaking America and other countries in Africa. What China is offering Africa is not what Africa wants, but at least it is tangible. When the Chinese go to Africa, they ask the African, what do you want? Row? Yes. Okay, we'll build it. They do not give aid. They give loan. That's why African countries are in debt to China. The U.S. gave 
billions of dollars in aid, but yet still, Africa does not appreciate what America does. So you are 100% right. Africa has to kick back. We have to create our own standards. Dr. Sam, do you want to add something? Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I, you know, one of the, the challenges that I, uh, I you know ESG faces is uh, what we call the politics of development of the third world countries. And uh, the, the, the politics has got to do with uh, the multinationals who actually finance uh, the, the, the annual budgets of third world countries. Uh, do we expect uh, third world countries to enforce compliance on those multinationals who find their budgets? Uh, that, 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 that's why you see uh, the, 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 the Kenya Bankers Association actually uh, decided to develop their own guidelines on, on, on compliance. Uh, the, the Nairobi Security Exchange has got its own manual on, on, on compliance and uh, what we are, we are trying to see is a number of African countries now trying to domesticate uh, their own compliance parameters as opposed to what the European countries are imposing. But uh, the greatest challenge that we are seeing is that uh, perhaps uh, ESG compliance might be ineffective uh, in some sense, especially on uh, those uh, companies or multinationals or government parastatals who simply say, uh, we are contented with, with the way we are. If we, are. if we expect firms to comply in order to get funding or in order to attract investment, what about those... Uh, public companies or parastotals, uh, which, which are just contented with the way they are. You know, we are not performing. After all, we shall get support from the public coffers. Uh, we will still get financed, whether or not we comply. And so, uh, what is this whole thing about uh, ESG compliance? Is it uh, just about those uh, particular uh, companies that uh, uh, want to get richer and richer. And that is why uh, one professor of Harvard University said one thing, that uh, in, in, in investing in, uh, in, in, in environmental sustainability is a great idea to change the world. But it is very difficult thing to do. And if an investor takes that direction, it might end up being poor and poor in the long run. They may not get as rich as they may want to be. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Oh, yes, go ahead. Well, last question. Do we have time for one more question? Okay, yeah. Here you go. Hello? Hello? Okay, it's now working. So, um, I want to make a controversial statement. ESGs are fine. I think, really, we must give them a bit more attention and encourage each country um, not to necessarily resist them or fight them. But I think it's a bridge too far when we create a situation where now we are requiring African countries per se. So I'm taking it from there to be the ones to create them, enforce them, and effectively basically exclude people who don't live by them. It's a form of regulation, and um, to that extent, I think it's good. Why I'm saying what I'm saying is this. Across history, no culture, no country, no people who are fighting to get out of poverty were environmentally sensitive. None, zero. I remember about 10 years ago when the Aspen Institute and Al Gore was there. And he was then pushing his agenda, which I agree with. But I got up to ask a question and I said, look, the reason why we have the climate crisis today is because Europe banned fossil fuels to get out of poverty. 
And to a certain extent, you can argue that you are at a point where you've crested a certain threshold. And so it is possible for you to now start going down on that. But I can't do that in Africa. I don't have the luxury of having to develop green technology in Africa by which I am going to climb out of poverty. And I explain, I see people die from simple things. So I agree with you in part. We should accept the controversial paradigm that the standards and all those things will come from somewhere. It is not a problem for me that it is Cadbury that fights for children to leave cocoa farms. All right? It's not a problem for me. It's a problem that it happens, but it's not a problem for me that it takes some foreign companies to fight that. It is not Africans who fought against slavery. The fight against slavery started in England and Europe. My point is that across history, you will see this paradigm that really, when you are confronted with poverty and some of these existential, exigent problems, it really does not give you room to think about some of those other things. In short, the, the, the psychology of a man who is threatened by hunger is very different from the psychology of a man who has eaten and had his fill. Thank you very much. And on that, I'll turn it back over to you, Yichiel. Well, thank you all. It was a riveting panel, as all the panels were today. Thank you, Emily. Uh, thank you, doctors. Um, you, you, all right. I actually have, have uh, uh, good news and bad news at the end of this day of discussion. What would you like to hear first? Well, let me tell you, I'll tell, I'll tell you the, ba the bad news first. Um, all the roads to the, uh, to the airport are closed. Um, so that, that's the bad news. The good news is that there are no flights leaving Israel either. So, so we've, we've, grown, we've grown close together throughout the course of the day. And we have the opportunity to grow even closer. Um, hopefully, no, seriously, hopefully the, in, a, in a day or two, uh, things should clear up. But I, I thought it was a, a really poetic how we're all down here, you know, four stories down in the hall discussing some of the most important things facing humanity. <laughs> and outside, you know, <laughs> all hell is breaking loose. The streets are closed. The Knesset is under siege. But, you know, at the end of the day, folks, you know, that's all going to get back to normal, and the problems that we dealt with today, the things that we discussed, were true before this crisis and are going to be true tomorrow. So there are things, again, as I began my remarks this morning by saying, the important and the immediate, and we dealt here today with the important. I felt that we began the day with broad issues, Abraham Accords, international relations, how political science works, the nuances, the differences between the peace treaties of Jordan and Israel and Egypt and Israel, and uh, Bahrain and United Arab Emirates, and Saudi Arabia tomorrow, please God, inshallah, and going f to the north and uh, talking about Kurdistan and, and seeing what's going on in, in, in Turkey, and looking at the Horn of Africa and looking around all of Africa, in effect, and talking about the problems that we share and contend with. Uh, and I think we move during the course of the day to the more specific the afternoon sessions on food security, on water security, on agricultural innovation, what we can do about all that to make a better world, and closing the day with how to contend specifically with policies. And that's why I think we're here. We're here to bring think tanks together to think and to do. And we're going to conclude today before we have a little break and then meet in the lobby at a quarter to seven to go to an exclusive dinner. Uh, we're going to conclude right now with a very practical think tank application. And uh, we're going to sign a very exciting MOU with the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Ethiopia. Uh, JCPA, we've uh, created a, a, a document. This began, our relationship began about five months ago when Dan first visited Ethiopia. It continued when I had my trip there. And I'd like to invite... Uh, Dr. Uh, Belete, Dr. Aweke, Dr. Yunon, to come up together with Dan.
Is the ambassador here? Oh, yes, the ambassador of Ethiopia, please. And uh, Gadi Avarkan, who initiated the, uh, our trip to Ethiopia. We'll sign the documents. If we can get it on camera, please, we'd appreciate it. And we'd be delighted at JCPA if this will be the beginning of uh, further signatures with your think tanks so we can think together. We're ready to expand, and we hope you are ready as well. So as soon as we can locate the ambassador, this might be the case of the missing ambassador. We're in an international crisis now, right? <laughs> Do we have uh, a stills camera here, um, Ahuba? Oh, we have stills, okay, good. Wonderful. Dan, Gadi, do we still have the ambassador? Yes. Oh, wonderful. Okay. In witness whereof, the undersigned, being duly authorized thereto by their respective governments, have signed this MOU in two originals in the English language, both texts being equally authentic, signed at Jerusalem on this day, the 27th of the month of March, 2023. The Institute of Foreign Affairs of the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia, pre represented by Dr. Desalone Ambe Balete, Executive Director, Dr. Amari. Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs of the State of Israel, represented by Dan Diker, President, Yechil Lara, Director General, and Gadi Avarkan, Director of the African Project. Yes, of course. 